council members are back. If you could turn your cameras on. Look at getting started. Great. Good afternoon. Welcome to our 1215 session of the February 9th, 2021 meeting of the City Council. I have a few announcements and then we'll move on to our meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television, channel 25, and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. All council members are participating in this meeting remotely. I want to thank the public for staying home to view today's city council meeting. If you wish to comment on an agenda today, on, excuse me, on an, an agenda item today, call in at the beginning of the item you're wanting to comment on using the instructions on your screen. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through the phone. Please note there is a delay in streaming. So if you continue to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. When it is time for public comment, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak during public comment, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. You may hang up once you have commented on your item of interest. And I would like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Watkins? Here. Calentari Johnson? Here. Brown? Here. Cumming? Here. Golder? Here. Vice Mayor Bruner? Present. And Mayor Myers? Present. Great, next up is a presentation. Um, our first presentation today is the Parking for Hope check presentation. And today I'm pleased to announce that the City of Santa Cruz in partnership with the Santa Cruz Downtown Association will be presenting Hope Services with the seventh annual check collected from our Parking for Hope holiday program. For those who don't know, Hope Services is a Santa Cruz nonprofit that provides training and support for, to adults with developmental disabilities. In doing so, their crews have helped keep our downtown streets clean and welcoming for 22 years. The funds were collected from downtown meters the week before Christmas when the usual parking rates applied. However, all proceeds that during that eight day period were designation, designated for donation to Hope Services. This included all of Park Mobile's transaction fees, which they gener generously contributed as well. Given the reduction in parking caused by the COVID-19 stay-at-home order, we are especially pleased to announce that we collected $18,439 this holiday season. We are delivering a check in this amount to Hope Services. This brings the total amount collected for Hope Services over the last seven years now to $202,525. Um, so congratulations and thank you um, to everyone that came downtown and uh, used a parking meter. And um, unfortunately due to COVID, we won't be able to present um, our traditional giant check to Hope Services today. But um, please know that all of the council members are very supportive of this program and we um, are very proud. And thank you to all of our staff and everyone that, and um, shout out to our partner on this downtown association as well. So thanks everybody, congrats. Okay, next up is uh, the mayoral proclamation declaring February as Black History Month in Santa Cruz. And um, I'm gonna read a couple of lines from the proclamation and then call on Brenda Griffin, president of the NAACP Santa Cruz County to say a few words. Whereas National Black History Month in February affords special opportunity to become more knowledgeable about, about black heritage and to honor the many black leaders who have contributed to the progress of our nation. Whereas acknowledging and understanding the struggles for equal rights in the African-American community can strengthen the insight of all of our citizens regarding the issues of human rights, the great strides that have been made in the crusade to elim eliminate the barriers of equality for minority groups and the continuing struggle against racial discrimination and poverty. 
Now, therefore, I, Donna Myers, Mayor of the City of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim the month of February 2021 as Santa Cruz NAACP Black History Month in the City of Santa Cruz and encourage all citizens to participate in community practices that ensure equality for everyone. And thank you, uh, Brenda, for being here today. Um, we really appreciate it, and uh, we'd love to hear a few words from you. Thanks for being here. Thank you, uh, Mayor Myers, and to Vice Mayor Brunner, thank you for this uh, proclamation. And we really appreciate you acknowledging the value and the importance of black history, which is actually American history. So I just want to uh, thank you again, and we accept this award on behalf of the uh, this proclamation. On behalf of the NAACP Santa Cruz County Branch, and on behalf of all of the black history makers and leaders in our county, um, and there are several, and hopefully we will acknowledge all of them uh, one day. So again, thank you. Um, it's important that um, all voices are heard, and we really appreciate you acknowledging us. Thank, thank you. you very, thank you very much for being here, Brenda. We really, really appreciate it. I'd like to open it up to council members uh, if you have any any uh, comments today. Uh, Vice Mayor Bruner. Thank you so much, Brenda Griffin, for being here, and I just wanted to acknowledge the work that the local Santa Cruz County and AACP brings to our community. And, um, you know, one of the things that I've always uh, admired is that the NAACP was founded on my birthday, February 12, 112 years ago. And I think that's amazing. It's one of the largest recognized civil rights organizations and truly has been an anchor in our community, especially over the last year, um, and fundamental in the launch with the Black Health Mat Matters Initiative, the Santa Cruz County Black Coalition for Justice and Racial Equity. And, um, you know, every year the Martin Luther King Jr. March for the Dream, the Gospel Night this year, so thank you for all that you are doing and that the NAACP is doing in our community. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor Brenner. I appreciate the remarks. And again, you know, it's it's a, a collective effort, effort. We have some great leaders in our city and county. Well, thank you, Brenda. And it's such an important, um, it's, an, it's an important, you know, thing that we do every year and recognizing this, and, and I just really appreciate your comment that black history is American history, and we, 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 we have to acknowledge that, and we should be acknowledging that every day, and we are, we are one nation, and we've, we've, got to, we've really got to start thinking that way and acting that way, so I, I just appreciate the work that you guys have done over the last year especially, and um, uh, just have a lot of admiration and respect for for everything you've been doing. So thank you for all your all your work and and all of your colleagues and and folks who have been working hard this past year. So thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, we will move on now to our next presentation, and I'm going to call up uh, Rosemary Menard, our water director. She will give us a preliminary water supply outlook uh, for the year 2021. Welcome, Rosemary. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Um, thanks for this opportunity to, I'm trying to share my screen, here we go. Um, thanks for this opportunity to give you a quick update. <laughs> I know that we've had a fairly dry winter so far and uh, that generally when that occurs here in Santa Cruz, generates a lot of questions about, you know, what's gonna happen in the coming summer. And I wanna just give you a quick update about where we are and uh, talk about kind of what we look at as we do this uh, preliminary look in February and kind of where the, the final look will be kind of somewhere in the early uh, April timeframe. So just to kind of give you a, a, a quick update, we do do this a couple of times each winter kind of typically in the mid to end of January, which is a kind of the halfway point. 
And we look at four factors to kind of assess where we are and how we're doing. A rainfall, stream flow in the San Lorenzo River, reservoir storage levels in, uh, Loch, in Loch Lomond, and then of course the cumulative discharge of uh, San, of the San Lorenzo River, which helps us to kind of assess where we are with water year classification. Uh, so this presentation is typically given at the Water Commission in the first meeting in February, which we did last week, and a little bit of update has happened since then. This is the cumulative pre precipitation chart, and you can see that this, uh, this line here, this kind of tealy color line is the current year until really at, right at the end of February, we we're looking pretty pretty difficult here. We had the atmospheric river that came through a couple of weeks ago that uh, gave us a big bump. Um, and so that improved our situation. This is the 20, this sort of more blue line here is the 2020 uh, water year, which was classified as dry in our, in our uh, you know, uh, system of, uh, Year, what are your classification types? So we're going to see a chart about a little bit later. Uh, didn't it didn't squeak over the the line between critically dry and dry until right at the end of uh, kind of the springtime. Uh, the the greenish line here is the annual average, and then we had a wet year in 2019. So we had quite a bit of rain that was sort of tracking pretty early on through the sort of early part mid part of January as along the kind of uh, long-term average, and then we had quite a bit more rain in the later part of that year. Um, moving on to looking at stream flow, the, the blue bars here are the long-term average, and you can see that stream flow for this year has been pretty below average. Uh, you know, I think it's one of the reasons why we saw, for example, the uh, lagoon and the San Lorenzo River was closed for so long. There was just so little water in the system to push open the, um, the, the entrance to the lagoon and let the water kind of move out in the more typical winter fashion. Um, we, we will see some changes in this, uh, these numbers as we relate to, you know, going forward just because we've had a little bit more rain in, uh, the, in the month of February and we're looking at some additional storms looks like later this week and maybe early into next week. So this is a, this chart is updated annually, but so far this is not looking too good, right? And then finally, we're looking at the uh, cumulative runoff, which we classify these years into critically dry, dry, normal, and wet. And you can see that the years that are shown here, the long-term average is this blue line. This is the 2019 water year that was a wet year. Um, as I mentioned, this was last year where we just squeaked over in between critically dry and dry conditions in uh, kind of the late part of the spring. And this is kind of where we stand at the end of uh, January this year. And, you know, again, this is not looking uh, too good at the moment. And we do have another couple of months of the water year, you know, the wet season left, and we are hoping that we'll get some more, but this is uh, a not a very good situation at the moment. Um, and then finally, we do a projection that looks at where we are starting uh, the reservoir storage level, Loch Lomond storage level in the first part of April and how that would decline between uh, the first part of April and the end of uh, October, which is kind of typically the end of our dry season. And you can see that we're looking at reservoir start because we didn't fill last year um, due to a number of issues, including construction work at the Tate Street intake, uh, as well as some of the impacts associated with the CZU fire. We've been on Loch Lomond more of this winter than would typically be the case. So we're starting a little bit behind even what we might have seen under other circumstances where we've been on the river more during the fall, for example. And uh, we're looking at getting down to a, just under about two thirds at the end of uh, the demand season. This, 
This forecast includes fish flow releases as well as assumptions about customer demand uh, that has been unrestricted at this point. And you know that is certainly one of the things that we're weighing as we look forward is about whether or not we need to bring a recommendation to the council in the um, in the spring, later in the spring in April, to implement some form of water restrictions. Now, the, the good news about the, the sort of our kind of a little bit longer term forecast for the summer is that our, our customer demand is pretty solidly down at a level that is very efficient. And so to some degree, the question about whether or not we will need to put restrictions in place is is a big uh, is a big open question related to kind of what do we see as uh, we're looking at reservoir storage. If we get some additional rain and this line sort of stabilizes, we probably will uh, not put restrictions on or not recommend that we uh, implement restrictions, even though it has been very dry. Because again, our customer demand is very efficient already, and there's somewhat less to gain in you know further restricting a um, in already very efficient uh, water use patterns. I will tell you that at your next meeting, I'm gonna be bringing forward a major rewrite of our water shortage contingency plan to reflect the current demand characteristics and patterns, and that will bring uh, some quite big changes to the way we would do restrictions and what kinds of restrictions we would do uh, from the very get-go of the um, of the stages that we have to plan for. So there's there, uh, I'm going to be asking the council to you know take some action on giving us authority to go ahead and implement that plan in the coming summer so that we can. Uh, have in place the right tools for the job in the event that we need to do restrictions. So that so we've been planning for updating our current plan. It's done from 2009 and is quite out of date uh, for some time. My final, uh, you know, just a couple of, uh, of NOAA charts here looking at, this is for temperature. Looks like we're looking at, you know, higher than normal uh, temperatures in the next three months. This is for, um, the, the months of um, February, March, and April, and then this is the precip. So the whole West has got this sort of equal chance of being either above lo normal, normal, or below number normal. There doesn't seem to be any kind of, you know, more specifics at this point, but we obviously follow this information on a routine basis as well. Um, and then finally, just a, a couple of notes, you know, we, monitor water conditions on an ongoing basis. We update our reservoir projections in late March and to inform the conversation with the Water Commission in early April and with the council as needed in April regarding uh, whether or not we need to recommend restrictions. And with that, I can take your questions if you have any. Are there questions from the council? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Rosemary, very much for the report. And um, I think we all do realize that um, I won't geek out on the water stuff, but yeah, it's a pretty sobering winter so far. And um, I do want to recognize too that the work that you your your department is doing on um, the climate change modeling is just very important at this point in time. So, you know, really understanding when it's not raining is one thing, but understanding when it's not raining in the context of some of the climate change modeling you've been doing is, is very telling to our future, so. Yeah, I, I did happen to watch a, a, a webinar yesterday on uh, atmospheric rivers and how they're becoming a much greater source of, um, you know, more intense storms and the uh, particularly related to the number of events in California where atmospheric rivers are providing a huge portion of the total annual rainfall for the state uh, in a relatively few hours. And that trend is quite concerning with respect to the assumptions we're making about how we operate our system and how big our system storage needs to be to uh, you know, help us get through drier periods. So there's a lot of work that's going on where we really are trying to figure out uh, how is the future going to change and, and what do we need to do to adapt to that. 
Yeah, it's it's interesting growing up here in California. I, I you know, it's remarkable how different it is now and how it's been so different in the last 10 years. It's um, pretty chilling. So thank you for everything your department's doing. We appreciate thank you. it. Okay, next up, uh, we have presiding office, officers announcements, and I do not have any announcements this afternoon. Are there any statements of disqualifications from any of our council members today? Seeing none, I'll move on to, uh, are there any additions or deletions today, Bonnie? The mm, no, there are not. Uh, I'll make an announcement about oral communications. Uh, oral communications are a time for community members to address the council for two minutes or less about any matter not on the agenda. Uh, and that will be he held later on this evening after our last item of the day. Uh, Mr. Condotti, uh, city attorney report on closed session, please. Yes, good afternoon, Mayor Myers, members of the city council. Uh, this. Uh, Morning, the council convened at 10.45 a.m. via Zoom to uh, discuss the following items in closed session. Uh, prior to entering into the closed session, the council voted to um, refer to closed session uh, a real property negotiations matter involving uh, property identified as APN numbers 0051548, 0051548, and 0051535, um, and those are city-owned properties uh, commonly referred to as parking lot 11 uh, and a small undeveloped, undeveloped parcel on the corner of Laurel and Front Streets on the, on the uh, river side of Front Street. Um, council met with its real property negotiation, negotiate, excuse me, negotiator, Bonnie Lipscomb, uh, and uh, gave direction there was no reportable action on that item. Second item of real property negotiations involved the property at 902 Pacific Avenue and designated as APNs 0051523031323233 and 05. Again, the council met with uh, its negotiator and um, gave direction, but no reportable action was, was, uh, was taken. Second item involves pending litigation. First is the matter pending in the Santa Cruz County Superior Court entitled Regents of the University of California et al. Uh, versus the City of Santa Cruz. Uh, the second item is uh, a matter pending in Alameda County Superior Court entitled Lauren W. Brown et al. versus AGCO Corporation et al. Uh, and the council received a report from the city attorney's office on those items, but uh, no reportable action was taken. Thank you, Mr. Condotti. I will going to take one step back to the uh, presiding officer's announcements. I do want to just make sure uh, I read this correctly because I did skip over it. Um, and then we'll uh, move on to our regular meeting. So today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, instructions are provided on your screen. We will provide these instructions throughout the meeting whenever we move into an agenda item that will be open for public comment. Please note, public comment is only heard on items council is taking action on and not regular updates and reports. The items that will be open for public comment during today's meeting are numbers nine through 20 on our agenda. And again, for oral uh, communications that will be uh, occurring today immediately after agenda item number 20 on the agenda. If you do wish to make comment during oral communications, please call in towards the end of item 20. I'll now ask uh, the city manager to report and provide updates on city events and business items. Thank you, Mayor. I have, a, excuse me, I have three items that I wanted to update the council on today. They are the, an update on the beach area vendors, Highway 1 and 9 encampment, and on vaccination uh, status. I'll start with uh, the beach area vendors, and for that I'm going to have uh, Ralph Demericut from our office provide an update. He's been working with the vendors and the businesses there. Go ahead, Ralph. 
Hi, um, good afternoon, um, Mayor Myers and Council. I'm going to be sharing this brief PowerPoint presentation with you all. Um, yeah, so Ralph Demis America, uh, principal management analyst with the city manager's office. And um, here's um, just an outline of today's update. Um, I'll be sharing the timeline as to how we ended up here, or how we ended up yeah, here, um, uh, describe the outreach efforts we've had. Uh, give some uh, context as to how we um, determined what the next steps were. And um, our goal is to be ready for the 2021 beach season, which is March, April. Um, so here's a quick timeline, um, just to kind of give a summary to the uh, new council members. Um, on August 14, uh, 2020, Executive Order 2020-16 was signed, and that, was, that prohibited beach vending on um, Beach Street. On August 25, um, staff direction was provided, and uh, I have a summary of what that was coming up. And then um, on the 3rd of September, we held our first meeting uh, with the vendors with Community Bridges. Um, September 30, um, Executive Order 2020-21 was signed, which um, really just extended the first executive order and tied it to the city's um, emergency, um, um, uh, yeah, uh, health emergency. Um, and the executive order 2021 pretty much said that um, as long as the city's um, health emergency is in place, um, vending on Beach Street will continue to be prohibited. And then um, on January and February, we held our second and third meeting with the vendors. Um, this was the direction that was given to staff. It was to continue working with community bridges to develop a more structured and equitable system that would accommodate beach area vending. Um, so our outreach efforts, we held three meetings. They were moderated by Community Bridges. Um, translation services um, were provided, and um, invitations were extended through emails and calls, both in English and Spanish. Um, so there were some themes that um, popped up during our vendor group discussions, um, and in all three, um, we had the opportunity to share concerns both by vendors and city staff to really uh, communicate and get on the same page as to what the issues were and what we were trying to solve. Um, there was a need for clear guidelines and shared expectations both from the city and vendors. Um, and there was competi the competition um, over coveted sites um, created a lot of issues last season. Um, which we're trying to address this year. Uh, now, there's a desire to work with the city to create opportunities to bend in 2021 this year. So th this is the um, context that we took into consideration when trying to determine what the next steps were. Um, the first one was SB 946, and um, this Senate bill um, really uh, it decriminalized street bending and it limited local regulation of sidewalk vending, and it was adopted in 2018, um, took an effect January 1st, 2019, so a relatively new um, Senate bill and state law. So as cities were really trying to, um, you know, uh, follow this law and update their ordinances, um, we ran into our current pandemic, which added a whole other layer to this issue. Um, we have the executive order um, that is prohibiting beach vending and extending it um, through um, the um, city emergency declaration, and um, we received direction from council. And uh, we also considered the physical limitations of the area. It's a really unique area that really limits the number of vending sites that are possible um, with social distancing. And we also took into consideration feedback um, from our outreach meetings and city staff. Um, so this is just a quick image of um, Beach Street, and this is off season. Um, it's just. You know, even when there's just one family walking down the sidewalk, you see how congested it could get and how it, it really is difficult to um, add vendors here um, the way it's currently designed. Um, this is where we are suggesting three of the six new um, vending sites be placed. Um, this is right next to um, the uh, bathrooms here at Ideal Restaurant, and it's that wooden patio. Here's an aerial footage. Um, of the, of the um, vending sites that we're proposing. And we have three here and uh, another three over here. And um, Ideal uh, Fish did extend their patio into this uh, section as well. Um, so in 2021, um, we're proposing that sidewalk vending continue to be prohibited um, due to health and safety concerns. Um, we're working to post signs 
um, in the area as soon as um, February or early March, just to make sure that the community um, and vendors understand what the rules are. And we're proposing issuing limited permits um, at designated sites, which I just showed. Um, we're also um, adding additional requirements for vendors. Um, so in addition to having a business license, um, your, your vendor is going to be required to um, get a city-issued permit for vending in this area. If you're vending food, a county health permit will be required. A submission of information on the vendor's proposed operation will be required, and that's to help determine if they need a health permit from the county or not if they're vending food. Um, compliance with the city noise ordinance and trash be removed after each business day. So the next step, um, we're gonna make sure we're gonna, we're continue to communicate rules and regulations with the public so that the whole area understands what the rules are leading up to the speech season. And that really um, is um, gonna be done through signage along Beach Street. Um, we're also working right now on navigating through a new administrative process. And um, this permitting system is something new for the whole um, city staff here, um, having limited vending sites at this um, area. And um, vendors voiced at the um, community outreach meetings that uh, application assistance uh, would be nice to have and community bridges will be working with us um, to make sure that vendors um, are able to um, have the time and um, resources to apply for these um, sites in a timely manner. And then um, we, we're trying, our goal is to issue permits for these assigned spaces before spring. And um, of course, uh, continue to be fair, transparent, responsive in, the, in this process. It's a relatively new issue that we're dealing with and there's a lot of um, variables in play. And um, we want to make sure that the whole time um, we're being fair, transparent, responsive to everyone involved. Uh, so yeah, that concludes my update. Thank you for your time. I can take any questions if there are any. I have Council Member Kalantari Johnson and then Council Member Brown, please. And then Council Member Cummings. Thank you so much for the presentation, Ralph. Um, very informative. I have just a couple of comments, questions. Um, uh, one is can we prioritize um, county residents in this permitting process, including those for, who are from South County? I'm not sure where all the vendors are from, but if we can prioritize those who are within Santa Cruz County. The other question I have is, um, you know, um, I understand the need for um, restrictions due to the COVID health and safety concerns. Um, however, and not however, um, I see a lot of congestion, congestion downtown as well. So um, why the restrictions on Beach Street vendors and not vendors in other areas of our community that are also congested um, and, and setting parameters for health and safety? So those are my questions and comments. Thank you. Um, I'll answer those sort of backwards. Um, the, uh, the reason why we were focused on Beach Street right now is really um, it was the item or issue that came into focus at that time, um, SB 946, which um, the city um, passed an item in August, I believe, to update our own city ordinances to kind of align us with SB 946. That gives the city council um, the um, authority to revisit um, vending ordinances and regulations citywide. And um, if that's something the council wishes to do to address issues in downtown, um, something you know, that the uh, council can definitely agenda is at a future meeting. And um, John is on the, on the call too. So John, if I'm saying something wrong, please correct me. Um, and then um, as far as prioritizing um, Santa Cruz County residents, um, I, I see where you're going with that, but at the same time, there was hesitancy from vendors from declaring where they were residents from or at. So um, we want to be sensitive to that. And that's one of the things that uh, it was, that we're working on the application with the new bridges on, just to make sure that this application um, is culturally sensitive to the vendors um, and we're not putting anybody in uh, a weird predicament that they didn't want to be in. Um, but we could, I could discuss that a little bit further with the city attorney's office. It, it's a question that has to come up. Um, do you have Can I add a little bit uh, with respect to um just the overall approach, uh, just to clarify, one of the things that uh, in looking at the beach area in particular was to try to come up with a model that would work uh, 
hopefully on an ongoing basis, uh, because recognizing that that beach street gets super congested in, in normal times with the bikes and, and, and the people wanting to sit and people going back and forth. And so part of the goal is to try to come up with something that would, that would be workable on an ongoing basis as well. And, and, and again, working with the vendors to find that, that balance where they could have uh, a location that, that, that worked, but also worked just from an everyday normal uh, congestion. John, you're muted. Member, I think John wanted member to Brown. Yeah, I think John wanted to add some. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, John. You're muted, John. So we you're can't muted, hear you. John. That, <laughs> sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, just historically, uh, even before Senate Bill 946 went into effect, we had um, street uh, vending legal issues on Pacific Avenue, and those were. Uh, implicated by uh, court decisions that um, held that uh, certain types of vendors had a First Amendment right to use the sidewalk to display and sell um, products. So even before 946, the council historically had to um, deal with um, issues on vending on Pacific Avenue, knowing that they could not outright prohibit vending on Pacific Avenue in the First Amendment context. And so their approach was the uh, time, place, and manner approach, um, which focused on allowing the activity uh, to an extent that it did not unduly um, interfere with pedestrian vehicular uh, traffic on Pacific Avenue. And uh, so historically, the council identified locations on Pacific Avenue where this type of uh, protected vending activity could take place. With the passage of Senate Bill 946, um, as the council uh, learned in August when it adopted the updated ordinance, it sort of turned the whole program upside down. And the council now has the authority to say where it cannot be prohibited, provided they have um, data, objective data, that uh, documents a health and safety uh, reason for not allowing it at those particular locations. That's all. Did you have any further questions, Councilmember Collins-Hardy Johnson? No, thank you. Okay, thank you, Councilmember Brown. Thank you. Yeah, some of my questions were just answered. I just have a couple more. Um, first, I want to thank you, um, Ralph, for for going through this process for you know for coordinating the you know the logistics. I know it's been uh, difficult uh, at times to to get people together and on the same page. And so I really appreciate your work and also appreciate Community Bridges for uh, being willing to step in and and help out with the. Uh, you know, the application process and, and transmitting the information. So that's, so one of my questions is related to that. I'm, I am just wondering, uh, you know, because, you know, part of the challenge seems to me that it will be how to proactively signal to vendors that we have this process in place and kind of avoid the, you know, the kind of having to just do it on the enforcement end to make people go away. And so I'm wondering if you've talked about uh, and how you're planning to handle or Community Bridges maybe is planning to handle, uh, you know, getting the word out about this so that people can be brought in early. I know you mentioned April and trying to get it done early. I think that's a great idea. Um, but just uh, how to kind of mitigate the potential <laughs> for, um, you know, disruptions with the new system. And then my other question is about how many uh, uh, you know what the what the different what that's going to look like in terms of how many vendors had been kind of uh, regularly or at least recently been present on a regular basis uh, compared to what the you know the siting that's that's being offered. Good question. Um, so we are working with um, Community Bridges closely, and they've done a great job with outreaching to vendors and um, provide translation services as well. Um, and at our, la our, our, at our last meeting, we discussed the importance of this process and moving forward in a way that included um, this 
specific needs of other vendors, which, you know, um, some might need additional resources, um, applying for their business license or just translation services of the application. And we're going to be working closely with them um, to even look at the application before it goes out, too, to see if there's anything essentially that needs to be removed or added in that application. And um, we're going to be working with them on an electronic flyer that's going to include dates and um, resources, community resources available to vendors who need extra assistance applying for these permits. And um, we also have um, a really good um, sort of outreach process finally worked out where they're able to communicate with the vendors directly and confirm that communication was sent and received and um, all of that. And the, the number of vendors that regularly were out there, it, it's interesting because last year we didn't have a limited number of permits and we didn't require um, permit holders to have their permit um, on them on site. So you had a couple of vendors who had satellite stations that you could call them where they were all working off of one permit. So the number was really difficult to um, come up with or um, pinpoint exactly. Um, we had around 12 vendors, um, but there was about six permits that were issued out. Um, so it, it, was, it was difficult to track, but um, yeah. Okay, that answered your question. Councilmember Cummings, you have a question? Mayor Myers, you're, you're muted, just FYI. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I have a barking dog in my house. Um, sorry about that. Uh, Councilmember Cummings, please. And then Thank Councilmember you. Bruner, Vice Mayor Bruner. A uh, really brief question, and thanks for that update. I was just curious, um, given the area that's um, being considered for bending in the beach area. I'm just curious whether you all have been in, concert, in, in conversations with the salsa group that's been using that space because I know it's a pretty popular um, activity in the summer and really brings a lot of the community together. And I'm just curious whether there's been conversation with them because I can imagine if you know there's a bunch of people in that area dancing, there can be potential for conflict between the vendors and the people who've been using that site for a very long time. And so I'm just wondering if you've had any opportunity to speak with them. Oh uh, yeah, the salsa dancers. <laughs> you know, we've been in um, touch and um, we discussed this situation with um, our park and rec director, Tony Elliott, who oversees special event permits. And um, it's, it's difficult to kind of plan out because of COVID and whether or not the salsa dancing will continue this year, but we understand the regular times and dates that they're usually out there, and we want to factor that into um, calendaring when vendors, you know, will be available to use the space or not, and um, really trying to find uh, a process in which we could share the space with the whole community, including the salsa dancers. Um, so uh, it's, it's one of those things where it was difficult to make a decision because of COVID, and we're kind of just going to take it, you know, and move along as, as we go, and um, but keeping sort of the salsa dancers on our radar and letting the vendors know that there may be dates and times where vending may be uh, limited because of special events at the site. Great, thank you. But really uh, making it a priority to share the site with the whole community during this time. Uh, Vice Mayor Bruner. Uh, thank you for this update, Ralph, and um, also would like to acknowledge the work of Community Bridges in this process. Um, my questions, um, the first thing I thought of were, there are six additional sites identified there on the deck next to Ideal Barn Grill. Um, how many total identified sites have been identified? <laughs> oh, we're starting with those six. So um, six right now. And social distancing really um, limits the number of vendors we could have um, really at any site at this point. Um, but we looked at um, an aerial view of the location near Beach Street, and this seemed to make the most sense um, when you factor in social distancing. And, um, you, you know, so six is a number we came up with when you measured out um, safe distances from the public and uh, the right of way. And uh, we had public works out there uh, measure this out as well. Um, and, and it's interesting, you know, you'll have some sites 
say that six is too much, and then the other side will say six is not enough. So, um, but as city manager uh, Martin Bernal said, this really is sort of just initial um, pilot project almost to see how, you know, we can have a process in place to really regulate vending and make it fair for everybody, both the community and the vendors, and have the set sort of rules in place to, for everyone to follow and understand. So, uh, just for clarification, no sites on, along the sidewalk there? Because no would create too much of a congestion so okay yeah. so only those six sites so that was my next question which council member cummings brought up was the regular weekly i mean now we're in covid but the regular weekly uh salsa dancing that <laughs> occurs there and so the permit process i don't know if you already have gotten that far in discussion um you know how that permit process gets issued with respect to shared space, um, I think is important. And the markings and signage, um, which council member Brown brought up, um, signage will be key so that, you know, vendors who show up and maybe aren't familiar with the process, there will at least be bilingual signage that indicates what, you know, the process is. And thank you for that. We are finalizing um, the signage right now, and that's one thing that did pop up during our community outreach meetings too. Was um, police officers were not the first city official that vendors wanted to interact with. Mm -hmm. So you know, some signage would be good, and we want to make sure they know who to contact if they have any other questions, as far as the point for permit goes and all of that. Um, and we will continue to work with um, Parks and Rec to make sure that um, that site is shared with the whole community, including some of the dancers. So. Thank you. And Council Member Cummings? Thank you. I just wanted to comment on one thing you said, and I think that as we kind of roll this out, I think it, it would be good if we kind of frame it around being a pilot in that first year um, so that folks understand that we're going to be monitoring it, adjusting it over time to kind of figure out what's going to work best. Um, so I think that to the extent that we can have that be a part of that conversation with the vendors so they don't think that this is something permanent that's like, you know, not going to change, um, especially given the different uses that it's had in the past. And we're still going to be going through COVID and then after COVID, you know, how that's going to shift. Um, I think it'd be, it'd be good if we kind of keep that framing around this first year is going to be more of a pilot to see how it fits within the use of that beach area. Thank you, yeah. Good feedback. And um, it's, it's an issue that's new to a lot of cities, and we are in contact with um, other cities and um, the region to so see how it's impacting them and what actions they're taking as well, just to make sure we're um, approaching it as best as possible. Thank you. And Councilmember Watkins. My comment is really brief because I think it's been addressed with the other council members' questions and comments, but um, I think it'd be good to have one more update prior to the summer months just to sort of make sure that some of these have been reconciled in terms of next steps moving into the high tourist season. So I don't know if that's on the um, kind of the agenda docket, but something that would be beneficial as we uh, gear up for a lot of people in our community going to our beaches. Uh, on that note, I, I might suggest that when it does come back for a follow-up report, that it be put on the agenda as a separate item so that the council can give specific direction should it choose to do so. Okay. I'm happy to do that. Um, City Manager Martin Bernal thinks it's a good idea. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Yeah. okay. Any other questions from council members? Okay. Uh, all right. And okay. Martine, you can continue. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Ralph, and uh, thank you, Council Members, for, for your questions. Um, let's see. Next, I I'm just going to ask uh, Lee Butler if he could just provide an update on the Highway 19 campus. He's been doing work with uh, Caltrans and others to uh, look at uh, what we can do there to try to uh, address some of the, the health and safety issues that we're experiencing. So uh, go ahead, Lee. Thank you, Martine, and good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. Um, wanted to give you a few quick updates. Um, I'm sure you've been hearing a lot from your constituents about the situation out there, particularly as um, there are more and more people 
um, that are occupying the area. Um, right now, we have um, authorization from Caltrans to place a series of 96-gallon trash bins out there. Um, those have been placed out for several months now, and um, we are emptying those five days a week out there. Um, so our team is out there every day um, doing that trash collection. Um, we have also coordinated with Caltrans, CHP, and the county on shoulder closures for dumpster placement. Um, two of those have occurred thus far. Um, those are for larger items or just for accumulation of, of trash. And um, the next 30-yard dumpster placement is scheduled for this Thursday, weather permitting. Um, we're still, you know, we're expecting some rain, but it looks like it, it might be later in the day. And so um, typically we do those closures from 8 a.m. until noon. Um, and we have them planned for every other Thursday through March. Um, and again, that'll be weather permitting, but that's the schedule that we're anticipating. Um, why through the end of March and not ongoing after that? Well, as you all know, we have the Highway 1 and 9 widening project that is going to be kicking off in April. And so we are um, coordinating with Caltrans and the county on how we will be uh, clearing that area to make the, to make way for both the construction and the staging, and um, we're in active conversations with uh, those uh, those entities regarding that. Um, we've got uh, another meeting tomorrow with the county and Caltrans on outreach, and another meeting on Thursday with uh, our public works team and. Um, the uh, Caltrans folks. So um, the work there is ongoing. We're also requesting that um, Caltrans address the number of additional vehicles that um, have been increasing out there. We're, we're concerned with the, the presence of those vehicles and them pulling onto and off of the highway. And so um, our overall approach is um, ongoing um, and, and uh, it's still to be determined about how that clearing will actually occur, but we are having those conversations and the, the issue is imminent given that we've got this construction project that is um, coming up fairly quickly here in April. I'm available for any questions that you may have. Questions from any council members? Council member Golder and then council member Cummings. I want to say thanks, Lee, for that update. And I know a lot of people in the community have reached out to me with questions on where they can, who they can contact when they see dangerous um, situations. Like people have reported, and I've witnessed it myself, individuals crossing where there's no crosswalk. Um, and really, people are going kind of highway speeds, coming and going off Highway 1, whether that light's green or not, and um, the cars that are coming and going. And um, so aside from the trash and the erosion and the other, you know, things, it's just more like a danger to, um, to drivers and pedestrians. And so I've had people call 911 and then they say you have to call the highway patrol and then it gets dispatched to the police department. It's like everyone that has told me that they've gotten these weird like cycles where it's kind of like point, 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 and then no one comes out to resolve the issue. And so. I can't speak to that. I haven't personally called, but I just wonder if you know where someone could call or when calling, who could they re request to come out to help with dangerous situations? So in general, the CHP covers that area. Um, that said, you know, if someone's crossing the street, um, you know, it, it's not that, you know, CHP probably isn't going to come out and, and address that. Um, what I will say is um, that because of some of those safety concerns, Caltrans has acknowledged that there is a problem there. Um, right now, Caltrans requires um, that the uh, governor's office themselves approve any um, clearing of um, individuals on their properties. And so given the safety concerns, similar to those that you've highlighted, Councilmember Golder, they have been, um, they have been willing to um, pursue this. And, um, you know, there are a lot of steps 
uh, leading up to that, that's that's a part of the outreach that the county has been doing out there and that we've been doing with the trash uh, cleanup and that we're continuing to coordinate on, you know, even tomorrow. But yes, there are definitely safety concerns and um, Caltrans has acknowledged those in, um, in expressing general support for um, moving folks from that area, both for the construction project and to address the, the safety issues. Uh, can, can I add that um, we are also, we prepared a letter for the mayor to send to the governor that uh, has uh, a, a number of requests, including that the governor intervene in trying to assist the city with uh, addressing the situation there, and in particular with uh, relocating individuals, because that is a major concern as to uh, where individuals uh, will go, because um, we, we, we don't want to uh, just displace the problem to another location. And then uh, the other requests are, are related to funding, both with respect to COVID funding and long-term homelessness funding that the state uh, really look at a more equitable approach to funding uh, homelessness related uh, uh, and COVID relief uh, for uh, small cities versus larger cities, particularly small cities like ours that have a high level of homelessness and our county cities that have uh, bigger impacts than a suburban type city. Um, for example, in the last uh, round of CARES funding, we received $12 per capita versus larger cities that received $85 per capita of funding. That's a pretty huge difference, and that would have made a huge difference for us if we had received a comparable level or even, uh, you know, even half of that level. So those are the, the other things that we're working on just to try to make some systematic uh, uh, and policy changes as, as well to help us with addressing these situations. And Councilmember Watkins and then Councilmember Cumming. Um, I think my, my question is pretty brief. My understanding, and I, and I welcome the correction if I'm wrong, is that that is the most, um, has been identified as the most dangerous intersection in the city. Is that correct? The Highway 19, sort of right in that area? I'd have to ask Public Works if they, if, here's Kurt Schneider, great. Uh, good afternoon. Chris, uh, you're frozen. Uh oh. Because can get back on. Okay. I have a part two to the question while he's waiting, but, and that is if there was uh, some sort of, you know, horrific accident, is there a liability to the city or, or would the liability go to the state in Caltrans? Um, this is a, a state a state intersection, and while we, the city is doing work within the state right away, we're doing that under a permit. Um, so um, it really is the responsibility of the state. Um, all the right of way that's occupied is currently the state right away. I also just wanted to add with respect to the question about safety is uh, if anyone sees any immediate danger that's occurring, if it's your free for your call and money, uh, and, and uh, obviously ongoing safety concerns can, can be directed to Caltrans, but if somebody's seen an imminent dangerous situation, you know, 911 is, is a good default and, and then they'll, they'll triage as appropriate from there. And, you know, I think what we've emphasized uh, to the state so far you know, the, the intersection has had some major um, collisions. Uh, last year, there was a huge truck fire. No one died, but if that had occurred a little bit closer uh, to where the encampment is, uh, there would have been some significant injuries, potentially deaths. And so we, we really do emphasize this is a major safety issue. Great. Thank you, Thank you Chris. Mm -hmm. Council Member Cummings? Thank you, and, and thank you for that update. I have two quick questions. Um, it was mentioned that uh, the city has been permitted to put dumpsters on this property uh, to help with refuse pickup. I'm just wondering, with you know refuse pickup, and then obviously there's going to be you know cleanup app. You know, if there's ever a time when this needs to be moved, um, but I'm just curious: is Caltrans? helping to financially cover that or is the city going to be able to get reimbursed since this is 
Caltrans property within the city, and we're trying to do this because of the negative impact that we're faced with under the circumstance where we can't move the people on this property because uh, the governor is saying we can't move people out of Caltrans right of ways. That's a great question. Um, so we've had those conversations with Caltrans, and um, Caltrans, in some instances, has taken the stance that, well, these are uh, this is our city residents, and this is city trash. Um, they have expressed a willingness to partner with us. Um, so um, we were pushing for. Um, having them to cover both the cost of the trash removal as well as um, the closures. In fact, we were uh, inquiring about, well, can we put a, a dumpster off, um, you know, not within the shoulder, but, you know, further off of the right of way, um, farther away from the vehicular area, and then you guys cover the cost of that. Um, we did not get anywhere on, in that conversation. Um, they wanted the, the shoulder to be closed. They offered to uh, have the Caltrans folks um, put up the signage and close the shoulder as well as CHP to be out there. They're actually on duty during um, that closure, so that four hour period, Caltrans is there. Um, and, or excuse me, uh, CHP is there. And um, what I have mentioned to them is that even if we were doing a cost sharing, that approach may not be equitable. And I expect that that is the case, given the five times a week that we're doing the trash and the, um, the dumpster um, uh, costs as well. So um, I've indicated to them that we will be tracking our costs. I've encouraged them to do the same. And rather than belabor the issue and not get to a resolution and have trash pile up, we said, Let's, let's make this happen now, and we can work through that um, cost sharing at some point in the future. They're aware of our position, um, whether or not we ultimately get um, more funds for the actual trash removal is still to be determined. Thank you. And then uh, the other question I had, um, city manager mentioned that there's a letter um, from the mayor going to the governor's office. I was wondering if, is there gonna be an item to come to council be, so we can make recommendations on, you know, what might be included in that letter or, you know, can we receive, um, yeah, I think that's the question because um, it seems like, you know, I think we're, we all have a lot of concerns around the situation and, um, you know, wanting to advocate and support the city the best way we can. And so, and I know that we all have different opinions and, and um, have suggestions of what can be included. And so I'm wondering, is there any opportunity for us to kind of provide comments on, you know, what we might want to share um, from the community to the governor's office on this issue? The, yeah, go ahead, Martine. And then no, I'll it, in it's well. not an item that would be agendized, but I think council members are certainly free to, to, to uh, provide feedback to the mayor. Um, and you know, obviously what the, is included in there is sort of consistent with the council adopted policies and, and approaches. And I think I, I, I outlined basically the, the major ask, which is you know, assistance with uh, uh, addressing the situation there, relocating individuals, uh, trying to deal with safety, and also some of the equity issues. But yeah, certainly council members can forward any suggestions or thoughts to the mayor and we can incorporate them into the letter. It hasn't gone out, so there's time to, to edit that. Okay. Yeah, we're drafting the, um, we are drafting the letter. Um, the most pressing issue, obviously, is the Highway 1 and 9, and we are focused on that. So we do need to get the letter out. We've been working on it for, I think, almost two weeks now. <laughs> um, so it's something we actually need to land at the governor's office fairly soon, but I'm happy to gather any comments. Um, very similar to the letters that were put out in the last year by the mayor and vice mayor, uh, Mayor Cummings, when you were mayor asking obviously for uh, long-term funding as well as more equitable funding for under COVID relief. Um, and uh, we have also met with uh, assembly member Stone, Senator Laird and uh, Congressman Panetta in the last week um, to help them understand the issues that we're facing. And we are working very closely with their offices as well as uh, Supervisor uh, Coonerty and McPherson's office as well. So we've been doing a lot of this work uh, and staff's been very helpful in trying to get this information out and uh, 
get the uh, request to the state as soon as possible based on the, the need as described by Mr. Schneider and, and others today. Great. That was, I was, that was going to be my next question is whether there were conversations or letters going out to the other representatives. So I just want to thank you all for everything you're doing to help us try to address this issue. Councilmember Brown. Yeah, I, I also want to thank you for uh, all of the work that trying to find a way to make this um, less dangerous, less hazardous and, uh, uh, you know, deal with the waste management issues. I know that it's it's a serious problem. I'm, so I have a couple of questions. Uh, one, um, if so, who is so the dumpsters are there? They're removed on a regular basis, and then so the, is it the people who are there in the? I mean, are Parks and Rec workers um, involved in that cleanup beyond the remove? You know, emptying of the dumpsters. Are there other city? kind of workers involved and in, in if, if so, I'm just wondering about the cost of that as well. And then I have a question for Martine for um, afterwards, just a quick one. Sure, so, um, you know, there are a lot of efforts behind the scenes, um, and including, you know, the coordination with Caltrans. Um, it's actually the Public Works Department is the one that is um, doing the daily um, trash removal. They are not going down and picking things up off of the ground. Um, so, you know, the bins that are placed up at the uh, shoulder around 5 a.m. each morning, they are coming through, grabbing them, dumping them, and going on their way. And then the Public Works is also um, servicing the dumpster on the uh, uh, what will be bi weekly basis. Um, so, those are the folks that are out there um, most regularly. And then, you know, between Public Works on the, um, the not the refuse management side, but the um, public improvements related to Highway 1 and 9, there's been substantial coordination, as well as our coordination with the outreach teams at the county, and um, also our, our coordination with individuals who are out there volunteering their time to help clean things up. Um, they have been helpful in, um, taking some of the trash that's on the ground and getting it into the bin and getting it into the dumpsters. And so our team has been coordinating with those individuals as well. Thanks, yeah, so I just wanted to um, kind of get a handle on that. I, Cause I had heard that there are volunteers and that some people in the, who are, who are staying there at the moment uh, were involved in, you know, at least getting trash into the bins. Um, and so uh, that's great. And I want to give a shout out to the, those folks, volunteer teams, and Ron Perigo, who was, uh, you know, really pivotal in getting, doing some of the hauling when we weren't, <laughs> we weren't quite there with Caltrans. Um, so my other question is, um, Martine, if you if you could um, remind me, I think I may have known, and I just can't remember, if the the governor's order to not allow clearance on state land and cabin clearance on state lands is uh, blanket or if that is without uh, a relocation a place to relocate without some kind of relocation plan is it just no um, you know I mean I know the CDC guidelines say no um, disruption of the um, encampments, which I support, I'll just say that. Um, but in terms of our inability to do anything about it, is that, is, are we stuck because of the relocation issue or are we stuck because we just can't do anything at the moment? Um, and Lee's the one that's had the most conversations with the, the state officials, because I think it's, there's some variation out there. Um, and that, but I think, I think in general, the, the, the position they've taken is that they, 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 they don't want to uh, move individuals without having an identified place for them to go. And I think that, and Lee, you can add it to that if, they, uh, if there's more. There. Yeah. I, I would just add that we have requested that Caltrans um, provide their own properties um, for uh, relocation. And if they do not have or cannot provide their own properties, that they um, work with partner, their partners at the state to 
identify locations, whether that's uh, state park lands or elsewhere. And so those conversations are ongoing. And um, I think the outcome is still to be determined. But um, I think from everyone's perspective, our preference would be to have a specific location where individuals can go. We also have um, some significant timing concerns in terms of the grant application that we have and the need to move forward with the commencement of construction um, and our ability to um, uh, continue to receive that grant funding is contingent on the start of construction. And so um, there are uh, a number of factors that need to be considered and um, we're trying to move forward expeditiously while also hoping to um, identify a specific location. Yeah, and that's, that's always the case that, uh, you know, our strong preference is for individuals to have a place to go uh, that's appropriate. That, that would be always the ideal situation. Um, and we'll work with them to try to achieve that. Uh, you know, uh, scattering people uh, throughout the city is not an ideal outcome that we'd like. Um, and, and moreover, obviously, there's some issues around the pandemic and everything else. Um, uh, but that at times has to be balanced, as you know, with the, the conditions that can arise there. Um, and so we're, we're trying to see what we can do to, again, balance those, those, those two things in, in, in a reasonable way. Thanks. And just a quick uh, one other thing and, now, and more of an announcement. So as so, uh, Lee mentioned the meeting on Thursday, um, I just want to say uh, thank uh, Mayor Myers for bringing this up at the uh, Regional Transportation Commission, uh, where we have a Caltrans uh, representative uh, who was very well aware of the issues, and we will be have will be part of that meeting, and um, we also will um, uh, will have two supervisors, um, uh, Supervisor Coonerty and Supervisor McPherson, whose uh, you know districts kind of uh, overlap with the um, the Highway One and Nine. Uh, space there, so we are. We will have um, you know elected officials in the conversation as well. Uh, so that's an opportunity to um, share our perspective. So if anybody does, any other council members want to weigh in, I'm happy to take uh, hear from you uh, in advance. Any other questions? Uh, I appreciate the council's discussion and question on this. It's um, and just for our community who may be listening, um, it's a very, very difficult situation. Um, and every every one of these situations sort of has its own flavor. So we are um, very much trying to make our way through a difficult situation. I really wanna recognize Lee and Martine and other city staff who have just really been really daily working on this, trying to get resolution, trying to make sure that um, something very bad doesn't happen there. I think our whole community has their eyes on this situation and we are trying to move as fast as possible, but we are definitely hampered by the way the state is um, sort of looking at the situation. And uh, again, also with no real solutions on where these folks can go, unfortunately. So we are, in my opinion, really caught in the middle in a very bad situation. But I uh, just want to let our community know that we're working on it as, as hard as we can. Um, Martine, do you have an, any other items on your report? Uh, just a very brief update on vaccinations. Uh, if, uh, yeah, that's great. Which I can do or I can... Uh, yeah, please please go ahead, Martine. We're on the okay. All right, I'm going to uh, just share my screen real quick. Um, a couple of items uh, with respect to vaccinations. Uh, one, um, first of all, with respect to the overall picture, in obviously there's a, a lot more uh, demand than there is supply, and so that uh, obviously there's a lot of frustrations around that and concerns not just here but throughout the whole country. Um, but uh, in terms of at least one measure uh, that I received uh, some information about uh, just a few hours ago uh, about how we are doing here as a county relative to other counties with the uh, the vaccines that we have received and, have, and how they've been allocated. Um, we're, we're thus far uh, number nine out of 58 counties in terms of the uh, level of vaccination per 100,000. And here you see in this chart the different counties uh, listed uh, by uh, the, the name of the county, the population, the number of vaccinations, and then that uh, 
portion that's been given out. So we're we're number nine. That's that's pretty good, uh, all things considered. Uh, so we've uh, we've got a rate of fourteen thousand six hundred and eight per hundred thousand, and a total of almost forty thousand dollars, forty thousand vaccinations uh, uh, issued. Uh, and then uh, to remind uh, everyone as far as where we are in this chart, you can see that uh, these are the tiers that have been um, created by the state insofar as how the vaccines will roll out. Phase 1A, which largely comprised of healthcare uh, staff in, in the various areas, um, such as uh, doctors and nurses and EMTs and paramedics and uh, those folks that live in uh, in-home supportive services and, and the like. That tier is, is, is in phase 1A and, and those have been completed um, in our county. Um, and we are currently in phase 1B, which uh, is uh, uh, includes uh, at this point individuals 65 and older. Although I do know that some inroads have been made in terms of workers in education, childcare, food and agriculture, uh, and law enforcement as well. but. That we're essentially in the in the in the, in the, the first bullet of phase one B, uh, and then after that, uh, once that's completed, and it's all based on really the supply of uh, vaccinations that uh, that come in, uh, then then it'll it'll move on to uh, individuals that are between the ages of 50 and 64, and then younger uh, individuals that have at a high risk, and then workers in, in particular. Uh, in just uh, essential areas like chemical communications, IT, defense, finance, government operations, community-based organization, and water and wastewater, which is a concern to us too, because those are essential facilities for the city. Uh, and then it moves on from there. So that's where we're at. Uh, and again, there's a lot of frustrations and questions and, that are going on around uh, the, the, uh, the limited supply. Um, but uh, at least on, on one measure, you know, we're doing pretty pretty well relative uh, to other counties. And that concludes the, the report. Thank you, Martine. Any questions from council members on the vaccine update? No. Oh, no, it looks like you they do have a. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, here we go. Goldish. Yeah, they didn't pop up right, right away for me. Um, council member Golder and council member Cummings. Uh, thank you, Martine, for giving that update. And that's great news that we are, you know, doing so well compared to other counties in the state. I'm wondering for members of the public, how can they um, find out when it's their turn? I know there's been some confusion around that. I was wondering if you could share that. Yeah, so there is a, uh, an app uh, and a website that you can go into and to register. It's called My Turn. Um, and if you just Google My Turn uh, California, it will direct you to that. And then you can, uh, if you have a smartphone, you can, uh, uh, or you can register actually, and then uh, online, you don't have to have a smartphone for that, you can just register. Uh, and then it will notify you uh, through your smartphone, if you have a smartphone, as to when your turn is to get vaccinated. So they have a system of registering folks, uh, and then uh, they'll be able to make those assignments. Uh, so they ask a series of questions so that they can determine which tier you fall into. I imagine they might have some, uh, maybe some certifications that will happen as well. But that's one good way. And then of course the other way is to uh, go on to the county uh, vaccination website, which is where that chart was that I just uh, showed, that gives you a kind of a status as to uh, where they're at. It also shows where all the various vaccine initiative sites are and the status of each of those. Uh, uh, and, uh, and of course, also check with your, uh, your health provider as well. I think those are the, the, the places I would uh, check, check uh, and, and look at regularly to, to look at what your options are. Uh, Council Member Cummings. Uh, thank you for that update. And, and my question was actually asked by Councilmember Golder, but something else came up um, while we were kind of hearing that feedback. And one of the, the things that comes to mind is, you know, when you think about the demographic of 65 and older, um, there might be, you know, a proportion of that demographic that either doesn't have internet or maybe isn't that internet savvy. And so I'm wondering if there's any other ways we can get that information out to people that's not necessarily via the internet, or if there's maybe um, we can work with nonprofits to try to reach some of those populations that may um, just, you know, traditionally not use the internet and uh, to make sure that they get this information and they can get vaccinated sooner than later. Uh, yes, and, and I know that the county is working with uh, a number of uh, nonprofit service providers uh, that, uh, uh, and community-based organizations to, to do that. Uh, I'm not intimately familiar with the 
everything they're doing, but I do know that that is a, a concern. And there's a variety of issues also that relate to equity too. Sometimes the the, uh, the demographic of age you know creates a particular uh, issue. For example, one that's been raised that's interesting uh, is that uh, in some cities, if the demographic is 65 and over, uh, has very few, for example, Latinos in that group to end up sort of disproportionately allocating the vaccine. Again, those are all issues that are, are taken into account and that I think uh, are being looked at and adjusted. Uh, but yes, we, we will certainly work with the health department to, to try to do as much outreach as we can based on uh, uh, what we have and, and what's available. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and I would chime in that the um, the county has a very, yeah, has a very thorough plan on how to reach people that um, are not connected virtually. Um, and obviously have been working through a lot of the nonprofits, but also um, the different um, medical providers throughout Santa Cruz County. So trying to utilize people's, uh, you know, personal doctors or uh, clinics such as Santa Cruz um, Health clinic and others. So there's definitely a, a very large scale effort to try to get the word out to as many people as possible about availability and scheduling, which is great. Um, any other questions from council members? Okay. I will move on to the uh, meeting calendar. And Bonnie, is there any update to our meeting calendar? There are none. Great. Okay. Um, we are a few minutes uh, on, we're a little ahead of time. I'm wondering if folks would and just consider taking a quick five to seven minute break. Does that sound good? Um, we'll come back in at uh, let's make it um, 150, so 10 to 2, we'll come back and um, we'll go through, we'll start up with our consent agenda. So for the public, we're going to take a break until uh, 150 and uh, then we'll come back for consent, uh, consent agenda items 9 through 17. Thank you. Council members who are back, if you can turn on your uh, please turn on your cameras. Looks like we have pretty much everyone back. <clears throat> go ahead and get started and hopefully council member Cummings will join us shortly I'm sure uh, next up we have the consent agenda these are items 9 through 17 on our agenda for members of the public who are streaming this meeting now is the time for you to call in if you want to comment on items 9 through 17 instructions are on your screen Please remember to mute your streaming device, press star nine to raise your hand, and listen for the cue saying you have been unmuted. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. Are there any council members who wish to comment or pull any item? Like we are all set. Okay. Okay. So 
I would look, are there any members of the public that would like to speak to any item on our consent agenda? With the exception of items pulled, we have not uh, pulled any items today. Please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. Oh, I'm sorry, Sandy, did I miss your hand? Did you say when you are about no. Pulling? No, I was just going to move the consent agenda, but okay. I'll, I'll wait. Let me see if we have anybody in the public. I don't think we do. I don't see any. Okay, we have a motion by uh, Council Member Brown and a second by Council Member Watkins. And all, all in favor of Let's see, motion well, by I'm all in favor, roll, please. Roll. Yes, please do. <laughs> Council Member Watkins? Aye. Calantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Golder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. Mayor Myers? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. We will now move on to our next item, which is our consent public hearing. And this is item number 18, consent public hearing for the second reading and final adoption of ordinance number 2021-01 through 902, 912 and 920 Pacific Avenue and 333 and 423 Front Street. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in and using the instructions on your screen. I would now like to ask Ryan Bain, Senior Planner, to provide council with a brief announcement on this item. Yes, good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. I uh, just wanted to let you know that we, we made a clerical update to the ordinance just basically to clarify and reflect um, that the rezoning is also a local coastal plan amendment. So this has no material effect on the approval and is consistent with the approval that the council made on January 26th. But we just wanna make you aware of a couple of small changes uh, in the ordinance. How is it? Thank you, Mr. Bain. Are there any council members who wish to pull item 18 for discussion? any are there any council members who wish to only comment on item 18 not seeing any hearing none uh, if there are any members of the public that would like to speak to this item now is the time to do so please press star 9 on your phone to raise your hand when it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. I don't see any members of the public who want to speak. Maybe Vice Mayor Bruner, if you want to call for a motion. And I'm back. Excuse me, I apologize to the public. Um, uh, I do not see any, um, uh, members of the public request me, so I'm now looking for a motion on this item. And I did not see who went first, so I'll call on Council Member Cummings. Yeah, I'll move the um, consent public hearing item. Okay, and second by Watkins. And could we have a roll call vote, please? Council Member Watkins? Aye. Calantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Golder? Aye. 
Vice Mayor Bruner. Aye. And Mayor Myers. Aye. That motion passes unanimously. We'll now move on to item number 18. Excuse me, that was 18. Hang on one second. Let me just look here. And we will now move on to item number 19, which is our fiscal year 2021 budget adjustments and information on city's financial status. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. Okay, we will go ahead and uh, have Lupita Alamos, our finance manager, please um, provide the staff report. I'll defer uh, to our director, Kim Kraft, to introduce, introduce the item. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Kim. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor and council members. Uh, we have our mid-year budget presentation uh, this afternoon, and so Lupita will go through the fiscal 2021 adjustments, and I will do the like fiscal 2022 outlook. Um, so in the, we have some adjustments to revenue and expenditures for 2021. Uh, we have some position changes, and then we have a fiscal 2022 strategy and outlook. And then I'll turn it back to Lupita to go over the calendar for next year. Great. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Mayor Myers and council members. Lupita, budget manager. Um, and we'll start off with revenue trends. And in regard to trends, um, San Cruz is still in the recovery phase of the pandemic. Um, having moved back to the purple tier helped, and we hope that with the administration of the vaccine, um, we'll continue to see gradual improvements to the economy. Um, tourism uh, and elastic revenue resources associated with it continue to be heavily hit by business shutdowns. Um, with major area attractions being closed, um, admission tax taxes, uh, revenue source um, will continue to be impacted. Um, the city typically receives about two million in this revenue source. And uh, we receive these from festivals, um, movie theaters, museums, and, and the uh, boardwalk being a major source of this um, revenue. Likewise, um, TOT tax is within or, or is below our 2020 level. Um, and with the summer being the highest revenue generating period, um, fiscal year 2021 will um, most, most likely not see a full recovery in TOT. Um, city fees, especially those collected um, for recreation programs, will also not see a full cost recovery. While the Parks and Recreation Department have done a great job at adapting um, to the circumstances and finding creative and safe ways to hold um, programs, they're not operating to the extent of their normal programming. So we'll see um, declines in this revenue source. Uh, UCSC continues to operate remotely, um, impacting the economic benefits that the university population contributes to the city. Um, and on a positive note, property and sales tax, uh, which is a large percentage of our revenue, um, continues to hold steady. So real estate sales have benefited from a lot of the virtual tours um, that the real estates have adapted to, and sales tax from construction and online sales activity um, has definitely helped steady our revenue stream. And on to um, reviewing some of the adjustments that we'll be covering and that are also listed in detail and attachment to a report. Um, I will be just covering some of the highlights um, that are listed. And as, as is typical, every mid-year cycle, um, adjustments are made um, resulting from administrative cleanup, um, implementation of new programs or any response to any, any um, excuse me, unanticipated needs. Um, the following list highlights uh, what's included in the report, as I mentioned, and we'll start off with the general fund. 
Um, as mentioned earlier, the admission tax is going to be reduced. We're going to reduce that revenue by two million. Um, the next bullet on this list is the fire department is expecting to receive about 1.4 million in reimbursement for from the state for the strike team uh, response to several of the large um, fires and emergencies, such as the CCU fire. Um, the additional revenue reimbursement to the city, um, or excuse me, the um, reimbursements to the city cover personnel costs, equipment costs, and administrative costs. Um, and any uh, revenue will offset some of the expenditures also being requested by the department, which is 64,000 here listed for fire vehicle um, maintenance. The parks department is requesting 25,000 for unanticipated major encampment cleanup, cleanup costs um, of the San Lorenzo Park. And also the planning department uh, building and safety division is requesting 250,000 to provide inspection plan check services. Um, the division has been impacted um, by new vacancies and ongoing recruitment challenges. Um, the funds will support a permit tax as well as other tax support for upcoming land use system upgrade. Um, also, adjustment highlights um, to the other funds when we'll we move over to water. Um, you'll see a reduction also in four million in water sales and um, service revenue. And this is most likely also due to COVID related operating um, restrictions. Um, and also an adjustment of about 168,000 in response to CCU fire as well and COVID related expenditures. Um, and most of these expenditures are expected to be reimbursed by FEMA. Um, the expenditures include um, fire control measures at facilities located in the evacuation zones, um, new equipment needs to address possible water quality impacts as well as erosion control in the burn area. Um, um, other adjustments listed here include 120,000 for the water rights project 70,000 70, for the replacement of a water distribution dump truck, and 50,000 for the treatment of water reservoir. Um, the changes requested in the information technology IT funds in the middle column here um, are simply a movement of funds. Um, these do not reflect any new appropriations, and um, that reflects operational best practices. Um, and then moving on to the public trust fund, we're making an adjustment or recommending an adjustment for 100,000. Um, and this is requested for the downtown library mixed use um, project for the development of the um, parking portion of the project. And then finally listed here is an adjustment of 1.8 million for, from the um, affordable housing trust fund. And this is to pay for the acquisition of 325 and 329 Front Street properties um, and this is for the development of affordable housing. And next we'll, we'll move on to position changes um, by department and here we have um, city manager of public works and water making a few um, changes to their personnel complement. And we'll start with the city manager's office. They'll be uh, requesting to add one um, FTE deputy city manager one two position. Um, the two levels allow the department to fill the vacancy internally, um, use, utilizing an existing department director, um, at which time that director's position would be frozen. And, or in the future, for hiring without assuming city responsibility. Um, the current recommendation, as um, listed in, in the attachment, is uh, reflecting the cost of hiring an existing department director. Um, at a partial cost of about 7,500. Um, and a significant area of responsibility for the deputy city manager would be um, managing and coordinating the homelessness issues, which actually would result in some cost savings because um, by having this additional responsibility, you, the department would also be freezing the homelessness response manager position also in their complement. For the Public Works Department, um, in the middle column, they're requesting to delete one FTE Senior Waste Water Plant Operator 3 position. This position has been vacant since 2000.
2017 and is no longer needed. So the deletion would reduce cost to the wastewater um, fund. The department is also requesting to add 2.6 FTE um, facility maintenance officers, um, excuse me, facility maintenance assistance positions. Um, and these would be supported by the parking fund. Um, the positions would address operational needs. Um, it would enhance continuity of services. Um, it would help promote health and safety and alleviate inconsistencies due to staff turnover. Um, and finally, in the public works um, department, they're requesting a position title change um, from traffic engineer to transportation manager. Um, and the change in the title uh, better reflects the current position's responsibility, and the change uh, does not result in increasing supporting funds. And then finally, covering the water department's um, personnel changes, um, they're requesting to delete one FTE senior plant maintenance um, mechanic, and um, this has been replaced by a new classification of water facilities mechanic supervisor. Um, and delete one FTE water resource supervisor, um, which was never filled since its creation um, as the San Lorenzo River work that this position was to support um, has been reprioritized and council. Um, so this position will reduce costs in the water fund. And um, so the following table summarizes all the fund impacts uh, proposed in the attachment. Uh, two of the report, and um, the total revenue adjustments are reducing uh, 3.9 million in all funds, um, of which 163 of that is reducing the general funds. And for the expenditure side, we have a total of 5 million, about 5 million being added in the expenditures um, across all funds, and of that, about 2.2 million is um, general funded. Um, so that summarizes the adjustments that we're requesting, and in our next slide, we'll, um, our director, um, Kim Krauss, will be covering the budget outlook. Before we do the outlook, do you have any questions on the adjustments? Any questions on the adjustments from council members? Council member Brown and council member Watkins. So, I do have questions on the adjustments, but it's uh, probably going to lead to a more substantive conversation about uh, the, comp the personnel complement. So I just hold those it, so as not to take us off track. Okay, thank you. And Council Member Cummings after Council Member Watkins. That was going to be my comments as well. So I'm just going to hold off on mine because I think it, it'll be a longer conversation. I don't want to interrupt the flow. Thank you. Great, thank you. I walk in. I'll defer my, my questions as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Mayor. So we're gonna talk a little bit about our, our outlook for fiscal 2022 and the assumptions that we're using uh, for the, in the management partners fiscal model. You can go ahead, Lupita, thank you. Uh, so we are projecting a bit of a decline in the transient occupancy tax or hotel tax, uh, the admissions tax, recreation uh, fees, and other city permitting revenue. And Lupita just talked about that a little bit in uh, fiscal 2021. So the admissions tax uh, for fiscal 2021 was budgeted at about 2.2 million. We typically get between like 2.6 and 3 million. And year to date through December, we had collected 35,000. So we made that adjustment in 2021 to reduce it by 2 million. And then we're also projecting uh, like a decline in 2022, assuming that we're not gonna be back to full recovery by the summer. And looking at our transient occupancy tax due to the additional lockdown that Lupita discussed, uh, we're also projecting that, that that may not be back to uh, full recovery either in 2022. Uh, the 2022 assumptions uh, do not include any continued furloughs. 
Uh, it does assume that vacant and frozen positions are being filled. Uh, however, approvals to fill will be based on the department budget solutions from the targets they were given for reductions, uh, their operational need, and the overall impact to the general fund. So the city manager will be reviewing those and make a, making a recommendation to the council. It does assume a modest increase in operational costs, uh, of course, continued increase in pension costs as the city's unfunded liability goes up, and it does not assume any additional federal or state aid. And while there is state aid, federal aid included in Biden's new, President Biden's new plan, we do not know a dollar amount for that. So no, none is included at this time. The next slide, thank you. So we put together some budget scenarios on base, based on the questions that we commonly get. And this is from the management partners forecast uh, uh, model that we purchased. So the first scenario is let's assume status quo and we don't make any further reductions on the expenditure side of the budget or have any new revenues. And this is based on the revenues that were presented to council in October. So as you can see, uh, we have a structural uh, deficit. So the blue line, the dotted blue line is our reserve goal, which is 17% of general fund expenditures. So that's government finance officers best practice. And then the red line is what the forecast is coming out with, with the revenue projections from October and no additional cuts. So the structural deficit is when that red line doesn't keep pace with the blue line. So that means we have to make adjustments to our budget to keep that red line uh, near the blue line. Our reserve line. So this, this forecast shows like by 2026, we're out of money in the general fund. The next scenario, we assumed the revenue estimates that we made recently, which is a $2 million reduction in 2021 in emissions tax, and then an additional $4 million reduction in 2022 for transient occupancy tax, emissions tax, and reduced parks and recreation revenues. So this one, the, the cliff of the red line is quite a bit steeper. Uh, so we have to make adjustments based on uh, these projections. Now, in this scenario, we run out of money by 2023. So it's kind of similar to the management partners forecast uh, from last August, where it was kind of a really steep decline uh, based on the revenue estimates from back then. In October, we were feeling a little bit more positive uh, as you know things had kind of opened back up. But then we uh, went through the holidays where everything was closed down again and revenues were greatly impacted. So the, you know, the sooner things open, the, the better our scenarios will be. Yeah, you can go ahead, Lupita, thank you. So th this scenario assumes that we have a new revenue source. And you know, it takes a long time to ramp up new revenues. So we assumed a new revenue source of about $3 million starting in the fourth quarter of 2022. And it also assumes that we don't make any adjustments on the expenditure side. So we're still assuming a $6 million revenue reduction in 2021 and 22, but we're adding a new revenue starting in the fourth quarter of 2022. So we still have a really steep decline um, on the red line, but it flattens out then in 2022, uh, 2023 as we collect new revenues. And then we kind of continue to grow, but we never get back to the blue dotted line of our reserve goal. The next scenario, the, the other question that we get is, well, what about federal aid or state aid? If we get that, will that, will that fix our problem? Our problem is structural, so it doesn't fix it. It does help, but it doesn't fix it. So we added federal aid in in this scenario and we still included the, the 3 million in the new revenue. So the federal aid, we just used 3 million. We don't have a real estimate yet. Um, so, and we also assume that we don't make any adjustments on the expenditure side. So as you can see, the red line doesn't drop as far down as the red line on the graph on the left, um, but it still drops below 10 million. 
and and then it just it it goes the same as the red line on the left it's just a little bit higher but we still never get back to our reserve goal the next slide please thank you so this uh, scenario on the left that's kind of in the gray that's kind of what we think our realistic scenario is uh, so we have the continued lowered revenue estimates in 21 and 22 and then the target that we gave for departments to reduce is a total of 3.75 million in structural and one-time cuts. If you recall, the original management partners forecast was 12 million over two years. Last year, we requested the departments to reduce 6 million. We ended up with about uh, 5.2, 5.3 million. And those were a mix of one-time and structural cuts. So this time we said, okay, it's, it's not likely we can get all structural reductions. So we're gonna do a mix of structural and one-time cuts uh, with no new revenue source and no federal aid. We would have to do that two years in a row. And then we would get our red line back to our, our blue dotted line in 2029. Although we get really close to it in 2026. So that's what we're using for our, the budget that will be presented to you in May. Then we took that scenario on the left, the realistic scenario, and we added some federal aid. And as you can see, it still doesn't keep us from having to do structural and one-time cuts in the second year. It does keep the line from getting as low, uh, the red line, and it does help us return to our reserve goal sooner, but it still doesn't keep us from having to make cuts in fiscal 2023. Okay, thank you, Lupita. Yes. So the general fund redu target reduction that we gave to departments is 3.75 million overall. Uh, we did uh, have a mix of structural and one-time cuts focused on non-core programs and services. We also have some department, it's not across, the reduction target isn't across the board like we did in fiscal 2021 budget. So we gave some department specific reductions based on their prior year uh, reductions. So departments that turned in one-time reductions for fiscal 2021, they received that target again. So we asked them to make structural reductions this time in the amount that were one-time reductions last year. We also analyzed the professional services and supplies budgets of every general fund department and looked at their, their unspent fund trends. So if they had more than 12% of their services and supplies budget uh, between their adopted budget and their actual expenditures remaining every year, then we took that amount and we gave them additional target so two departments received an additional target for unspent funds that exceeded 12% of their adopted budget. And then the rest of the, the balance, which is from the 3.75 million, it's, uh, it's about 1.9 million that was distributed among the departments. Uh, we're continuing to look at greater cost recovery with planning and parks. Uh, we're also still looking for federal and state aid, and we recently met with our legislative representatives to lobby uh, for additional resources. Uh, the Council Ad Hoc Revenue Subcommittee meet, starts meeting this week to discuss options uh, for a new revenue source. And we're implementing strategies from the interim recovery plan that hopefully will help us recover sooner economically. And then we also need to develop a strategy to address our capital investment program, which isn't really being addressed right now and it is still a need. So I'll go ahead and cover just the next steps of what um, we plan to um, move forward with fiscal year 22 operating as the IT budget calendar. Um, as we mentioned, the Council Ad Hoc Revenue Committee will have their first meeting um, this Thursday, February 11th. <clears throat> and then uh, between February and May, um, staff is spending um, time prepping for their operating and CIP items. 
Um, so departments will be proposing their budget solutions. Um, staff will, finance staff will be doing revenue analysis, revenue and analysis on fund impact based on those recommendations. And um, then we will refine those um, fiscal year 22 budget recommendations with the input of um, city manager and new director. And then in May, um, CIP will be uh, will start being reviewed by the various commissions um, as the dates are um, are secured. We'll go ahead and update our calendar, um, and then we'll have our public hearings um, scheduled, targeted for May 25th and 26th. This is um, typically a time when departments um, make presentations and solicit um, public engagement and questions on um, the budget being put forth. And then our target for budget adoption is scheduled for June 8th, 2021. And with that, it concludes our presentation and um, the recommendation for council is um, written here as is written in the staff report. So with that, do you have any questions? Thank you, Lupita and, and Kim. Um, a sobering uh, presentation, but uh, I think we we all know sort of the impacts that we're all experiencing uh, regarding this. Um, I'll take up just a few questions. I, I just want to I do want to open this up to the public, um, but and then we will and. So if we do have council uh, questions right now, I'll go ahead and, and have you ask those and then we'll take it out to public comment and then we'll come back for deliberation and action. So council members who have questions, please raise your hand. I've got uh, Vice Mayor Bruner, uh, Council Member Brown, Council Member Rock Watkins, you guys all rose, raised your hands just like that. Uh, Council Member Kalantari Johnson and then Council Member Cummings. Thank you. Um, can you speak to um, the filling of the city manager, that executive level position? Um, and uh, just the, the need for filling that before the budget is pr approved? And it was also mentioned that other positions would be frozen, um, which wasn't listed. Can you speak to those, please? Our team, you want to? You're mute. You're muted, Martine. <gasps> Sorry about that. Uh, yes, okay, now I can. Uh... Uh, see why you were wondering what which one. <laughs> Sorry you don't that. have a barking dog at home, I guess. <laughs> yeah, um, I started speaking and yeah, nobody heard it. Um, so uh, to answer your question, I did hear the question. Uh, basically, right now we have um, a number of frozen positions. You know, every position that becomes vacant, uh, we're keeping frozen, and we have uh, have kept frozen just because of the uncertainty of the budget. And then there's an internal process where they are um, exempted if there's an operational need or it's absolutely necessary to, uh, to fill those positions. So we go through and review requests uh, for those positions that are necessary to fill. Um, and we do exempt them you know, based on uh, need, operational need in particular uh, and budget impact. But uh, typically, uh, automatically, whenever a position becomes vacant, uh, it uh, is uh, uh, frozen. Um, in the case of the uh, homeless resource manager, that position became vacant uh, after uh, we had a, a, a well, we had a, early on we had a difficult time hiring the position. We did hire somebody, uh, the person left the position, and we just really had a hard time filling that position. Uh, there was an interest in, in uh, filling that position because the coordination of homeless issues is such a major. Uh, issue for us, as you all are aware, are well aware of, uh, and just really required a significant level of coordination and communication with the county, with uh, all the stakeholders. Uh, it's a significant uh, uh, resource need that we have. And so as a result of the challenge that we've had with 
filling the position and being able to allocate that function and that role. Uh, what we did instead is really reassign the work uh, internally to, to existing staff. And so uh, what we did there was uh, essentially reallocate the, uh, our planning director and assign them an additional job basically uh, to be our homelessness uh, coordinator and lead uh, at the, at the, at the uh, at a high level, uh, being the person that's the main uh, principal contact with the county, with the two-by-two -two committee, with the electives, uh, and then coordinating you know, citywide internally our homelessness response efforts. Uh, we also actually assigned uh, our emergency services uh, manager also to assist in this regard, uh, in addition to the staff that was working on, the, on this issue. So that is uh, uh, what we did in order to be able to have uh, to be able to respond immediately because it was ongoing work. And again, we were not able to uh, fill the position. Um, so with respect to the deputy city manager position, uh, what that is, it's really not an addition of a, uh, of a position. We're not adding a position. All we're doing is providing a flexible option for when, and this is very commonly used in, in, in municipalities and counties and, and governmental agencies where when someone is given an assignment, uh, there's a way to recognize that additional work. Um, and in the case, and usually it's used as a budget saving strategy, whereby um, you, uh, instead of having two people fill a position, you ask a, a person to take on an additional role. Sometimes it's in the form of you know, a director overseeing two departments where there used to be one department uh, uh, that they were, they were overseeing. And so that is really the intent of this, is to provide a way to uh, achieve uh, savings uh, as well as to uh, effectively use the existing staff that we have and acknowledge the additional work uh, that is being done to be able to fulfill the, that function. So that's what we're trying to do here, simply uh, provide the necessary and appropriate level of resources to the homelessness response function, which is necessary within the, our existing parameters and, uh, and allocate that uh, and acknowledge that appropriately. So that is the intent uh, behind that. It also provides flexibility uh, for in the future if we want to have the ability again to essentially ask someone to take on two jobs to be able to uh, uh, have them uh, compensated and acknowledged appropriately. So that, that, that is the intent behind that. Is that, is that your only question, Sonia? Excuse me, Vice Mayor Brunner? Yes, for now, thank you. Okay, thank you. I have uh, Council Member Brown next, please. Thank you. Yeah, my questions are actually following on uh, Vice Mayor Brunner's question about this uh, position addition. And I understand the intent and I, um, I think that that makes a lot of sense, and you know, so I want to support that. Um, but, but with respect to this uh, message that we need to make structural changes to the budget, what I see here is actually the potential to increase our costs with an additional executive level position. Um, so it's not so just because that's the way it's going to work in this moment doesn't mean that the way it's we're being asked to approve it would not lead to significant additional costs at the executive level. And so, you know, we're not gonna freeze the planning department director position forever, I imagine. Um, and then we will have added another executive level position that would need to be filled either with a different department head or, you know, some other, uh, you know, through some other arrangement, which could be an additional whole person. At, at that executive level. So I am trying to understand how um, we can, I mean, we can consider this in the moment a uh, um, minimal cost addition, but there's really not gonna be any savings and the minimal is gonna, is gonna get bigger over time, most likely. So I'm trying to figure out a way to um, support the intention, but I also wanna call attention to the fact that we are in a fiscal crisis and we are being asked to approve a non-essential position, executive level position. So if you could just talk a little bit about that. Yeah. I have some questions as well. Yeah, let me clarify. This this action does not add a position. It does, it does not authorize the addition of a new uh, position or a new person. All it does is allow, when we make an assignment for that 
exist, existing department heads to have a different classification while they're doing that role. It does not add uh, an additional position. It does not add to the budget uh, in that respect. Um, all it does is give a, a five to 10% uh, uh, adjustments in pay. So at most, uh, it would be in the range of you know, $7,500. That is if, uh, uh, if all the positions are filled. Uh, uh, but in this particular case, because we're not filling the, the homeless resource manager, it's actually a net reduction in cost and it actually saves funds. But it does not add another position that we have the authority, we don't have the authority because it's not funded, to go out and hire an additional person and put them in this position. It only allows us to uh, assign this position to an existing position, so just to clarify that and it would result in savings to the general fund. So this does not add, it already as a result, we already have achieved savings in the general fund by not filling the, the homeless uh, resource manager position. So it's, it's not a, an addition to the budget at this point. So I have a follow-up question on that. So why am I seeing a job description that does not indicate that? I see a job description for a deputy uh, city manager, which is, yeah, the uh, okay, let me clarify that. So it adds, there's a difference between having positions that we have in our job, in our job classifications that are available between that and also between funding them. So we, there, there are any number of positions that we have in our, in our, sal, in our I'm sorry, in our compensation, not compensation, in our positions uh, summary and in our positions listing, many of which, or some of which are not funded. So in order to be able to have a position and to fill it, you have to have both. Uh, and in this particular case, we only will have a job description. We won't have the funding for it. We're not asking for that. It's not available. So therefore, you can't fill it. Uh, you, you can't you know, have another body be, that be placed. And the way this is structured too, it, only, it can only be assigned if there's a vacancy in an existing department head. So the way this is being structured does not allow for for that to occur, and that is that is the intent and the way it's structured to work. And I don't know if uh, if Lisa, you want to add more to that. Uh, in in that uh, the the HR department uh, structured it in such a way to again simply make it such that we could uh, assign additional roles and responsibilities and acknowledge that's the intent behind it. That, that's correct. And so I didn't hear the first part of the uh, what you're asking me to clarify. I apologize. I think Councilmember Brown was, was wondering whether this would allow us to uh, just go ahead and hire a deputy city manager, irrespective of whether the uh, the other positions were filled. Uh, and okay, so what I want to clarify, we have always had a deputy city manager position description in the um, in our complement. If you remember, it was filled by uh, Scott Collins. And when he left, then we chose not to fill it. So it's been there, and now, of course, we're revising it. But I believe by this action, we're, one, updating the job description, increase it, creating it, um, bifurcating it as a one or a two. And my understanding by this, this action, you are not exactly, you're not adding the actual position, whereas um, it's easier to use names, Lee, as a department head who's already getting a, um, a specialty pay, that's why it's net neutral, is going to then, uh, we'll assume that title in the, and we'll freeze that position. And he's gonna fill it at the, at the two level because he's, a, he's gonna be a director and as a, uh, and the homeless, the other responsibilities that he's has. I understand what's the intention for what's happening right now. Okay. I'm not, so, but if, if that's all you want to do, why are we not just revising the planning director position, for example, um, and you know, adding that, uh, that additional pay in the scale? It makes sense to me, particularly when I think about the fact that we have uh, you know, uh, you know, land use is really the city's responsibility. And we hear all the time that homelessness response is not our responsibility. I argue that it is, so I'm not trying to backtrack on that. But what I'm saying is if we, if we just get really clear about what the city's responsibility is, it's for land use decision making. And that uh, rightfully, I believe, belongs in planning. 
And so I, again, am trying to understand how we're, I mean, I, I just, I understand that it's not gonna happen right now, that there isn't funding, we have a hiring freeze. A hiring freeze is gonna go away eventually. Funding will be available and we will have competing uh, requests for where that funding goes. The fact that there's a position there means that we have the potential and we are making that decision right now to um, create that potential. And I'm not comfortable doing that. I'm really okay with the achieving the goal of get, getting Lee additional pay for doing the additional work. That's not my issue. It's the way it's being presented to us and what that means over time. I, I'll answer well, two parts. I understand uh, you are right. It does create a potential, just like we have any other you know, positions that might, um, we are not, they're not funded in the budget and you're correct. So once, let's say three years from now, um, that could come as a solo position. And that's why you are absolutely correct in that matter. Uh, when it came to how we were going to address with Lee, and that, I hate to use it as an individual, a department head position was because uh, it, that the flexibility, rather than uh, adding to the department director, the planning director specifically position to add these duties onto there, the flexibility was remains in that any director then really could uh, take on that role as opposed to uh, you know, maybe at, the, at the other, some other point in time, it may not be the, um, the, the focus of the, to do the homeless response. Let's just say that, for example. So maybe it might be something else, and maybe another director, let's say the IT director, has those uh, capability skills, the skill set in which to be able to operate in that matter. So then rather than coming to you and say, okay, let's amend that position uh, description, Let's just have one that's a generic one that we can utilize and be flexible with. So that's the, that was the inception to not make the adjustment to the, um, the specific director. But I do want to reiterate, you are correct in your assessment of by creating a, a, a job description, uh, it allows for that opportunity to come back and fill it separately. But again, that would come before the council to make that determination if they were going to fund it. And that would have to be funded again being clear that there are job descriptions that exist, but they have to be funded in order to be filled. Um, I guess the other example of this is, uh, uh, for example, in other communities, what they've done, again, it's a generic position in order to, for example, you've had a case where you've had a director uh, in, a, in a difficult budget situation retire. Um, and so in order to achieve budget savings, what they do is they assign another director to take on the role of directing both departments. Um, and then they give them the deputy city manager assignment because it's against a generic classification to deal with whatever circumstance might arise. Uh, this happened, for example, to some extent over at the county when they made budget reductions and uh, eliminated the parks department. They had their public works director take on that role. And so they, they had a public works uh, assistant CAO classification. So it's, it's just sort of a common way to provide flexibility to be able to Again, merge uh, uh, operations as as as, as circumstances uh, merit that. Uh, it's just a tool to be able to do that. That's flexible, and that really is the intent behind it. It's generic. It's not necessarily an attempt to create a new position that all of a sudden is there and they can be filled. Like I said, this position, uh, deputy city manager position, has existed in, in in terms of being on the books, but it hasn't been funded. So it hasn't been filled, obviously, because that funding hasn't been in the budget and it hasn't been proposed. In fact. We propose to, I, I propose to uh, reduce it uh, uh, when that vacancy occurred, also for budgetary reasons. So um, anyway, I hope that answers the, your question. Uh, um, well, it's, it, you know, uh, with all due respect, it, it kind of, I mean, it answers, I mean, I think Lisa answered the question that in, in fact, what we are doing does open up that potential. And so I just want to do, a, I have another question now, and I'm, I'm hoping that I can just, um, again, this is really to make the point about um, adding executive level positions or the potential for that kind of hiring. My understanding is with a with the hiring freeze for the planning department director or any department head, um, that's not a decision that the council necessarily needs to be a part of, that you have the authority to unfreeze positions. So we are opening a door to, you know, possibly getting into this this kind of situation and i'm again it's not about the intent it's about the structure 
which is what we're being told we need to be cognizant of. And so I, I'm just, that's just a statement. Uh, and the, my question then is, um, what, what are the, what's the plan for um, the positions in the city manager's office? By my count, I see a city manager, assistant city manager, deputy city manager, assistant to the city manager, a communications manager, and a senior program. I can't remember Ralph's uh, classification. I'm sorry, Ralph. Um, and a homelessness response manager, some of which are filled, most of which are filled, um, some of which uh, are, and, and all of which I think to some extent uh, get funding from other sources than the general fund. So what's, so what's happening here is the, is the plan to maintain all of these positions with the potential to hire for them? Because that's an awful lot of executive level and senior level positions for non-essential personnel. We are in a situation with furloughs. We are in a situation where we are asking every department to, um, you know, do the, make these structural uh, cuts. And I'm just seeing, uh, you know, you know, I'm seeing, uh, you know, us being asked to make a decision that really could have um, significant ramifications. So, of, of the positions you listed, um, all are filled except for the homeless resource manager, which is filled which is, I'm sorry, which is not filled and funded, um, but that's frozen. The deputy city manager position is not funded. And again, to be clear about that, it exists on the books as a classification, but it is not funded. So I do not have the authority to fill it in any way. It has to be included in the budget and haven't had that authority. So for all practical purposes, it doesn't really exist other than as a job description, uh, which is, again is what we're trying to create here at flexibility, but in any case, uh, that is that is really the, the status of those positions. So uh, just, so, sorry, I, I gotta just ask one more question then, um, because, so with a lateral transfer of a department head now, that leaves a department head position open. So it, I, I'm just, how does that work? If, if you know, a de deputy city manager yeah. is then in that position, and um, and then you list the freeze on the planning department, the planning department head. Then we are funding it. No, we'll this action, no, no. This action does not authorize me to hire the additional. We can only have the funded position. This is not fund. Again, I'm just trying to distinguish between that. This does not fund an additional position. So it's either one or the other. It could be we can assign it to an existing department head. Uh, and have that classification and not have the other. We can't do both. I don't have, this is not allowed for, provide the authority to all of a sudden have another executive level position. I just want to be clear about it. It doesn't do that. All it allows us to do is to have a department head be assigned an additional function or duty and be given that classification in order to uh, address that circumstance. That's it. It doesn't create, and typically what that does is result in savings because typically it means that uh, 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 well, it depends on the circumstances. And in this particular case, it's also the fact that it, by doing this, we're uh, freezing the deputy uh, city manager, I'm sorry, the homeless resource manager position, so it does result in savings. But typically, again, it's, it's just a net increase uh, in the, the pay between the deputy city manager and department head, which is not significant um, in order to be able to provide that additional assignment. So that's all it does. Okay, so and then another question is your intention to oh, Member Brown? Can, can I'm sorry, but I've got four other council members yeah. that are hoping that yeah. I, I understand your but it's maybe one or two more questions and then we'll try to have other folks. I'm just not really, you know, I'm not, it's thank you, and I'm sorry that I'm belaboring this, but it's really important to me. I mean, we, this is about fiscal responsibility and a fiscal crisis, and um, you know, I just feel like we need to. Understand, fully understand what we're being asked to do. So um, I guess I'll just leave it there for now. The, my, my other question is really about the um, expansion of the city manager classifications. And the one that I actually will, before I uh, stop, is ask, um, is your intention to eliminate any position currently in the city manager's office personnel complement, whether funded or not funded? Well, as we reported to, we have a budget deficit and we've assigned a, a reduction goal to everyone. The goal, however, is to not lay off anybody. Um, and so 
Um, we're not we're not we're not targeting positions. We're not targeting anyone to to make reductions. We have reductions that we have to make in our budget, just like every other department has to do, uh, and we'll be looking at what we can do. Um, I, 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 I didn't mean to suggest you're targeting anyone. I mean, there's a human, there's a homeless response manager position, and that's not filled. And we're we're saying we need, we're going to have somebody else do that job. So will that position remain on the books as well? For example, the the, the homeless resource manager. Mm -hmm. Yes, because the the intent is, again for now, because we're trying to achieve savings, and because we weren't able to hire in that position, it, it'll remain vacant. But I think long term, I think that's something that has to be analyzed. I mean, I think the hope is that uh, if we can get to a different model, we'll see how this model works. Maybe this is a good model and that's what we intend to do uh, and work, what works out. But um, it, it's on the books. We could certainly eliminate it if, if it turns out that this is a better model. Um, uh, but uh, at this point, it, it will be making for the foreseeable future. I mean, we do, as you noted, we do have a budget uh, a deficit here and we have to try to achieve savings. And again, this is. This is just our attempt to basically uh, operationalize and be able to respond to this, this, this major issue with the staff that we have now and in a way that's responsive as possible. Uh, and so that's what we're trying to achieve now. And if that circumstance changes in the future, we can look at other ways of doing that. But there's no plans at this point to, to fill the, the, the uh, homeless resource manager position. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Um, I, I don't want to cut any other council members short, but we are running pretty late on this item. So just, um, okay, I have uh, Council Member Watkins next, and then Council Member Kalantari Johnson, and then Council Member Cummings. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And I think um, Council Member Brown got at some of my questions in specific to this position. Um, just a couple clarifying questions to that, to, to kind of get a better sense of it. Is one, how long do you anticipate this individual needing to serve in this capacity of an expanded role? Right. Um, so we don't have a definitive uh, time frame. I think, I think certainly it would be for at least for the next fiscal year um, as, as uh, you know, Lee is taking on, in particular, has been taking on the additional role of having to speed up and learn uh, all the various, you know, homelessness uh, functions. So I think, you know, it does take some time to, to do that and then to really take on the leadership role. He's been doing that very quickly. He's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's very smart and, and a quick study in that regard. Um, don't have a definitive, you know, time frame. Um, I think it just depends on, on, on how it goes with respect to, um, uh, Again, being responsive to what needs to be done, and again, that is you know leading the city with respect to uh, coordination and communication with the county. And, and so, Lee, for example, is, is is the counterpart to Robert Ratner, who's the new homelessness coordinator at the county. So now we have someone that can you know directly uh, and on a regular basis coordinate and work with Robert, a uh, uh, person who's in charge of focusing and working with the two by two committee and staffing that and being responsive to the work of the two by two committee as well as coordinating all of our internal efforts uh, with respect to responding to homelessness issues, um, as well as all the advocacy and legislation and all that. So I think that's gonna take you know, a, little, a little bit of time for, for him to sort of uh, take on that role and to, and to make some progress in that role, um, and he's willing to do it. So um, I think as long as it works, it, it, it would be a good model to have. And if I if I follow then your logic with this, then the assumption would be that at a certain point, then Lee would go back to, um, or the person who takes on this special assignment will eventually go back to the original director job, or and or assume a different kind of more elevated position. Uh, I mean, if you're no, investing at somebody's time. Yeah, no, it, 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 it could be that that the you know if it's a good model, is that it stays that it makes sense to have you know homelessness and and the planning director combination, if that works, you know, for the foreseeable future, it could, just, it could keep that way. Um, and if, or, or, or if it doesn't work, then we could go back and, and try to hire the homeless resource manager um, and, and try a different model. Um, but it would not uh, result in, 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 in creating a new position or adding a new position. And then I think, I mean, and I'll try to keep my question brief, but um, I think to Councillor Brown's um, questioning, I think it's confusing to a certain extent, and it does send a bit of a mixed message considering where 
we are financially and um, we're asking our staff, you know, the hits that we're asking our staff to take. And then, um, so, although I think I follow the rationale in terms of wanting to increase somebody's um, compensation for additional work, I think the process is confusing, right? And so you mentioned that there's something that's already on the books. So I guess my question then is, what's on the books and why can't that work, one? And two, is there another way to compensate somebody for additional work without changing their title, essentially? The, okay, I think Lisa can answer that question. There is, so currently on the books is a deputy city manager position, which I believe was approved probably around 2016. Um, and it was just a, a it was li more limited in its job description and less salary than, and it was I, um, in the past. And then, then when Scott Collins left, we froze it and didn't fill it. And so then, through the years now, looking at how the job description would take, sorry, I don't have in front of me. Now the duties have been uh, expanded, and to include the ability for uh, a department director to fill that position at the at the two level, or not have a director and just have a uh, straight deputy city manager fill it at the one level. So, and again, the duties were expanded. So then, it, so it gives a flexibility. We do that often with with a one two. Um, so that's where the the genesis it was there, um, and then being revised. And you are correct. There is another methodology, and that's what is in place right now. In that, for the additional duties that the current planning director is doing in this work area is an additional special compensation pay that we do for any employee who, who uh, we find is, is doing taking on a special project is kind of what we call it. So because he's taking on a special project, yes, he's getting an additional compensation in recognition of that. Does that answer your question? Yeah, no, it does. I appreciate that because, of course, we want to see this individual compensated for the additional you know, position and work that accompanies that. I think that the confusion lies within the, job, the sort of the classification title and um, sort of the mixed messages that sends to, um, that we're, we're grappling with one, but I think sends to also the rest of the city and the community. But, uh, you know, absent making that change, it's good to know that that individual is still being compensated, essentially without the title, right? And if I could take kind of a little stab at it, is that um, the intention being that if a director was going to fill that role, which I think for the long, right now, at least in the, the short term being three to five years is what I'm just gonna guess. But a director is gonna assume that additional role. And, that's, and if that's the case, as it is in this one, that director's position will be frozen. And that's where uh, the city manager is saying it's, it is um, basically sort of a net neutral because that individual is already receiving a special compensation. So, so it's not necessary that the individual get additional um, pay, but that director position then is is um, being done. It's not, but it's frozen in that department in terms of the funding. So that that's the net neutrality, if that makes sense. The, the other thing I would I would add is that you know, typically we do have a special projects pay. It's, it's called, um, but that typically is relatively short term, and it's people that are assigned to a project. Here we're looking at changing the role. Uh, and so I think that was really the, the intent, and I apologize for the confusion, but really here the intent was to really provide a new role for an individual in assignment that, we, that was significant, that was gonna really uh, give, you know, it's not just a project, it's really a, an entire new function that's being assigned. So there's a distinction between a project and really an entire function that includes overseeing additional staff and taking on pretty significant uh, new, new responsibility. So that's, that's the distinction as opposed to project. You know, in, in this particular case, when it's used in other jurisdictions, they, can't, they take on an entire new department or an entire new function. So that's that really from a HR, the way municipalities do this, it's, that's just, it's just a common approach. So we just thought we would recommend what is you know, typically used out there in the community. And, and not to confuse it even just a little bit more, but because of our personnel, our um, compensation plan, the rules that we have and our budgeting rules, it makes it even that much more confusing when we tell the council 
you have to literally, you've got to add this title like we're doing today. You need to add this title to the to our um, classification plan in the budget for uh, to follow the rules. However, there's no dollars necessary. There's only seven thousand, I think, is associated with that because really the funding's still sitting there in the planning director's position. It's it's really a um, it, it's a it's a paper rule that we have to follow to have the title added, even though there's no additional. Uh, it's it's just a, the seven thousand dollars funding. I'm hoping that helps with your discussion. Yeah, no, I, I mean, it does, I think, I understand the classification process and I understand the logic behind it. I just think for um, some of the kind of reasons and concerns that have been brought up by my colleagues that um, there's a little bit of confusion there. And I think that as we think about sort of these changes, how um, I, I recognize it in this context, but I also think it also falls within the context of our um, interim recovery planning and strategies and so on. So I think that broader context will help kind of inform the best approach too. So after that uh, provided, it feels a little like, well, oh, we're just changing this one position. Do you know what I mean? That's I think where the confusion lies for me. Okay, um, I'm gonna have Council Member Contrary Johnson and I have Council Member Cummings and then uh, Vice Mayor Bruner. This item was scheduled for an hour. We're only, we've already gone through the whole hour and we're still not gone out to public and we haven't deliberated. So I just wanna, Again, just um, to remind everybody, we do have the um, we do have item number 20 scheduled at three. So I do know that there's a number of people obviously are going to be attending that this afternoon. Uh, Council Member Collinsari Johnson. Thank you, um, and thank you, Kim and Lupita, for the presentation. Um, a lot of my questions have been asked and discussed, so I won't repeat those. Um, I wanted to go back to the the um, budget projections and assumptions. Um, part of your presentation, um, specifically the part, um, the scenario, I can't remember which scenario, where we looked at the, um, um, the yes, it was one of the last ones. Yeah, the revenue, the new, yeah, the realistic scenario with the federal state aid scenario, and then zeroing in on a federal and state aid piece. Um, I'm just wondering if you can share, I know it's hard to um, actually know how much we would get, but I wanted to, um, ask if you could share how, where that number of three million came from. Um, are our lobbyists giving any projections? And um, uh, it, it does seem low to me. Again, of course, we don't know how much we'll get. And then maybe, um, maybe it's not appropriate right now, especially since we're running out of time. But if we can, at some future um, meeting, talk about how we as a community are getting grant ready as a city. Um. So as a position of finance director, I don't like to say I made something up, but the $3 million, I really just picked the number and put it in there. The, we don't have any idea of what the estimate yeah. would be. Yeah. Okay, yeah, fair enough. Um, so yeah, I wonder if for um, future projections, we can see if our lobbyists have any thoughts or ideas on that. Um, of course we can't, we, we can't have a definitive number. Um, so we can, we can have a follow-up conversation about that. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, next, I have Council Member Cummings, please. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you for the presentation from the staff. Um, similar to Council Member Tolentari Johnson, a lot of my questions have been asked and answered, and I appreciate the dialogue that we've had because um, it's helping me to kind of better understand um, the proposal for the position in the city manager's office. And I just wanna um, ask a few clarifying questions. So um, I'll start by just acknowledging that I understand, um, you know, when, when an employee is taking on more responsibilities, um, oftentimes there is a desire to take up, to have um, a change in your title, right? So if you're program director and you're taking on more responsibilities and you're, it's like, hey, this seems like I'm gonna be doing executive director type of work and asking for that title because it's more reflective of the fact that you're taking on more responsibilities can actually help professionally for an individual in the long run. So I can, so the way I'm understanding this is that 
given the fact that the planning director is going to be taking on these additional responsibilities, the proposal here is that um, this designation be given to the current planning director, and the only increase in the budget is this 7500 for this year and 15000 every subsequent year to compensate that individual for the additional roles that they're going to be serving. So is that a, a correct statement yes. of understanding? Of it? Yes, yes, that, that's right. And uh, although it will be offset by the, the savings that we have uh, uh, with respect to the um, homeless resource manager position, which is, you know, which is a position right. assigned to this function. So it'll be more than made up by, by those savings. So the, the, the proposal is really net uh, positive to the general fund. But yes, that's essentially it. Sure. Yeah, and, I, and, that's, and that's where I can see the savings, because instead of hiring someone to do that job full time, you're just increasing an, another individual's pay by 7500 this year, 15000 every subsequent year for being in that role. I think the question then becomes, so if the, if the planning director's position is frozen um, and we're not going to allocate funds towards that position, in order to hire someone in the future in that role, my understanding from this was is that it would need to come back to council, and I guess this is a question, would it then need to come back to council for approval of the funds if we were to hire and have someone in this role and then someone in the planning director role? Yes. Okay. That, that helps because I think what, what I'm hearing from the public and the concerns that I'm hearing is that if we create this designation, at any point in time, the city manager could unfreeze a position and hire someone in one of these executive roles, thereby having an addition, an increase in the number of these executive positions. No, that's not possible without council authorization. Okay. That's, I think, what I wanted to get clarified because I think that's some of the con confusion that's been going on, and so that helps me to better understand that if we create this new position and we allocate these additional resources with the planning director position being frozen, in order for that position, an additional position, and someone to have that role, for that to be filled, it has to come back to council for approval. Correct. Correct. Thank you. Okay. And I have uh, uh, Vice Mayor Bruner. Thank you. Uh, so thank you so much, Lupita and Kim. I think um, my original question is now a little bit clearer. I'm glad I wasn't the only one <laughs> with those questions and uh, concerns. I think it would be helpful on that slide and in the information when it says add and then it says um, in green add and then that uh, city manager position. Um, some, it's not adding a position with funding, but adding, it's simply add a title, add, some kind of language um, would be helpful. Um, and I, I only say this in going forward, if this were to come up again, um, because we're being asked to approve these adjustments, and I don't think any of us would feel fiscally comfortable approving a new city manager executive level position. Um, and so identifying really clearly in language what that is exactly doing and the cost associated. Thank you. Thank you for the feedback. I think in the past uh, that particular, um, as Lisa Murphy said, it's it's like a classification or compensation plan that's presented to you. And it's been presented separately and we tried combining it. And I think that's increased the confusion and made it more difficult for you. So lesson learned for us. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would add a similar comment to Vice Mayor Bruner's. I think that Normally, this kind of thing would have been broken apart, I would assume, it is what you just stated, um, Kim, in terms of really understanding what it is structurally we, we're doing with our staffing versus sort of adding something that, you know, reads in the staff report as sort of a, a, new, a new obligation that may never go away, um, depending on how things are managed into the future. 
I think that's where a lot of the confusion and where my, some of my confusion came, came in as well. Um, my only other comment, I guess, is um, I think that there's been, um, I think that this duty in city government of managing homelessness is really a brand new duty that most cities in California do not have a good handle on. And um, when you look to see where these positions are put into city government, it varies all over the place. I mean, some are in the housing division, some are in city managers, some are in police and fire, some are in. <laughs> so it's a, I think it's a new animal. It's not a service that a city is necessarily built to try to accommodate. And um, truthfully, really probably doesn't really have a very good job description for, I would imagine. Um, and it is one of those duties that um, I think it's just difficult to understand departmentally where it fits and by nature it sort of has to be multi-objective, which in a small city like Santa Cruz that tends to land in the city manager's office. Um, and so I do think there's confusion, but I think for the public to know that, um, that this issue of homelessness costs the city of Santa Cruz a tremendous amount of money and the money comes from the general fund. <laughs> Um, we've spent close to two and a half million dollars just this year trying to deal with homelessness. And so having the ability to have a dedicated um, focus through a staff person um, that is at pretty high level, I do believe brings benefit, but I do um, agree a lot of the rollout was very confusing and, and seemed to obligate the council to make a decision to actually add a position that, you know, was not really clearly articulated in terms of, of, the, of, of the, the, the actual expense off, offsets, and et cetera. So um, thank you for everyone to try, for trying to clarify a very complicated um, subject for us this afternoon. I do wanna open this up to the public and um, then we'll come back to the council and we'll uh, take, uh, take, look for deliberation and action. So I'm gonna just see what we've got here. I've got uh, uh, public member with the last name Morgan, Prickett Morgan. You'll be unmuted in a sh shortly. Go ahead, please. Eleanor Prickett Morgan, you are welcome to speak. You should, you should be unmuted. There you go, you're ready to go. Bonnie, are you, looks like it's muting and unmuting. Is she unmuted? She was, she's unmuted now. Okay, you're ready to go now. It's speaking to your phone, you're ready to go now. Okay, she's gone. Uh, the next caller, uh, next speaker is, has phone number ending in 5276, please. Please press and you're ready. Thank you. Hi, Council, um, Mayor and Council, this is Robert Acosta. I'm a city resident and a city employee and I try to separate those, but as you know, that really doesn't exist when you live in the same city. Um, I appreciate all the answers that I was concerned about because um, you guys have really clarified a lot of stuff. And it's, it was this, I was a little nervous to call in because of the people that I work with who I really like and enjoy. But um, my concern about this is just the extra funding at a time when we're told that there are going to be structural cuts um, in every city I've lived in, you know, youth and teen health and well-being has been important to me. So if I'm going to talk just about my program, you know, our teens during this pandemic are going through a lot of hard times. And in the next few days, we're going to be told to make structural cuts. And I know it's being said that it's only $15,000, but I think if you ask any supervisor in the city, if you had only $15,000 more, could you do something good with it? 
and everyone would say yes. Um, so that's that's my concern. My concern is also that it is not a structural cut with this homeless resource manager position when we have been told that structural cuts are coming um, for our department. And so as a resident and as an employee, it just, it just doesn't feel right. Um, and it just feels like in this time, city count city manager's office can have both they can they cannot do a structural cut and they can spend more money which just does not feel um right to me and you know council member brown listing all the positions in the city manager's office made me decide not to hang up after all and to stay on the call so I just I thank you guys. I know it's a hard job, both employees and council members, and you are all appreciated. Um, the last comment is my time is up, so I guess you'll never hear the last comment. Thank you so much. Bye. Any other members of the public who wish to speak on this item? Okay. Okay, uh, I'll bring it back to council. And I will look for additional comments or questions or uh, needs of clarification from the council and uh, look to um, entertaining a motion at some point. Uh, council member Watkins. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and um, you know, thank you, Robert, for, for feeling comfortable to call into us. I um, I guess I think you know holistically and sort of on the on a on a meta level, and I appreciate your comments, Mayor, in regards to sort of this is a new thing, right? Um, but maybe you know I would my comfort would probably feel um, at more at ease if this was discussed separate than sort of the context of what we're being presented in terms of the budget, and 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 thoughtfully in terms of really. Um, but not, I mean, not to uh, underestimate our potential of being able to get things done in this area of, of the homeless needs of the city, um, that this is gonna be a long-term issue that we're gonna need to have uh, ongoing investment in. And um, and I, so I sort of just wanna, I preface my, my comments in that way because I feel like that um, I, I realize the, and I'm supportive of the actions that are brought forth. I, I appreciate the projections that our finance team has um, you know, shared with us and some of the modifications. And outside of that with this position, it just sort of feels a little bit muddy to me. Um, and I think it also, it, it deserves a, a broader conversation as well. So um, so I, I think I'll leave my comments at that. I, I don't know exactly what that um, could look like in terms of emotion. And and I also know that, that um, although the, the the title could not be changed at this individual, it sounds to me, and, I'm, and I welcome any corrections, that they're still being compensated in a, in, in a way to um, get um, the additional funding associated with the additional duties absent this, thing, this change, really, in terms of the HR components of it. And so, um, anyways, I'll, I'll leave my comments at that and then, um, you know, welcome any input from my colleagues. Thank you. Count, uh, Vice Mayor Bruner. Council Member Watkins brought up uh, my question in kind of the direction of um, what does it look like in terms of um, this item not being part of these adjustments and, and kind of um, understanding, um, you know, what is currently uh, the 15,000 compensation is that you know, equal to what is currently being compensated for the extra work, um, the extra role. Um, and how, it just seems that um, this could warrant more of a understanding and discussion. Thank you, Vice Mayor Bruner. Um, uh, Council Member Brown, please. Uh, thank you. So, yeah, I'm um, 
I'm gonna. I, there's much more I could say, but I'm not really going to go into much more, uh, you know, detail in terms of my qu line of questioning. I think um, that um, I've made my position clear, and I want to be clear that this is not. It is confusing, absolutely, but I don't believe that I misunderstand uh, the, what's going to potentially happen if we make this kind of decision right now. And I agree with uh, Council Member Watkins and Vice Mayor Bruner that this is a conversation that we ought to be having more holistically as we think about our recovery plan. And um, and so I'm, I'm going to go ahead and try to make a motion that gets us to um, Kind of a way to address the situation without um, making that decision uh, about you know the overall kind of personnel uh, executive level personnel uh, in, in which department uh, it, it, it belongs so I would uh, go ahead and it's, I, I'd move the staff recommendation which is um, uh, what the finance department's recommendation to adopt a resolution amending the fiscal year 2021 budget uh, appropriations to all funds as listed in exhibit a in the and then you, you have the the language everybody should have the language in front of them um, if you don't um, I can read the all of it but I think it's it's there it's pretty clear uh, and two um, thank you thank you Bonnie <laughs> appreciate that um, uh, adopt a resolution amending the city of Santa Cruz personal complement and classification and compensation plans for the following departments, public works and water. Three, uh, defer discussion regarding uh, the changes to the city manager's uh, personnel classifications or cl complement and classification plan uh, to uh, later dates in the context of recovery planning. And then I would turn three, number three here into number four, authorize the city manager to allocate budgetary changes within the applicable funds and departments. So I believe that would change in number one, the, the number, the exact figures, um, but I, I, I have no um, ability to do that kind of math on the spot, but um, th th that would be the only other change. Um, whatever it takes to get the figures to be accurate with that change of the um, decision about the city manager's uh, positions. Let me just see if I've caught this so that before I get them, before I uh, look for a second. Uh, I'm sorry, Bonnie, can you put that back up? Um, so the motion, um, there we go. Is that look right, Council Member Brown? Yep. And I'm looking for a second to this. Or Council Member who? I'll go ahead and second. Seconded by Council Member Cummings. And I have uh, Council Member Watkins and then Council Member Cummings. Um, I appreciate the motion. And I just have a clarifying question for our city manager in terms of the financial changes. Does that, um, does, does that change what this individual is already receiving in terms of additional work compensation, additional compensation for the work that they're being asked to do on behalf of the city in this regard? You're muted, Matt Martin. Sorry about that. Um, currently, uh, the special project space being assigned, it doesn't change that. Um, oh, it's not at the same level as the as the change. I have one, sorry, I have just one follow-up question in regards to that. I know that we allocated some HUD dollars as well as some other um, kind of dedicated funding towards homeless resources, is that uh, accessible to this position potentially as well? I don't, I don't believe so. I don't, I don't think that, that can be applied to um, the salaries. Um, okay. And Council Member Cummings and then Council Member Brown. 
I'll defer my time to Council Member Brown because I think my question was just answered. Um, I had the same question as Council Member Watkins, which was whether or not this person's compensation would be affected for their new the new work that they're doing. So it sounds like that they their compensation has already been increased to cover those new assignments. I just I want to clarify I just want to make sure I'm clear about that my intention was not to cause uh, the the current uh, planning director to um, not be able to achieve that that salary increase as a result of the work so did, did I hear that correctly um, Martine that it's not at the same level um, because if so I'd like to add something to the motion to either change the special compensation pay scale or something like that i, I believe so um i'll have to um i, I think can ask lisa or laura if they can because uh, i think the the um the uh the difference is the, in 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 the special pay is five percent is, is i believe and the compensation in in the deputy city manager tier is just wider so it has more tiers to it so i think there's there's a greater range i don't know the exact number um, so I know Lisa or Laura, you can correct me if, if, if I'm wrong on that, but what it does is that our department has uh, pay scales, we have tiers, what are called tiers. Um, and so for example, certain department heads are at one tier and another department head, department heads of larger departments are at a higher tier. What this was gonna do is put the deputy city manager at the second tier, so it kind of makes it equitable and equal to the other department heads up. The other reason why this is sort of was the structure so that, you know, a department head that has a, 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 a wide range of responsibilities, this would make them equal to that. So that was the other rationale for changing the classification and the, and the, and the compensation scale, the way it works, as opposed to just a 5% a, a bump. Uh, I believe it's about a, uh, an additional two to three percent. I apologize. I do not have the. I didn't conduct the analysis of what you currently. That position uh, currently sits at uh, versus moving to different tier, but obviously it's equivalent to an additional. Uh, I believe it's seventy five hundred. I think is the a year. Which is the same amount as what the change would would mean. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So, okay. Are there any other um, questions? Otherwise, I'd uh, look to finalize the vote. Um, Mayor, I, did, I wanted to point out really quick that Eleanor, who was a member of the public who had called in earlier, is back with her hand raised. I don't know if you want to try her again. Uh, sure, I'd be fine. If the council's uh, uh, okay with that, I think I'd, yeah, please. Eleanor, uh, if you can, please, you should be able to talk now. You're unmuted. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so sorry about that. I, I was getting, as you unmuted me last time, a notification from my computer that um, my microphone is not working. <laughs> I obviously couldn't communicate that. I just wanted to ask um, something clarifying, which is um, it was said at some point that like, um, in terms of you know the, the proposed changes that there are like structural, financial issues that are causing like this projected deficit um, and, you know, talking about um, looking for like new revenue sources for the city of Santa Cruz. Is is this like deficit a result of like loss from COVID and, and from shelter in place order? Is it something else um, that I'm not understanding? We typically don't do question and answer during um, public comment, but but I will just as mayor say yes, the, the majority of, well, all of what we are projecting in terms of these deficits are related to loss uh, regarding the COVID-19 situation. Um, and in two particular areas, our transit occupancy tax and then also um, our admissions tax have both been hit very hard because obviously people are not traveling here to Santa Cruz. I hope that helps. Yeah, thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> no worries at all. Thanks very much for calling in. Okay, uh, we have a motion on the floor with a second, and I will go ahead and call for a roll call vote. Uh, is everyone clear? Does anybody need to see the language? I think we all saw it. And, okay, uh, Bonnie, can you do a roll call vote? 
Yeah, can I just clarify maybe with Lupita um, or Kim that the change of number three of re or removing the city manager position is going to affect the dollar amount in number yeah. one. Okay, oh, and I'll reach out to you then to get those. Yeah. Okay. That, that's what I heard anyway from Council Member Brown. So that's my understanding of what you're voting on is reducing the dollar amount. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'm trying to clarify this. The, the point, my goal was not reduce the dollar amount for the current, the, cur the, the department head who is currently uh, doing this job. So no, if- Sorry, Sam, no, what I meant was, uh, yeah, let me what I meant was the change yeah. of this. Right. The resolution. Uh, right. It's gonna affect this dollar amount, or one of them. Yeah. Let me clarify, uh, Council Member Brown. It, it wouldn't. It, it, this is not going to affect the the pay that he's getting. It, it, it doesn't. It does affect the number here. This is just a budgetary uh, number um, that was needed in order to create the the function as structured. But right. the ability to do the special pay that is something that is not part of this, and we can continue to do that. So I think you were getting that. It's not going to affect that. that. Could we get a roll call vote, please? Councilmember Watkins? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Boulder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. And that's uh, motion passes unanimously. We will then, uh, we will now move on to item number 20, which is a public hearing today for 418 Pennsylvania Avenue. And for members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. This item will be conducted as follows. There will be a staff presentation, then the appellate, Travis, Kinsey will have 15 minutes to speak and present evidence in support of the appeal. The applicant, Dan Stark, from Workbench will have 15 minutes to speak and present evidence. There will then be questions from the council. We will then take public comment, and then the appellant will have five minutes to rebut anything stated from the applicant and or the public. They may not use this time to bring up new points. We will then return to council for deliberation and action. After the staff presentation and the presentations from the appellants and the opponents and the questions from council is when I will open the, um, the item up for public comment and I'll give you further instructions then. So uh, the item before us now is item number 20, uh, 418 Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, this is uh, an appeal of the Planning Commission's approval of a residential demolition authorization permit and design permit to demolish an existing second dwelling unit and construct three apartments on a site with an existing single family residence on a parcel located in the RL multiple residence low density zone district. And I'll turn it over to Brianna Sherman for the staff's presentation. Thank you, Mayor. I am going to share my screen. Can everybody see it on my screen? We can see it, yes, thank you. Okay, great. Um, so Brianna Sherman, Associate Planner, and today we are here to consider an appeal of the Planning Commission's approval of a project at 418 Pennsylvania Avenue. The applicant submitted this application in September of 2019 for a design permit and residential demolition authorization permit to demolish an existing second dwelling unit and to construct three rental apartments on a site with an existing single family residence. Um, staff approved this project in October Brianna, of 2019. Brianna, yes. sorry to interrupt. I'm not sure if your slides are supposed to be advancing, but you're still on your first page. I'm going to stay on this first page just for a moment to provide some background and then I'll jump okay. into the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. <laughs> um, 
Um, so the applicant submitted an, um, or I'll jump back, staff approved the project in October of 2020. Um, it fully conformed to all the applicable objective development standards and the zoning ordinance in the general plan. And an appeal of staff's decision was filed by the neighbor adjacent to the north at 426 Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, that appeal cited concerns with area compatibility, building mass and design, and impacts on the privacy and solar access of her property. So to provide some brief background, the Planning Commission considers a project and appeal at a public hearing on December 3rd, 2020. And the Planning Commission's discussion focused primarily on site configuration and design height, um, density as it pertains to Senate Bill 330, area compatibility and neighborhood impacts. Um, the Planning Commission voted four to three to approve the project with two added conditions of approval. Um, the first one was to reduce the floor to floor height to nine feet on all levels and to relocate the second story balconies proposed on the north elevation to the south elevation. Um, those conditions were added to create additional privacy for the adjacent neighbor to the north and to reduce the overall massing um, while maintaining the density of the upper end of the allowable range. So on December 14th, 2020, an appeal of the Planning Commission's decision was filed by the appellant and two other members of the public. And this appeal cites concerns with um, reduced back out space in the driveway, building massing and area compatibility, and solar impact. Um, and then the Planning Department's interpretation of lower density as it's referenced in state law. Um, so I've received 35 letters of public comment prior to the Planning Commission hearing. Nine letters were in support of the project and 26 were in opposition of the project. And I received 21 letters of public comment on this appeal to the City Council. Um, two letters are in support of the project and 19 are in support of the appeal. So generally the letters in support of the project are supportive of infill development and increased rental housing. Um, and the letters in support of the appeal believe that the project design is incompatible with the surrounding area, will create increased traffic, and should provide affordable housing, um, and as well as be reduced in size. So the project site is located on an 8,729 square foot lot on the east side of Pennsylvania Avenue, which runs perpendicular between SoCal Avenue and Broadway. And the property has a low to medium density residential general plan land use designation. Um, this designation accommodates a variety of residential building types um, that fit within a single family neighborhood. So that includes low rise apartments, condos, and townhomes. Um, and the LM designation allows for development with a density of 10.1 to 20 dwelling units per acre. So because the subject property is 8,729 square feet or 0.2 acres. The general plan density range allows for two to four dwelling units and the development meets this density requirement. Um, there are also numerous general plan policies included in the Planning Commission staff report um, that this project meets. The higher end of the density range is supported by general plan goal LU1, which seeks residential land use intensities to ensure optimum utilization of infill parcels Policy LU 3.7 encourages higher intensity residential uses and maximum densities in accordance with the land use designation. And then policy 3.7.1 encourages development that meets the high end of the general plan designation density unless constraints associated with site characteristics and zoning development standards require a lower density. Um, so this project site's not located within an overlay district or a specific area plan that encourages a specific design or architectural style, and the parcel is also not located within the coastal zone. Um, the property is zoned RL, multiple residence, um, and the purpose of the district is to promote the development of multifamily townhomes, condos, and apartments and to stabilize and protect the residential characteristics of the district to encourage a suitable environment for families and single per persons, um, as mentioned in the zoning agreement. So this RL zone district allows multiple dwellings as a principally permitted use with approval of a design permit, and therefore public hearing and public noticing was not required prior to staff's approval of the project. Um, 
I will say staff did hear from many of the neighbors early on in the review process and we kept a list of those who wanted to be notified of the project status. Um, we maintained communication on the status and provided information on when the project was approved and how to appeal. Um, I'll also add that a community meeting was not required prior to staff approval of the project um, because under the community outreach policy, community meeting requirements are based on project size and this project results in a site with four dwellings, so it doesn't even qualify as a small development project, which adds five to 10 housing units. Um, the RL zone district density is based on a minimum lot area per dwelling unit square footage standard, and the minimum lot area for one bedroom or studio units is 1,600 square feet, um, and the minimum lot area for two or more bedroom units is 2,200 square feet. Um, so smaller units than what are proposed could actually result in a higher density on the parcel. Um, the planning department received a number of public comment letters, including one from the appellant's attorney, questioning whether the project meets the RL zone district density requirements. Um, this table was included in the staff report and demonstrates that the project meets the objective site development standards for the RL zone district and falls within the general plan density range. Um, I'll also note that Assembly Bill 3194 provisions say that when there is inconsistency between objective density standards allowed on the site under the zoning ordinance and those allowed under the general plan land use designation, the city is required to utilize the general plan's objective density standards. Um, so in other words, if the zoning ordinance standards for a project site are inconsistent with the general plan standards, a proposed housing development cannot be considered inconsistent with the zoning um, and they can't be required to, to seek a rezoning as long as the project complies with the objective general plan standards. Um, the only permissible basis for which the city can reject or reduce the size of a project that complies with objective development standards is when the city can make the finding that the project results in a significant adverse impact um, to the public health and safety. So as you'll see in the following slides, the three new apartments are consistent with objective development standards and it cannot be found that the project design resulted in a significant adverse impact to the public health and safety. I also want to quickly note that um, while the staff report detailed this provision, um, design permit finding number one has been modified in the resolution to include a statement that explains that pursuant to this section, the city is required to apply the objective standards and criteria of the zoning code to facilitate um, and accommodate the development of the density allowed by the general plan and um, proposed by the housing project. So the subject property is currently developed with a single family residence, a second dwelling unit, and a few accessory buildings. And it's surrounded by developed single and multifamily residential properties on all sides. I'll quickly note that the staff report and findings reference um, the second dwelling unit as an accessory dwelling unit. Um, and it was determined prior to the planning commission hearing that the structure was never formally approved as an accessory dwelling unit. So with that said, I'm just gonna refer to it as the second dwelling unit to be demolished moving forward. Um, the project proposes to retain the existing single family residence um, along Pennsylvania Avenue and to demolish the second dwelling unit and accessory building and to construct three attached three story, three bedroom rental apartments that are each about 2,365 square feet in size. Um, these new three apartments meet all the objective site development standards for the RL zone district and the project complies with off street parking requirements and guest parking is not required for a development this size. Um, I'll also note here that there are no inclusionary housing requirements for rental residential developments with two to four dwelling units. Um, I wanna briefly note that the planning department received a letter from the appellant's attorney stating that the project fails to comply with the 15 foot minimum front yard setback requirement for the RL zone district. Um, the existing structure that will remain is currently located um, eight feet, eight inches from the front property line. Um, so it's therefore considered to be legal non-conforming um, because it doesn't meet the current zoning ordinance setback requirements for RL zone properties. Um, but that said, the proposed apartments don't increase the existing non-conforming structure because 
They're detached and they're located behind the existing structure about 66 feet from the front property line. Um, so while the existing residence to remain is a non-conforming structure, the use is conforming um, and the new apartments are conforming use that meet all the applicable development standards. So because um, the use and proposed apartments are conforming, the expansion is permitted. I'm just going to briefly run through the project floor plans before jumping into the appeal concerns. Um, the first floor consists of a two-car garage for each unit. Um, the second floor plan will have a kitchen, living room, and balcony on the north elevation. Um, but I'll note that the Planning Commission added a condition of approval that requires the relocation of these second story balconies to the south elevation. And then the third floor consists of three bedrooms and a few bathrooms. Um, and a balcony on the south elevation. So I'll now jump into the appeal concerns. This appeal was filed against the Planning Commission's approval of the project, um, and it was based on four claims. Two of the claims were also called out in their first appeal letter. Um, the first concern brought up by the appellants was with respect to the approved backout space in the driveway. So at the time the application was submitted and reviewed, um, the 24-foot backout space requirement was only codified in a diagram for a commercial parking lot. Um, there was no standard for residential parking. However, the planning department has applied this commercial standard to residential lots um, and development in the past. Um, historically, we've worked with um, the Public Works Department and we've allowed for reductions in backout spaces an engineer can demonstrate with a turning diagram that adequate on-site circulation is provided for a standard size vehicle. Um, so while not in effect when this application was being complete, the standard practice was recently codified in um, the zoning ordinance and that kind of memorializes it as an acceptable option for the city to consider when reviewing projects in the future. Um, so this backup diagram that you see is was submitted by the applicant. Um, it demonstrates an adequate turning radi radius based on the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials standard. Um, the Planning Department and Public Works Department reviewed this diagram um, and determined that backing out a sport utility vehicle, um, which is larger than the standard size vehicle, is possible. Um, and the proposed dimension is 20 feet and 6 inches. The appellant's letter um, commented that it was 17 feet and 6 inches, um, but I do want to point out that it's actually 20 feet 6 inches. And the proposed driveway located off of Pennsylvania Avenue will also be providing adequate fire access um, and it meets that objective width requirement. Um, the second concern raised by the appellants pertains to building, massing, and area compatibility. Um, so the appellants assert that the project does not maintain the architectural character and scale of the neighborhood um, and claim that it will be highly visible from the street. Um, this concern was also called out in the first appeal against staff's approval of the project and was addressed at the Planning Commission hearing. Um, but I'll say that the three new apartments will be located behind the existing single-family home. Um, the existing landscaping and residents will provide a buffer between the public view and the new apartments. And the overall view of the site will remain relatively consistent with the existing character of the neighborhood. Um, the existing residents will not block the new development, as you can see here, um, from the public view, um, as the new apartments are 30 feet tall, um, but the RL zone district allows for 30 foot buildings and the site is also consistent with many of the other two story and three story um, single multifamily buildings in the surrounding area. Um, the site is configured so that the new apartments are 66 feet from the front property line and only the south elevation and the second and third story will be visible from the street view. Um, this type of design isn't unusual for an infill development project in the city. Um, so as I mentioned, the project site is located within a developed single and multifamily neighborhood. Um, the street includes a mix of one and two story homes. The area has a variety of architectural styles, including traditional, historic, um, simple mid-century residences and 
as I previously mentioned, um, there's not an overlying area plan in this neighborhood that establishes design guidelines or limit new development to a specific architectural style. Um, so these photos show existing homes in the surrounding area on Pennsylvania Avenue, Cayuga Street, and Windsor Street. And as you can see, many of them have a similar boxy design, flat, relatively flat roofs, um, simple front articulation, and many also provide multifamily housing. Um, the house in the middle with the peaked roof is located across the street from the project site, and it appears to be close to 30 feet in height. Um, so I'll say that we received a number of letters from the public with concerns pertaining to the project design. Um, this project came in at a time when staff was just learning about state law limitations and objective versus subjective development standards. Um, the zoning ordinance currently has fairly subjective design guidelines. Um, so in the past, we've had a little more flexibility in what we could ask for with respect to the design changes, um, but we're more limited now due to the housing crisis. So as I previously mentioned, the Housing Accountability Act limits the ability of local jurisdictions to restrict the development of, a new, of new housing. Um, SB 330, which is the Housing Crisis Act, expands upon the Housing Accountability Act by limiting a local jurisdiction from requiring a development to reduce density to meet subjective design standards. Um, so this law includes language and that the term lower density includes any conditions that have the same effect or impact on the ability of the project to provide housing. Um, the appeal letter claims that SB 330 does not eliminate all local oversight of compatibility and design um, and compatibility and appearance of the surrounding area. Um, however, that statement is incorrect in that unless there were any design modifications required to meet objective development standards um, or absent an applicant's willingness to concede on the subjective design components um, in response to the public concern, the city does not have any legal authority to impose design requirements um, if they would result in a reduction in bedrooms or square footage, um, or if it would add costs that make the project infeasible. So the third concern raised by the opponents is with respect to solar access. Um, this issue was also raised in the first appeal against staff's approval of the project. Um, the appellants indicate that the project does not comply with design permit finding number five because the project doesn't maintain a compatible relationship to and preserve solar access of adjacent properties. Um, Staff addressed this concern at the Planning Commission hearing by explaining that the zoning ordinance and the general plan don't include any objective design guidelines specifically related to solar access. Um, the proposed apartments meet the 30 foot height limitation for flat roof structures um, in the RL district and they meet and exceed the required setbacks, um, both of which are objective development standards that are intended to provide adequate privacy and solar access between properties um, in these urban environments. So staff did request a shading study as an additional resource to assist in gauging the maximum amount of shadow that would be cast from the project. Um, the applicant prepared the study based on the height of the development and the study evaluates the solar impact during the morning and afternoon of the winter solstice which is when the sun is at its lowest daily maximum elevation um, and when the shadows would be the longest. So you can see on the bottom study, um, which shows the existing impact, that there's currently a considerable amount of shading due to the existence of heritage trees on the site. Um, so while some of the shading impacts are expected to occur within an urban infill project, the proposal limits these to the greatest extent possible by locating the development um, kind of in the center of the property and by providing shorter replacement trees for the heritage trees that are proposed for removal. And then finally, the fourth concern raised by the opponents is with respect to staff's interpretation of the term lower density um, as it's used in state law. So I previously mentioned both SB 330 and AB 3194 um, both strengthened the Housing Account Accountability Act and they limit the 
ability of a local jurisdiction to restrict the development of new housing. So that's either by denying a project or by requiring a development to reduce density or intensity in order to meet subjective design standards. Um, so the Housing Accountability Act is a state law designed to promote infill development, and it applies to these housing applications that meet these great um, meet these three criteria. Um, so if an application meets these criteria, the city must approve the project. If the city denies an application that meets the objective standards, we're required to make that finding that the project creates a significant adverse impact to the public health and safety. Um, so the law eliminates the city's ability to propose modifications to a project that would reduce the number of units that can be developed. Um, 2017 amendments to this act specifically define lower density to mean any conditions that have the same effect or impact on the ability of the project to provide housing. Um, based on that definition of lower density, state law does not allow for conditions that result in the reduction of bedrooms um, or units or the overall square footage um, as compared to what's allowed by the general plan or the zoning um, because that would impact the ability of the project to provide housing. Um, so as, you, as you've seen, the three new apartments um, are consistent with the objective zoning standards and development standards. A reduction in the size or the height of the building would lower the density of the project by reducing the number of bedrooms um, within each unit. And so it can't be found that the project results in a specific adverse impact um, to the public health and safety. Um, I want to add that the appellants asked both the Planning Commission and applicants for a reduction to the proposed height and to the number of stories in an effort to reduce the overall massing um, of the project and in order to achieve additional compatibility with the surrounding neighborhood. Um, a minority of the Planning Commissioners concurred with that request um, and disagreed with the city's interpretation of lower density. Uh, that resulted in a failed motion to continue the hearing for redesign. Um, and after additional discussion um, on these requirements and the limitations of state law, the Planning Commission approved the project with those two added conditions of approval um, in an effort to create additional privacy for the adjacent neighbor to the north and to reduce the overall massing. Um, while still maintaining that density at the upper, upper end of the um, allowable density range. So that's a lot of information. To summarize, there's um, no question that the Housing Accountability Act applies to this project. Um, the city has very little ability to require reduction in density or intensity, and we don't have the ability to deny the project. Um, so before I conclude my presentation, I also want to note that staff has modified condition of approval number 27 um, to include this language. Um, our local ordinance does not require replacement housing for demolition of three or more units. Um, replacement housing provisions of SBC 30 apply to any unit to be demolished though. So um, the second building to be demolished has been vacant for over a year. Um, we haven't received confirmation from the applicant that the unit was vacant for more than five years or that the previous tenant was not a low or very low income household. Um, so we've added this condition to include the replacement housing requirement of SB 330. Um, but I want to note that if it's determined that this replacement housing unit is not required, um, the applicant has voluntarily agreed to enter into an affordable housing agreement with the city and they are going to provide a deep restricted unit at 80% AMI. So to conclude my presentation, um, this project meets all the objective zoning standards. It's consistent with um, general plan policies and it maximizes infill density on a parcel that's zoned for multifamily residential uses. Um, the parcel is also unconstrained by environmental resources. And so with that said, staff recommends that the city council acknowledge the environmental determination that the project um, is categorically exempt from environmental review under CEQA, um, section 15332, which allows for infill development. 
and that the city council deny the appeal and uphold the planning commission's approval of the residential demolition authorization permit and design permit based on um, the findings and the resolution and conditions of approval. So I'm available if you have any questions to the staff at this time. Thank you, Brianna. Appreciate the thorough um, presentation by the staff. Um, let me look here. I'm gonna now invite up Travis Tinsey, uh, who will have 15 minutes to speak and present evidence in support of the appeal. Travis, I see you on the screen. Welcome, go ahead and start. Hey, thank you. Um, my name is Travis Tinsey and I'm part of a group of Seabright neighbors who are appealing this development at 14 Pennsylvania. Thank you city council members for providing an avenue for this appeal process. I'm confident in saying that I speak for a large portion of this Seabright neighborhood where residents find themselves especially susceptible to the type of development that is being considered at 418 Pennsylvania. Um, as a starting point, I would like to mention that, as Brianna did, that a letter from the Whitworth Park and Law Firm has been sent to the city attorney and members of the city council. And I hope everyone has had a chance to review that letter. Um, I believe it's buried in the agenda packet on page 289. Um, our position is, is that this project does not meet the objective zoning standards and therefore this project cannot be approved. Um, as everyone on the Zoom is aware, this topic is fraught with contention and there are wide ranging views on what should be built, where it should be built and who it should be built for. Um, fortunately, we already have some guidelines in place that offer a path forward. The published documents detailing those guidelines are in the form of our city's general plan and public zoning ordinance. Uh, as Brianna pointed out, the focal point of this appeal and quite frankly, all of our defense points um, and the primary factor here is the state law, which is the Housing Accountability Act. The act strips away our planning department's ability to shape a housing project if the project meets the objective standards in our city. Um, during that December 3rd planning commission meeting, when the approval for this project was considered, it was thoroughly discussed and ultimately approved. Um, myself and many other members of the neighborhood outlined all the reasons why we believe that this project was not neighborly and not representative of the city's solar affordability and sustainability goals. Uh, leading up to that planning commission appeal, members of the planning department suggested a redesign to the applicant uh, and ultimately, the planning commissioners decided to approve the project by a narrow four to three vote, concluding that the Housing Accountability Act limits the city's ability to consider and require changes to the 418 uh, development proposal. Once again, we were thwarted by the state law. Um, after further review of this project though, after that commission planning meeting uh, and the involvement of the Whitworth Park and Law Firm, we now know that the Planning Commissioners rely on relied on information from the Planning Commission staff report, which improperly concluded that the 418 project satisfies objective general plan and zoning standards, which we now know it does not. So I will detail those. Um, there are three plain language requirements detailed in the general plan. Uh, and zoning standards that this project does not satisfy. The first is that the lot size is insufficient to accommodate four dwelling units with two or more bedrooms as detailed in the minimum lot area requirements for the RL district. The staff report appears to improperly conflate the maximum density here under the general plan LM designation with the minimum lot area required for the RL district or two bedroom or greater units. So the key point here is the number of bedrooms. Um, while this parcel may have a maximum density of four dwelling units under the general plan, there is insufficient lot area for four dwelling units with two and three bedrooms based on the minimum lot size requirements of 2,200 square feet per dwelling unit within the RL zoning district. It's super, super convoluted. Um, this still, like it, it doesn't meet the objective standards. It's just obtuse language. 
The second is that the proposal does not satisfy the front yard setbacks, and Brianna kind of touched on this. The front yard setback is not the 15 feet required by our ordinance. It's only eight foot, eight inches. This is further proof that this lot does not have the space required for these four units. So I will show some images here if I can share my screen. Uh -huh. Do we have a screen share here? Yeah, I think so. Can you guys see that? Yeah. All right. So. So top, top row, front yard proposed eight foot eight inches. So, you know, I guess what I'm saying here is, is my screen not being shared anymore? No, we can see it. You, you see the photo still? No, we see just the chart right now. Okay, all right, so to that point, um, it, it, it doesn't have the space required for the, the eight foot, or I'm sorry, the 15 foot requirement. It's only eight foot, eight inches per this drawing. Um, so I will share another, well, I'll just keep going. The third is that the city code does not allow new construction to avail itself of an existing non-conforming front yard setback. Um, the city code is clear in saying that any legal non-conforming building or structure shall be not made more non-conforming. And that's city code section 24.18.030. Uh, so if this were allowed to be built according to the current plan, it certainly would become more non-conforming. So Brianna just said that because the three new units are not attached to the single family home, they cannot be considered non-conforming. That doesn't make any sense. And please cite the city code that, that mentions that. But further to that point, the front house is not being remodeled. I'm sorry, it is being remodeled. It definitely is being remodeled. Therefore, it's very much part of the project and the project does not meet the 15 foot standard. So I, I don't understand that. As previously mentioned, you know, a full elaboration of these non-conforming points can be found in the letter from Whitworth Park and Law Firm. Um, I emphasize and reiterate this point for clarity's sake, much of the staff report in your packet is based on the assumption that this project meets the objective standard threshold. Some of it does, but to these specific points, it does not. And because it does not, the project at 418 Pennsylvania um, cannot be approved. Uh, the commission cannot point to the 2019 Housing Accountability Act as a means for streamlining the approval or any approval of the project under its current design for that matter. Um, and it's just especially unfortunate that we have had to allocate time and financial resources taking this appeal to the city council when the planning commission staff had the opportunity to determine any objective standards that this project does not satisfy beforehand and thereby saving all of us from this phase. But in their defense, this topic is convoluted. Uh, and I think we can all agree that more needs to be done to update our area plans and objective standards. We are already seeing a framework of laws at the state level that limit local jurisdictions ability to chart their own course for development. And to this point, I'm very happy to see that the planning commission recognizes this need and has arranged for the following community meetings to discuss the topic of objective standards. Um, especially in our Seabright neighborhood. This is our opportunity to forge our own path and positively influence our environment and our built environment. Um, so members of this city council, thank you for listening to our appeal, especially given the unfortunate but necessary circumstances that require us to be here by Zoom. Uh, this project does not satisfy objective standards and cannot be approved in the current format. You know, we do look forward as a neighborhood to working with the Planning Commission and active members of my community, of our community, to find solutions that do work. Um, so members of this council can vote to make that happen. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kinsey. Uh, I will now ask the applicant, Dan Stark, uh, who will have a 15 minutes to speak and present evidence. Mr. Stark. Hello, 
good afternoon. Can you guys hear us? Yes. Great. Um, What's the, we're going to share a screen here. We have some slides to go through. Uh, yeah, we're going to turn off the video while we share the screen. The internet's a little choppy sometimes. We want to make sure we don't lose everybody. So we'll uh, be on audio during this. Okay. Thank you. Okay, can everyone see the full scale size uh, presentation here? Yes, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so start off. Um, hello, city council members. My name is Tim Gordon. I'm one of the founders of Workbench. We're a very local design build company located here in downtown Santa Cruz. First off, I want to say a huge thank you to the City Council and Planning Department for taking the time to meet with us today. We really appreciate all that you do for our community, and we definitely understand the topics that you deal with on a daily basis are extremely challenging, so we can't thank you enough. Uh, our time is short, so I'll jump right in. Happy to answer any questions uh, by any council members at any time. This project is located at 418 Pennsylvania Avenue. <clears throat> and is a family-oriented housing complex consisting of much-needed three-bedroom rental units with two-car garages and on-site parking. I would like to discuss briefly a really well-known topic in our area as well as California in general, the need for housing and especially rental housing. Like many places in California, Santa Cruz has historically not built enough housing to accommodate our existing and growing population. For the general plan and zoning code, most of the Seabright area is designated for multifamily residential housing and has been for many years. The primary intention of this project is to provide housing for families in Santa Cruz. And all parties involved, the owner, the design team, future construction team are all really strongly connected to Santa Cruz and desperately want to be part of our housing solution. There are many reasons why this project should be as approved as is, but I'm just going to cover a few here. First of all, and as a major point to remember, this project meets all of the obje objective standards set forth in the general plan and zoning ordinances, as has been um, shown by the planning department and the planning commission approval. Um, our team, and as a brief note, our team has met the planning department m many times on this project. We've gone through roughly 30 different site plans and options with every imaginal, imaginable option in an effort to create the best project. Um, projects like this go through a very rigorous screening and approval process, as you know, to get to this point. As such, we've met or exceeded all the standards based on fire access, safety, setbacks, parking requirements, density, open space, and all the other things that are required to be reviewed. Um, second reason that we should approve this, that our, our client, the developer here, is, is willingly providing a deed-restricted affordable unit. As you all know, that's not a small feat, especially for a project of only four units in total. I wanted to mention the last point, which I think is the most impactful. At this time, there's only three three-bedroom rental units on the market in, in the Seabright area. On top of that, there's only 23 in the greater Santa Cruz area in total. Hopefully that statistic alone is enough to help approve this project. On a personal level, I've lived in Seabright for five years. My kids go to golf. I'm very connected and familiar with the area. I've had two separate golf teachers reach out to me in the last month who are looking for homes for their families and want to stay in Seabright near where they work. Unfortunately, our, these units aren't built yet, and there's not many options for them to stay in the Seabright area. This is a realistic effect of not building housing. Our teachers can't even live in the neighborhoods we ask them to teach our children in. Um, I had a slide here on SB 330 in Santa Cruz. Uh, Brianna handled most of it, so I'm just going to skim through it here pretty briefly. Uh, SB 330 applies to um, projects that meet the objective standards in the general plan and zoning code, which we've done, as shown by the planning department and approved by both the planning department and planning commission. I'm going to interrupt you for one second. I don't know if you're wanting your slides to advance, but they're not moving. Um, we're still seeing the first slide. Oh, oh, I apologize and appreciate that. We no were worries. in presentation mode, and I think you go out to escape here. Um, how about now? Three. Okay, great. Thank you. I, 
thank you so much. This one here, Dan. So um, I was saying that the you know state bill protects projects from denial or change based on subjective standards. Um, and again, to echo staff's presentation here, all the items in this appeal are subjective, cannot be considered um, if they would re do any of the following. You know, if they would reduce density, bedroom count, square footage, intensity of use, height, style, financial feasibility of the project for the owner, et cetera, unless there is a, a preponderance of effort in writing that states that the project will have a negative effect on health and safety of the public. Um, one last note for me on a personal level and a quick housing advocacy plug here. We at Workbench have a very deep personal connection to this town. We want to see it prosper. You know, we're able to help to that effort by helping creating housing. Though this project is given protection under FB 330, I would encourage the council to think about why do we need it? Our project meets all the applicable codes, provides 25% deed restricted affordable units and creating three more rentals that we desperately need. With all this, it's unfortunate that we feel the need to be backed by a state housing ordinance to produce this housing. Um, I understand and I know that you all know that housing is a very broad and challenging topic. I would encourage the city council to think about that question going forward and, and I appreciate that. Um, keeping in, that in mind, I'll turn it over to Dan Stark. Dan's the lead designer here at Workbench and has been the lead on this project. Thank you again and go ahead, Dan. Good afternoon, Mayor Myers and council members. Thank you for your time and consideration today. And thank you, Brianna, for your sage support and guidance throughout the entire process. We really appreciate you. My name is Dan Stark. I'm the architectural project man manager on the project, and I am a representative of the applicant. Next, I'd like to go briefly over the planning commission findings. I have to move quickly here, so please stick with me. The planning commission hearing was on December 3rd last year project was approved with the following concessions, which we are still willing to meet. Balconies currently located on the north sides of the unit facing the affluence property may be screened or relocated to the south side of the unit facing our driveway and our neighbors to the north. The overall height of the building can be reduced by dropping the plate heights, which are currently nine and a half or 10 feet to nine feet. I'd like to uh, discuss uh, briefly our attempts at outreach in working with the Appalent and the neighbors. No neighborhood outreach was required by the municipal code for this buy right project. We do see and understand the value of earlier communication with the neighborhood, but after offering concessions at the planning commission hearing and attempted, attempted outreach to the Appalent following the hearing, I understand that we would not have had a different outcome. After the planning commission meeting, we requested conditions to satisfy the appellant and their two requests were to relocate the balconies as already offered during the planning commission meeting and to make the building two stories. These concessions would render the project infeasible. After responding to the appellant with this information, they asked me to meet privately off the record, which I told them that I was not comfortable doing. And at that point, the communication with the appellant ended, I never heard back. The next portion of the presentation will be a direct review of the appeal. First item on the appeal is the driveway, specifically the driveway width. The appellant suggests in the appeal that our driveway should be 24 feet wide. For the municipal code, a facility such as ours with eight parking spaces may have a 12 foot wide driveway as proposed. The 24 foot back out requirement mentioned in the appeal is a reference to the back out distance as put forth in the municipal code. The 24 foot back out is indeed required by the current municipal code. As Brianna mentioned, this section of the municipal code was added after completion of our project of planning. No clear back out distance was provided in previous code versions. Importantly, the current municipal code offers an alternative path to compliance via approval from the planning and public works department. This allows for reduction of the 24 foot standard back out distance, which is very important when we're looking at a site like this. 
is not a small site, but it's only 50 feet wide. You can imagine what a 24 foot driveway would to do to this height, due to this site, it would cut it in half immediately. I, for one, am glad that our municipal code does not give that much weight to the automobile. Our sub 24 foot back out has been reviewed and approved by the public works department and the planning department. So we remain compliant with the current code as applied to our project and to the, the code that was applied to our project from the pre previously applicable, applicable code. In reviewing the back out with planning and public works, we reviewed, we used ASHTO standard turn radius for a passenger car design vehicle, which is a large generous car as seen on the right of this slide. The image on the left of this slide shows two large SUVs easily making the back out, including a Hummer H1, which is the largest passenger vehicle available to the American public today. This slide shows my field test, which proves that this back out works well and was not difficult at all. I hope this study can put this concern to rest. The next appeal item is neighborhood context and mapping. The images on this slide show screening of the new units behind the existing single family residence. We think it's an attractive project but we think the screening also minimalizes the visual impact on the street and presents a choice for decisions about architectural style to future, future development in the sea break. But we think that the project fits in the neighborhood now. Now I'd like to mention that neighborhood is very clearly and objectively defined in the municipal code as an area within one half mile of the site. Also worth mentioning is that the building as proposed is 30 feet tall, allowable per the current municipal code. The building could be taller by right with a sloped roof because of the municipal code's definition of building height as being to the, the middle of a gable end roof. The building was designed uh, to have a grade level ground floor and approximately 10 foot plate heights, uh, which were were offered to be reduced to nine foot during the planning commission hearing. Neighboring buildings are not much shorter. For example, the neighboring one story residence with a 12 to 12 gable end roof and a four foot tall crawl space is gonna be approximately 25 feet tall at the ridge. I'd like to show some precedents for the project in the neighborhood. Please recall that uh, the neighborhood is defined objectively of any site within one half mile of our project. The first precedent is at 117 Galt Street. This is a three-story multifamily residential development. Roofs are sloped hip roofs, but they have such a low slope that they appear to be a flat roof. Multiple buildings occupy the front of the lot as well as the back. This project is 0.4 miles from the site, which meets all objective standards for being in the same neighborhood. The next project is 1041 Cayuga Street. This is a three-story multifamily residential development with flat roofs. And this address is six parcels removed from our project. The next project is at 1008 SoCal Ave. It is another two plus story multifamily residential development with flat roofs. This project has balconies on the property line. It's five parcels removed from our project. The last property I wanted to show is at 1005 Cayuga Street. This is a two story multifamily residential development with flat roofs no separation of balconies and adjacent buildings, and this project directly abuts our project at 14 Pennsylvania. Item number three on the appeal is the project's solar impact on the Appalachian property. The picture on the left of this slide shows the existing 60 foot tall liquid amber trees. Some studies done for the project were done as a worst case scenario on December 21st at 9 a.m. This shows the highest possible impact on solar access to the adjacent property. The existing trees mentioned are to be removed, thereby mitigating solar impact from the trees. This side, slide shows that the sum total of the solar impact on the property will be less than the current shade from the trees to be demolished. Actual access, actual solar access is not impeded for most of the year and only before 12 o'clock on any day, generally in the winter. Three existing trees to be demolished will be replaced by 
13 new trees located on the site in order to maximize privacy and minimize solar impact. As mentioned, minimal or no solar impact. Me, no solar impact is made on the property outside of the winter morning. Can I, can I request more? Um, no, you won't. It, because it's an appeal, you're held to that 15, 15 minute standard. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next we will move on to questions from the council. And I believe, Bonnie, please uh, clarify these. Uh, can questions be asked of either the appellant or the applicant, or are these just for staff? Mm -hmm. Oh, and all of the above. All of the above. Okay, great. I have Council Member Cummings. for the presentation and then for the appellant and the developer for being here to answer our questions today. Um, I, had, um, I have a number of questions and I'm, I'm gonna probably ask a few and then provide other people with opportunities to ask questions um, so that everybody has a chance to, to speak. Um, I did wanna ask uh, the city attorney, um, the appellants, it, it looks like we have a, a letter um, from a law firm that um, that was brought forward by the appellants. And I'm just wondering if that letter has, if there's been any kind of assessment of the legal findings of that letter and how it um, pertains to, you know, if this moves forward, are the potential that we might be in litigation um, because of the fact that this, what was stated by the appellant is that this project doesn't actually meet the objective standards laid out in the general plan in our zoning ordinance. So I'm just wondering if we can speak to that. Thank you. Um, first of all, I think I would like to concur with a statement made by the appellant at the, at the toward the end of his remarks that the statute that we're interpreting here is uh, not a model of clarity. And so there are um, good faith uh, disagreements here about how to interpret the statute uh, and and the staff presentation was very carefully prepared to address the issues raised by the uh, letter from the attorney with respect to the import of SB 330 and specifically uh, the provision that says that, um, that, that the city may require the project to comply with objective standards and criteria of zoning which are consistent with the general plan. However, the standards shall be applied to facilitate and accommodate development at the density allowed on the site by the general plan and proposed by the housing development project. And so this project is consistent with the density allowed by the general plan. Um, and, and so uh, staff, uh, made the point, and that's based on our analysis with the staff, that um, under SB 330, this density provision uh, is is, um, is is required to be adhered to, and if the zoning criteria are inconsistent with that, then you have to apply the general plan uh, consistency de determination. There is a possibility of litigation arising out of whatever decision the council makes with respect to this project, just so that you understand it's not a, it's not just a one way thing. Thank you, Tony. Um, next, thanks Tony. And then um, I just wanted to get some clarification around AB uh, 3194 and SB 330. Um, I, I, I was looking through the agenda packet before the meeting and it didn't see anything regarding the inclusion of the affordable housing piece of this, but I just wanted to read the first sentence in, um, that's consistent between the two bills just to get some clarification. And it states that the Housing Accountability Act, which is part of the planning and zoning law, prohibits a local agency from disapproving or conditioning approval in a manner that renders infeasible a housing development project for very low, low, or moderate income households or an emergency shelter unless a local agency makes specified written findings based on a preponderance of evidence in the record. And from that statement, what I'm gathering is that in the absence of having an affordable 
affordable unit within this project that SB 330 and AB 3194 would not apply because there would, if there's no affordable housing piece to this project, then you know, because that, that's what the Housing Accountability Act is saying is that we can't deny a project if they're going to build affordable housing. And so, I just want to know if that's if that's a correct interpretation of of these two laws or not, because it seems like if, if they hadn't agreed to put in any affordable units, then these laws wouldn't apply. Well, there are provisions of both statutes that apply specifically to low to moderate income housing projects, and then there are provisions that apply to uh, housing projects generally. And so the, the language that was um, quoted in the agenda report is is applicable to housing projects generally, not those that are specifically uh, um, uh, for low to moderate income housing. Okay, so if this, I guess to clarify, if this were a 100% market rate project, would it then, would SB 330 and AB 3194 be applied in this context? Subsection J1 of, um, of the of the, the uh, SB 330 would still be applicable. Okay, thank you. And not, then all, not all the provisions of SB 330 would be applicable. Thank you. And then I guess I would just say that um, just a comment that I would make in, um, in response to the developer's um, presentation, and I want to just appreciate, you know, wanting to build housing in our community, but I would say that um, we've had a, we are, in terms of our arena goals, and then the housing that we've been producing in the city of Santa Cruz, we have been producing more than uh, adequate amount of market rate housing. Um, I know that there are a number of market rate apartment complexes offering incentives because they're sitting empty for people to move in. And so I would just say that um, I appreciate the commitment to housing in Santa Cruz, but one of the things we really need is affordable housing for our workforce and for um, working class families within our community. And so I appreciate the um, addition of the um, debt deed restricted 80% um, affordable unit. I would also encourage that if there's an opportunity to provide um, for, for example, um, Section 8 families to have, you know, first opportunity to apply um, when it comes time for these units to be rented, I think that would also help because we have like a 10 year wait list for many Section 8 um, housing voucher holders. And so I just wanted to put that out there as well. And I'll hold the rest of my comments to allow my colleagues to ask questions if they have them. Thank you. And Donna, you're muted. Sorry. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Are there other questions from other city council members at this time? Council Member Brown. Uh, yeah, so I, I, this is a, a question that is, has just come up for me because the appellant mentioned the objective standards uh, development process. And I know that we are in a situation where we are, are, we have very few objective standards that, and we certainly don't have any that have been developed in light of the new state housing laws that have um, been adopted recently. And so I'm just wondering uh, where, you know, I, it's been a while and we have, were, you know, given a, a plan. And so I'm just wondering where things are at with the development of those objective standards. It, they wouldn't apply in this case, but, you know, it sure would be nice to have those so we have something to look to when projects like this come our way. <clears throat> Thank you, Councilmember Brown, Lee Butler, Director of Planning and Community Development. And um, the grant has us um, completing those by the end of the year um, and having them to you before the end of the year. Um, the first, uh, we, we have been to the Planning Commission and the Planning Commission has um, uh, reviewed the outreach plan. We've also been to the Planning Commission to discuss um, general plan amendments um, stemming from the first um, set of um, test fits that were done. And we expect to present that information. The Planning Commission voted unanimously to not pursue general plan amendments at this time as a recommendation to the council. And we'll be presenting that information to the council at their first meeting in March. 
Um, so you'll get a uh, overview of where we're at in the process there. And then in the within the next month, we will have our first um, outreach meeting as it relates to the um, uh, objective standards. And so the, the plan has been approved for outreach and we'll be rolling that out within the next three to four weeks. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Uh, Council Member Watkins and then Council Member Kalantari Johnson. You know, Council Member Brown actually asked the question I was hoping to ask as well. So I appreciate the question and the response. I think it would be very helpful to have these in place, right? And so knowing that we're on a path um, to get there is, is good, to, good to hear. Um, I guess if I could just get one, maybe a clarifying connect, uh, um, response from our city attorney. Um, Tony, in regards to saying you're, we're liable to get um, sued one way or another, can you speak to that and to what elements um, kind of puts the city in this precarious position? Sure. Um, I don't. I don't think I need to repeat uh, Ms. Khan's arguments or the appellant's arguments. Their position is that the city is um, misinterpreting. The zoning criteria in two ways. One, uh, by allowing a structure that encroaches into the 15-foot uh, front yard setback, there is a legal building there now, and under the zoning code, uh, you can maintain a non-conforming structure as long as you don't make it non-conform, more non-conforming. And the staff interpretation of more non-conforming would be if additional features of the structure were constructed within the front yard setback, that would make it more non-conforming. But building on portions of the property that, that are not within the setback doesn't make an existing non-conforming building more non-conforming. Um, so, so we just disagree with that argument. Um, the second argument is that uh, because the zoning code specifies 2,200 square feet per uh, dwelling unit that's in, it, that's in excess of uh, two bedrooms, that uh, you would need a minimum of 8,800 square feet to build uh, this project with three, three bedroom apartments, uh, whereas the parcel size is like 8,750 square feet. I mean, it's, it's very close to that. Um, there are two problems with that. Um, First, under AB 330, if the city receives an application, um, and you can use this, this as you can use this as an example of how this applies. If the city receives an application for a project and determines that it's inconsistent with the zoning for the for the site, um, it's required to notify the applicant within 30 days of the applications being deemed complete. And in this case, the application was deemed complete sometime in September, I assume, because it went before the zoning administrator uh, for hearing in October. Um, the, the second part of the statute says that if the local agency fails to provide the required documentation the housing development project shall be deemed consistent, compliant, and in conformity with the applicable plan, program, policy, ordinance, standard requirement, or other similar provision. Um, and so, uh, really, you have a very short window of time to determine compliance. Staff did that and determined that the project does comply because of a different provision of SB 330 that says that you need to accommodate housing on the property uh, that's within the density limits of the general plan. And this project uh, does that. And to the, ex and the staff interpretation of SB 330 is to the extent that um, the zoning doesn't conform to that density requirement, then you have to interpret the zoning code in a way that allows the project to be developed. Um, and the, and the specific wording of the statute is at the density allowed on the site by the general plan and proposed by the proposed housing development project. And so those are the arguments as to why the staff position is correct. So there could be a, a claim made by the applicant should the city deny the project 
in the same fashion that there could be a claim made by the appellant uh, should you approve the project as proposed. Thank you. Next, I have Council Member Bruner. You had your hand up, I believe. Hands are down all of a sudden. Ellen Perry Johnson was next. Oh, I'm sorry. I had my hand up, but my question was um, addressed. Thank you. Oh, it was. Okay. Okay. Any other questions from Council for either our staff or the appellants or the applicants? Doesn't look like anyone has any other questions. Okay. We will go ahead now and open this for public comment. So this is for the item on 418 Pennsylvania Avenue. If you are interested in commenting on this item, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. And um, I know there's a number of folks and we've had multiple hearings on this project. So I will be stopping you at the two minute mark um, just to continue to be able to have um, timely discussion on it. Uh, first up is Mr. Kelly. Go ahead. Uh, uh, this is Kyle Kelly. Um, please deny the appeal and allow these three new homes to be created so we can welcome new neighbors. The only drawback I see here is that this should be much taller and have many more homes given, given the immense need that we have in, in this city. Um, I think I want to make a statement about some of the uh, city council uh, kind of deliberation on this. If, if people want to see objective standards be completed more quickly, um, then planning staff should be free from having to deliberate on, on such a small project like this where we're literally spending more than an hour to talk about three new homes. Three new homes that, that families can move into, that children and grandchildren of the appellants themselves could even move into. Um, I think people are missing the forest for the trees and knowing that like, we, we need room for, for people. Um, so that people can live here. So please deny the appeal, allow these three new homes to be created. Thank you. Thank you. The next caller will is with phone number ending in 2694. Go ahead, please. Yeah, hi, this is uh, Patrick Drake. I live immediately next door at 414 Pennsylvania Avenue. And I just like to say that this is squeezing, a, you know, three new units into a very tight space. There's already three apartment buildings here uh, that are abutting this um, proposed development. And I think it's going to be too dense. And I think also we're here all day working from home, and there's going to be heavy construction on this site for potentially years, jackhammering, concrete, backhoes. And I just think it's a three-story building on a block that only has one story and two stories, and it doesn't really fit the neighborhood. And I, at the very least, could the permit be postponed or the building permit or the approval be postponed until the pandemic has passed and we're not all uh, stuck in our, literally stuck in our homes all day, every day. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Mr. Bowers. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jack Bowers. I live two blocks away. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for um, uh, allowing us to talk about this. It's uh, very important, not just for this single project, but for the uh, um, ongoing uh, integrity of our neighborhood. Um, I live on Windsor Street, two blocks away from the development. Um, I'm a 26-year resident of uh, the Seabright neighborhood. Um, I love the diversity. I came in here as a renter, and uh, I'm now um, fortunate enough to be a homeowner. I love being able to live next to uh, um, people, uh, renters, and I'm, I'm happy about that part of our neighborhood. However, the development at 418 um, is 
the sum total of it is that it overwhelms the area. It puts a lot of uh, stress on a small part of the neighborhood that is already uh, compromised. Um, I think Travis raised the uh, issues very uh, um, intelligently. Um, I'd like to mention a hearing, a zoning administrator hearing that we went to for a development that they wanted to put directly across from our house at 415 uh, Windsor. One of the things we were able to point out to the zoning administrator is that um, parking at a place like this and, and the, the fact that the parking is so difficult at 418 exacerbates this, is that people are going to park on the street. And that's going to create tremendous problems in the area where there's already a lot of difficulty parking. Um, one of the things that the zoner, zoning administrator did for us is that he required in the uh, homeowners agreement that uh, the homeowners association agreement that the part the garages in these houses remain vacant and that they be, be able to be inspected for that because um, despite the fact that you can pull your uh, Hummer in there, you're not going to pull your Hummer into there because it's so difficult to do. So they will just uh, park it out on the street. So um, making provisions for the impact of uh, Thank you, Mr. Bowers. Next up, I have Mary and Bob, please. Okay. Hello, can you hear us? Yes, we can. Thank you. Uh, thanks for taking our call. So we're, uh, we're Seabright uh, residents as well. And I'm going to start off by saying, uh, first of all, we have a two-story apartment building in our backyard. And um, it's very impressive. We, we use the backyard as a garden only because of that. Um, I can't imagine having a three-story building in my backyard or in my side yard. Um, and, and that being said, the, the, they keep referencing the 30-foot height. The difference between a 30-foot ridge line on a Victorian is not the same in any stretch, in my mind, as, as the 30-foot height on a three-story apartment. You can't equate an attic space to, to a living space. I mean, let's, let's get real about it. Um, Mr. Bowers mentioned some, some really good points, and I want to elaborate briefly. Um, you know, this, this neighborhood has character, and, you know, we have a single-family home. We like it. We have apartments. There's duplexes next door across the street, so it's, it's eclectic as it is already. But if we look long-term, I mean, down Seabright, they built, you know, those, those you know, shoved a bunch of homes in those lots that were vacant for years. And it's just, I mean, it's already, but, you know, pre-COVID, traffic in Santa Cruz is insane. And people are forgetting that already. If we start slamming all these homes in here, um, where are we going to park? Every day we jockey for parking in the street and on our, in our driveway because of it. And, and lastly, I'll say that we have family up in Seattle, and this is happening in really beautiful neighborhoods with old homes, old Victorians, um, just really wonderful neighborhoods. And they're tearing down these homes and building exactly what these gentlemen are proposing. And I gotta tell you, it's um, it's repellent. It just it, it changes everything. Thank you. Uh, next up, I have last name Kelsey. And you're ready to go. I'm very curious why, if objective standards are being developed, why they cannot be applied in this situation. It seems uh, absurd to say, well, those standards aren't in force now, therefore, you know, we can build whatever. But when it comes later, then we'll have standards. It, it just feels to me like that is um, an absurdity uh, that goes around in circles. Um, the uh, fact that you're wanting community input, outreach, uh, which was not done in this case, um, I, I just can't see how that you can justify it using the legalistic uh, 330 uh, standards. Um, so 
further, I think that the uh, letter from the lawyers that lay out what the objections are need to have been read by each council member and considered before a vote is taken. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is uh, last name Collins, please. Hello, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, my name is uh, Frank Collins. I moved to Santa Cruz approximately last year. Um, it's been very difficult for me to find a place that's affordable and you know big enough for my family and I to live in because of frankly the cost of rentals in Santa Cruz is way too high for us. Um, this project not only provides housing for me, but it's also an affordable unit, which is to be completely honest, desperately needed. Um, it's unfortunate that young families, young professionals like myself, and in particular those like myself in the service industry are priced out of the beautiful Seabright neighborhood and out of Santa Cruz in total. Um, I ask everyone in the, on the council board to approve this project because it is the right thing to do for Santa Cruz residents. And for people wanting to move in, I currently live in a very tiny studio in the Seabright neighborhood with my wife and daughter. Um, I don't know, I just, I wanna live in a bigger house to provide for my family. And so far, I'm not able to find anything in my price range on the listing apps. Um, thank you everyone for your time and thank you for hearing me out. Thank you. Next up is Mr. Simon. Hi, this is Sibley Simon uh, from New Way Homes. Um, I haven't previously commented or written uh, in on this particular project, uh, but I was inspired to do so by a presentation the Reimagine Santa Cruz uh, group had uh, last week from Strong Towns, which was really a compelling argument that um, we, we have a lot of this housing crisis because we haven't allowed small developments um, to happen and more gentle increases of density, which happened for you know 100 years gradually here and happens much less so now. And so we have you know very large projects and um, single family homes and we've stopped sprawl, fortunately. And that to have a healthy community and a variety of housing types and just have it be a little bit less expensive to build housing, that these kinds of projects need to happen. And I certainly understand when folks are um, don't like uh, what the zoning rules are, uh, for example. But I think if we keep re-adjudicating those on every three-unit pro uh, project, you know, this is why housing just can't get built. So we need to set the rules, live by them. If we don't like them, change the rules. Um, so I hope that somehow we can find ways to continue to reduce this. Um, inability to create housing and not only approve this project, but make other projects um, learn from it, make other projects, the next project, if it needs to be a little different, you know, change the rules so it's a little different, um, but then uh, have more of this stuff happening. So I, I hope we get more projects like this in Santa Cruz and we find a way to make them more efficient. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> the next speaker is ending in phone number 7527. Hello, um, I'm a uh, Seabright resident and I uh, moved here with my family and I just wanted to say we need as much of this as we can possibly get. I also want to say that, um, well, oftentimes at these meetings, the representation is that of neighbors not wanting projects. There are many more of us that want things built, want people to move in. We want affordable housing. And the fact that this project provides even one affordable unit is a miracle. It's 25% affordability. That's not um, what anyone else gets as a development. Um, I think the things that are brought up in opposition are brought up uh, universally by people that don't want things built in their neighborhood. Um, character, parking, shadows, density, procedure, design nostalgia, and character. These have been things that have kept um, housing and 
uh, specifically affordable housing and marginalized individuals out of neighborhoods for decades. It's, it, it needs to stop, and um, I hope this project goes forward, and I hope many more like it do as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up is uh, phone number ending in 4207. You're unmuted. You should be able to talk now. You should be able to talk ending in 4207. You're unmuted. Yeah, you're unmuted. You should be able to talk now. Bonnie, why don't we have them try to yes, come uh, back? Can you hear me okay? Oh, yes, we can hear you now. Thank you. We'll start the clock. Sorry about that. Um, my name is Matthew. I'm um, Santa Cruz resident for the last 29 years. Um, born here in, at uh, Dominican Hospital and a uh, young professional. Um, I've continuously seen both friends and family um, move out of this area um, due to the, the housing shortage and their inability to find homes for both, um, for both young professionals uh, who are um, single and or seeking roommates um, to better afford housing and then also um, young families who are just simply unable to afford single family homes. Um, I think that uh, being able to increase density, increase affordable housing, I think is going to be extremely important and um, projects like this need to continue. So I just wanted to um, advocate my support for um, approval of this project. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is uh, ending in uh, phone number uh, 9078. I'm looking, Bonnie, did you unmute them? They have to unmute themselves. Star nine to unmute yourself. Uh, star six to unmute. Sorry, excuse me, star six. So the person ending in 9078, if you press star there you six, go. there you go, you're unmuted. Thank you. Thank you. I watched the December 3rd Planning Commission meeting for this project and uh, witnessed Commissioner Christian Nielsen's many futile attempts to get needed answers from the project architect. The line of his questioning was important and as an architect himself, he knew an answer was necessary so that commissioners could understand the reasoning used in the decision to not remove the front house. Nielsen said that the front house created other related issues with the project. Follow-up discussions couldn't even occur because the project representative stonewalled the commissioners. The unproductive exchange between them shows why the actual applicant should be present in front of decision-making bodies, not only their representative. The lack of respect shown to the commission was pretty amazing and should not be tolerated. The architect's refusal to divulge answers was possibly due to his hesitancy to put his client in a less than flattering light. Workbench had insights that they refused to convey to the commissioners. Uh, the planning commission hearings are an important process and I hope that future applicants and that representatives would be advised that evading answering at the commission or council level is unacceptable. If you watch the tape, you'll understand what I'm talking about. You'll see how the give and take possibilities of dis further discussion were disrespected and derailed due to Workbench's repeated refusal to explain the decision-making process in saving the front house. I understand that new state laws have created tentative responses. No one's exactly sure what can be changed or not. But the job of the planning commissioner still is to ask questions get answers so they can learn the facts and understand more. The refusal to answer very fair questions should not be allowed as part of this process. Please look at the tape. Thank you. Next speaker is ending in 
phone number 2174. Press star six to unmute yourself. Yes, um, good evening, Mayor and uh, Council Members. My name is Gillian Greensight. Um, I urge you to support this appeal and deny the project. Uh, I thought it was an incredibly convincing presentation from the appellant. And while AB 3194 really ties a local community's hands, I was really disappointed to see how far um, staff goes to move further in that direction. Uh, we should be looking in every way to help protect our neighbourhoods uh, from developments that, uh, as speakers have said, overwhelm the area. Uh, we're supposed to be trying to introduce growth in a careful manner. This is not careful. Workbench has committed, in my mind, the ultimate sin of presenting a visually distorted image at the beginning of their presentation, and staff use the same image. I've been asking for years for uh, architects, developers, to present something in scale. Um, you can look at it again, but the single-story little house in the front is made dominant. You can barely see this three-story development in the back. There's a lot of other uh, misleading information. The idea that a local teacher could afford one of these three-bedroom units is, well, it's ridiculous. We have in our city provided more than most communities. We've exceeded our provision of market rate housing. This does not add anything except the possibility of displacing our low-income workers. An affordable unit, by definition, is a percentage of the area medium income. Every time each of these developments gets approved with 85, 90%, non-affordable market rate, you raise the area medium income, making it less affordable. You've got to look at those issues before you approve a development like this. Thank you very much. Next up is uh, phone number ending in 0193. Press star six to unmute yourself. Go ahead. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor Myers and council members. My name is Henry Hooker. I'm a resident of the neighborhood. I've been a resident for 25 years. It's a neighborhood of single and family, single family and multifamily residences, many of them eight, 10 units. We all agree that there's insufficient housing in Santa Cruz to house our workforce. And we all especially agree that there's a shortage of affordable housing which this project does provide in, in the form of one deed restricted unit. It does fit with the neighborhood. It provides needed residences. It's passed the exhaustive reviews of the planning department and the planning commission and other city agencies. This type of infill housing is exactly what the residential neighborhoods of Santa Cruz need, not just my neighborhood, but all the neighborhoods to house our population, to house, to deal with the fact that we have so many people working in our city who cannot live here. I appreciate the efforts of the planning department to, to protect the city from being taken to court for violation of state law. And I urge the city council to bless this project and allow it to move forward with construction. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is 6958, last four digits of your phone number. Please press star six to unmute yourself. Press star six to unmute yourself, we can't hear you yet. Her phone number ending in 6958. Okay, we'll move to the next uh, phone number. We can't hear you. Oh, I think you may be 
Phone number 6958. If you could press star six, we could hear you then, but we can't hear you now. Okay, you're ready. Thank you. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, hi, my name is Sienna. Um, I'm calling just in support of this project and housing for our community. As many of the other um, folks that are residents that have called in support. Um, and also just to say that I'm also uh, amazed, I guess is the word, at the number of people knowing all the statistics and the issues of housing in our community are still um, opposed to a project um, of this size and scale. And uh, it just sort of always goes back to the, the I've heard, you know, that we are not against housing, just we don't want the housing here and the idea that something that looks different than what's in the neighborhood doesn't belong. And um, those sorts of comments just bring us back to the, um, I guess, major societal issues of not liking things that are not like us and not seeing the um, benefits of diversity and difference. And uh, it's, it's frustrating and appalling to hear. And I hope the council can see beyond um, these comments and um, approve the project and see the benefits of providing these housing units within the Seabright neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the next caller has phone number ending in 3295. Press star six two. There you go, you're ready. Hi, I'm the neighbor to the direct north of the project, and I just want to say the last caller works for the architect, so I'm not sure how many of the callers work for the architect, but anyway, I, um, I'm the original appellant on this appeal, and I want to stress that I'm not anti-development, and I'm not anti-growth. Um, I, I've lived next door to this neglected property for 30 years, and I welcome any improvement and more housing. I'm really sorry it has come all the way to the city council. Um, this project is simply incongruent for the lot size. It's maximizing the space for profit and with no consideration for the neighborhood, the existing neighbors, the parking. There's so many issues with this project. It's massive on this small, smaller house lot. Um, and I just need to add that my home is a three bedroom, one bath and a thousand square feet. These are three bedroom, two bath in 2,200 square feet each. And I'm not sure who can afford these, but not teachers and certainly not my kids or my grandkids that live on teacher type salaries. Um, um, I don't want the project squashed. Um, and I, I just want to see a redesign as, as a good deal as the neighborhood does. The planning department sent these plans back at least twice to my knowledge, suggesting all kinds of ideas that would make this project more palatable to the neighbors, more inclusive of this neighborhood, more neighborly, and they were all ignored. One of the planners, on the, the initial planner on the project told me that this was the worst project she had ever worked on. I myself have written the developer and the architect requesting more consideration and a redesign. I was initially met with a resounding no and then sent unsavory emails that were not at all neighborly. This project has been pushed by the developer and architect to the limits of the parcel size with disregard to the immediate neighbors, no care for neighborhood compatibility, and they have not demonstrated any willingness to revise their plans to better this development. Despite planning department recommendations, respectful requests from neighbors, a considerable voice from the neighborhood, and the, and the initial planning commission appeal, I implore the council to let this project be a positive example of what development could look like while maintaining the character of this town and respecting our neighborhoods. Thank, Thank you. you. Next speaker is ending in, in uh, phone number 2952. Please press star six and you will be unmuted. You should press star six to unmute yourself. This phone number ending in 2952, area code 415. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Hi, my name is Jamila Cannon. I am an owner of Workbench. I'm also a Seabright renter. 
Um, I've been thinking a lot recently, and as I imagine many of us have, about how we can create a more equitable society and work locally to dismantle the systems that allow inequality to thrive here. I've been struck by Dr. Martin Luther King's focus and effort to elevate people of all races out of poverty and to elevate all people to a decent standard of living. As an architect, I've been thinking about what I can do and what my role is and what the role of architecture is in making positive change in my community. Collectively, how do we structurally change the way we operate if we are going to create a more equitable Santa Cruz for all to enjoy? I hear these concerns and ethos echoed in my community, and then I watch time and time again as neighbors say no to housing and actively engage in continuing practices that promote social inequality and continue to widen the divide between the haves and the have-nots. Practices that push out the people who sustain our community, the teachers, the artists, the young families, the recent graduates, the local business owners, the list goes on and on and on. Please support this project and help Santa Cruz take one more step towards being a more inclusive community. Thank you. Thank you. The next caller phone number ends in 0753. Committee on Homelessness and a member of the County Workforce Development Board. And I've been working in Santa Cruz for 10 years, and I've actually only been able to live in Santa Cruz for three of those years because of how expensive it is to live in this town. I feel so lucky to be able to live here right now. Um, and it's like a combination of lots of building relationship and also luck that I feel like has found me, my current home. Um, I was really excited for this project to come to council as I've been excited about all of the housing projects that have been coming forward. I just want to thank you for um, moving all of these projects through and creating more housing for our community. Um, I wanted to echo a few of the comments of previous callers, so that we build a variety of housing types to meet the needs of our workforce, that we have a focus on equity and inclusion in our decision-making about housing development, and that we have an efficient approval process for these types of projects so that they don't get bogged down and become too expensive for developers to build. And so I just urge you to approve this project um, and thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Our next caller is ending in phone number 8677. And seeing no other hands up, this will be our last caller for tonight. Go ahead, please. 
Hi, my name is Elise, and I just wanted to call in and um, give my support for this project. Uh, we recently moved to California, and we had to come up with very unconventional ways in order to afford to live here. And the idea that more affordable housing um, kind of gets put on the back burner or paused um, because of design choices, um, you know, like for, for families that are just trying to make it work and want to live in this community, um, you know, those things don't really make sense to, to us that are struggling to find a place here. So I just want to, you know, echo what other people who have said that they really just want this project to go through so that families like mine moving here from all across the country, you know, still have a place to to move and to be able to afford and raise our children and this, you know, paradise that we can call home now. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you very much. Okay, that concludes our public comment on this item. Uh, I'd now like to invite the appellant up to, you have five minutes to rebut anything stated from the applicant and or the public. And you may not use this time to bring up any new points. So if the appellant would like to speak. Hi, Travis. Hey, thank you. Um, Park, uh, Alan Spidell would like to give the rebuttal. Is that permissible here? He's our, also part of the, one of the appellants. That's fine, thank you. Okay, we'll turn it over to Alan, thanks. Alan, are you, are you there? Go ahead and unmute yourself. Here I am. Am I on? You are, Alan. Can you get the picture here. up, Travis? The picture's yeah. up. Picture's up. Good. Get the other one, too. The uh, front, the south view of this thing. Yeah, we don't have that photo, but we've got the, uh, um, okay. well, we've got this, I guess, so. Go ahead. There have been so many, uh, unfortunate statements here that I'm not quite sure where to begin. I think the first one has to be, we, we absolutely reject the idea that we are NIMBYs and opposed to housing. Um, we're in favor of a reasonable, compatible project on this lot. It's big enough for four more units. What people may not understand is that this would be the first three-story residential building in the neighborhood. As a matter of fact, it'd be the first three-story residential building in any Santa Cruz neighborhood. And this is where all the objections come from. It's because this 100-year-old neighborhood, um, this building is simply not compatible with it. Now, you've heard a lot of references to the state law. And the reason for that is because if you get the state law out of the way, this project never would have been approved. The planning department tried to modify it and change it. The planning commission tried to change it, but in every case, the state law thwarted them. And our position is simple, and the attorney was speaking to this. Our position is that the state law was misapplied because it doesn't apply to this project. Not every housing, uh, project gets the protections of the state law. And the first requirement is the state, the uh, project has to meet the, the uh, objective standards. And you've heard that word over and over again. Now the front yard setback is eight feet, eight inches. And the front house is part of the project because it's going to be remodeled to allow the driveway on the south side of the project. So, the project doesn't meet the, the objective standard of the setback. It's that simple. And that's going to be uh, an issue in the courts. But, you know, we don't want to go in the courts. We have no desire to go in the courts. The planning department admits that they rounded up the square footage to achieve the uh, required square footage for four 
three uh, bedroom units. It's in the uh, report. When you're rounding up a number, that means you haven't met that standard either. And th these are the issues, and I grant you, the state law is so poorly written that there's going to be conflicts over it. But my point now is, if you got the state law out of the way, this project would have been modified through the planning process. The state law disabled the planning department from being able to do their jobs. They were denied the chance to work with the community and the developer to create reasonable housing on this, pro on this piece of property. Now the city council has the chance to shut down this permit and send it back and in its place we can allow another project to develop better housing, probably um, more affordable housing on this project to uh, fill this large but narrow lot. Um, this is the opportunity for them to back up the planning department and back up the planning commission, both of whom wanted to modify this design. They were basically on the same side of the uh, argument as the neighbors were. Um, so take this opportunity, support your planning department and your commission and support the neighborhood. And if you, have an issue, if you're confused about the legal situation, at the very least continue this project or continue this hearing until some future date so that there, you can get further advice from the attorneys and uh, let's try to find a better solution to this particular project. Um, well, the final thing I should say is we're not NIMBYs here, okay? and it, irritates me and hurts me when the young people here who are never going to be able to afford these apartments anyway are, are deluded by an aggressive developer in the thinking that this is going to help them move in the food right neighborhood. Thank you, Mr. Snydell. Um, I really do appreciate it. You guys work awfully hard. Thanks for giving us the opportunity to see you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, it's time for us to bring this back to the Council for Deliberation and Action. And I have Council Member Golder and then Council Member Cummings. I believe in that order, but you can correct me. I was looking at a lot of phone numbers trying to track those, so I don't know who beat who. Beat who. Justin, were you first or? Okay, Council Member Cummings. Thank you. Um, and I wanna thank all the members of the public for um, reaching out and providing their comments on this project. Um, we're in a pretty, I know we're probably gonna be in a little difficult situation given that there's, um, you know, potential for litigation on each side and, and there are strong opinions on each side of this issue. I did wanna ask a question, I was gonna ask before the public comment, but I wanted to wait till after um, in the essence of time. And so I have a question for uh, the planning department. It's come up a number of times and we've heard um, I think it came to the Planning Commission that there was a recommendation for a redesign. And I just wanna know if you can comment on that piece uh, because I wonder if that might be a direction we can go in that would avoid us getting into any legal disputes. You know, we can figure out a way for both sides to kind of um, find consensus that maybe we can move this project forward without needing to um, go to court for either Group. So I'm wondering if there's anybody from the planning department who can talk about those recommendations around the redesign. Well, the specific recommendations I will leave up to the uh, the team here who was working on those. I will say that um, you know there were conversations about doing things like um, using a sloped roof for this uh, development. And you know the the sloped roof um, is uh, something that would be in character with the house that's on the front. You know the architects made the presentation and said here are um, homes in the surrounding area um, and multifamily development in close proximity that has 
a flat roof. Um, and so, you know, we, for example, explored, well, could you make a sloped roof to um, make the design um, more consistent with the house that's on the front of that property? Um, what that does is that reduces the square footage. It also reduces the number of bedrooms. Um, if I recall correctly, the applicants actually prepared that plan and or a floor plan, some, some version of that plan and presented it to our team. And it did actually have a reduction in bedroom capacity and um, square footage. And as we articulated in the agenda report, um, the Housing Accountability Act, which does apply to both um, uh, affordable uh, development projects and market rate development projects, but as our city attorney said, there are some uh, different protections. They're actually not that large in terms of the difference, but there are some differences. In any case, um, the Housing Accountability Act precludes the city from reducing housing capacity, density or intensity is called out in the HAA. And so, you know, a uh, architectural redesign um, could, uh, we cannot uh, recommend that an architectural redesign occurs if that architectural redesign would result in a reduction in square footage or number of bedrooms. Um, you know, there are some gray areas there um, in terms of architectural style, you know? So if you wanted to say like, all right, you know, this shouldn't be stucco, this should be wood siding um, on this portion, you know, those kinds of things probably aren't going to make the, the project financially infeasible or they're probably not gonna reduce square footage or um, a number of bedrooms. But when you start talking about redesigning from an architectural perspective, the, the design could result in uh, a uh, reduction in square footage, which is why I brought up that sloped roof issue. And in that scenario, we would not be in a position where, um, uh, well, we would be in a position where we would be um, running afoul of the Housing Accountability Act. And so um, I, I'll, I'll leave it there and invite if, if anyone on the team wants to, to chime in about some of the other specifics, uh, because I, I think that there were, um, uh, a number of uh, comments that came in and, and that sort of roof uh, design was kind of an easy one to point out. Thank you, Lee. Any other staff want to chime in on that? Seen anybody? Uh, Councilmember Cummings, did you have additional questions? I did have one more question um, related to the replacement housing ordinance. I know that in the city, I think ours is three to one. Um, and then under SB 330, under the density bonus, it gets one to one. And I was wondering what opportunities are there for us to bring these, our, our replacement housing ordinance into compliance so that it's one to one and, and, um, and it's consistent with the density bonus ordinance because I think that that came up I think we were talking about the housing project, the other housing project in Seabright earlier this year or late last year. So I wonder if you could speak to that. Sure, so um, state law supersedes. So right now, the, uh, the condition that you had before you previously, um, before the one that um, Brianna updated today, um, referenced the um, SB 330 provisions, and there are actually multiple provisions. So the density bonus uh, is, referenced as part of SB 330. So, you know, it, it, it doesn't have to be a density bonus project to, to um, you know, trigger the uh, replacement housing requirements. It can just be a project that's utilizing SB 330. Um, that would also trigger the replacement housing requirements. Um, and so um, projects now are required to uh, conform with the, the state law. Um, certainly, uh, you know, we could look at updating our codes to match what the state law requires. Um, there is not an urgency to that. We have not um, gone, uh, we have not put forth um, efforts to do that because those rules are in place right now. Um, if I recall correctly, those rules are set to expire in four years now, in um, 2025. 
And so at some point during these next four years, if the state does not extend those, then if the city is interested in um, matching what the state had, then that would um, be a, a critical time to do that. But at this point in time, um, with, the, uh, with the state law superseding what we have in our codes, um, those rules apply. And then, correct me if I'm wrong, is there a, it sounds like there's an ADU on this property that's gonna be demolished as well. Is that correct? Would that be considered an affordable unit? Um, well, so sort of, uh, <laughs> to your first question, sort of, and uh, the second question I'll address in a second. Um, I think it was considered an ADU at first, um, and as Brianna mentioned, at some point we discovered that it wasn't actually permitted as an ADU, and I don't know the, the legal status of it um, offhand, the team may, but regardless, we're, we're, it's being treated as a second unit on the site. That second unit um, is being um, required as replacement housing if under the state law it was occupied by a person with um, uh, low or very low incomes within the last five years. So the last, the last individual, the last tenant would be tracked down. And um, if they um, had low, below 80% AMI, or very low, uh, below 50% AMI, again, uh, area median income, then um, those, uh, that unit, uh, one of the units would have to match that. If the, if the uh, previous tenant's um, uh, income cannot be verified, then they would be um, at, they would be required to provide one unit at the very low income, 50% AMI level. And then the last question, is that, is there any information on the person or people who are in the front unit within, like are there currently tenants there now or have there been in the last 10 years and has there been any um, evaluation of whether or not those people also are low income. Because it seems that if you had two people in two separate units on a property that were low or very low income, then if you have to make that replacement housing, then my understanding would be if it's one to one, then you'd have to replace two units as affordable. And please correct um, me if I'm wrong there. Yeah, so, so the front units remaining, so it's only the uh, rear unit that is in question in terms of the occupancy there. Um, I believe, and I'm not sure about this, but uh, maybe Brianna can let me know, um, that the front tenant submitted a letter. Um, if I was reading that, if I was reading those okay. quickly. What's that? Yep. There, there is a person living in the front unit and she does submit a letter in support of approval um, of the project. Um, she's currently renting it. I didn't check with the applicant, but I don't know if they verified um, or know the income of that tenant. But from, from the Housing Accountability Act perspective, it's the rear unit, the income of the rear unit tenant that would be applicable since that's the unit that's actually being demolished. Okay, thank you. Member Golder. Hi, I think I have more like comments than questions. I just wanted to say I appreciate everybody that called in and it's really been, you know, a lot to think about. And I understand the position that we're in where we could be kind of like damned if we do, damned if we don't, we could be sued either way. And it's really um, complicated navigating this new landscape with this state law. And um, I would also like the callers and the public to know that we do read all the letters. We did get the letter from the lawyer. We did read it. Many of us, you know, drove by and, and peeked in the yard and stalked around the block and looked at the property. And we do that regularly with the projects um, that come before us. And so to that end, like, I agree with what Jillian said in that, like, I do think the drawings are kind of misleading where it looks like the one story and the three story are kind of the same height and they're not. And I've spent many years living in Seabright. I lived across the street from one of the callers um, for many years. And um, I agree that uh, with a three bedroom unit, I don't know if par two parking spaces is gonna be quite enough. Um, and, um, you know, on my block of Alta, we've got four, three, four, four three-story houses that have gone up in the last 20 years. And so I do know that three-story houses, um, they're here. 
they're coming. And I also think like, as, as far as like objective design standards, there's plenty of houses as I walk around the neighborhoods, no offense everybody, that are freaking hideous. My own house is hideous. I hate the way it looks. And so like, um, we're all gonna have differences of opinion about the way architectural design looks. I think um, as presented though, it's just a complicated issue in that, um, you know, I feel like it's, it, I, I also, yeah, I, I think that this is kind of squeezing quite a bit of pro, uh, housing into it a lot. That's relatively large for the city of Santa Cruz, but that's a lot of housing. And I was just doing calculations where if, if these are 2,300 square foot units and if they had to, you know, new cost of construction is between three and four hundred dollars a square foot so the developers potentially putting in two to three million dollars that's going to cost them ninety five hundred to fourteen thousand dollars a month just in the mortgage not including the taxes insurance and like you know overhead for managing the property you know i don't anticipate that the three other units are going to be particularly low income or affordable and i appreciate the developers intent to keep the front unit affordable and keep the family that's there now. Um, and, you know, I'm sympathetic to the neighbors that are going to have uh, a large building next door. We had, a, like I said, the three-story one next door to us that was looming in our backyard. So I understand, but I think as, um, as far as this, what's before us today, I feel compelled that we have to approve the project and, and um, and that's because of the state law and, and my interpretation of what has been provided to us today. And so I just wanted to say all that in advance. So. Thank you. Council member Kalantari Johnson, were you first or was Sandy first? Sandy was first, that's what I thought. Okay, Sandy, um, excuse me, council member Brown. Thanks. Uh, so I just have a couple of comments, and uh, you know this is a this is a really difficult uh, place we find ourselves in. We find ourselves in this place all too often these days. Um, and uh, you know I just want to respond to a couple of uh, comments that were made. Um, I, I'd love to respond to all of the public comment, and I appreciate everybody's um, being here and weighing in and uh, the thoughtful letters. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I agree, you know, um, Mr. Kelly said that um, if we want objective standards, we, uh, you know, we ought to not be spending so much time um, in, in this space, uh, you know, debating over uh, the particulars of relatively small projects. And I agree, um, but I will say this is, um, you know, this is a process that is available to uh, community members. It is not, and the city council did not raise this uh, and so we, it comes before us and we are required to address it. Uh, I also wanted to respond to um, Mr. Simon's uh, point about, um, you know, really um, being inspired by, you know, I wish you was at that, uh, on that panel and, uh, you know, the, so the idea about infill that, and, and the need for that uh, is really important and people do want uh, a set of rules and, and consistency and I completely agree with that. I hope that through our objective standards development, we'll get uh, you know closer to that at some point, if not all the way there. But uh, unfortunately, we're not dealing with or working with rules of our own making. We are dealing with a state law um, that has, as has been suggested by uh, the appellants and our own city attorney, um, is uh, not a model of clarity. <laughs> and, um, you know, and so where the law is vague or silent, um, we're, you know, we're left to kind of figure out how to work within that, those bounds of, you know, with that lack of clarity um, uh, to, you know, determine the legal parameters and, and not so much our personal preference for style or any of those issues as much as I would like to uh, uh, be able to weigh in. Um, and I you know many would, but really about uh, the legal parameters and I'm going to say that I, you know I believe that here, uh, unfortunately, uh, this blunt instrument of state law um, has left enough of a gray area that we are unlikely to find uh, a non-litigious uh, way forward if uh, there if the the developer and the neighbors cannot come to some um, 
you know, some reconciliation or, uh, around the, um, the design. And so my preference here, I'm not going to make the motion, I'll wait and see what others have to say, but my preference would be to accept the minority uh, planning commissioner's position to send this back for redesign and just try to get uh, folks to um, come to some, some agreement about how to move forward. It, it could be a, a lot quicker resolution to do it that way, um, but I'll uh, wait to hear what others have to say. Uh, before we move forward. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Great, thank you. Um, yes, I also appreciate all um, of the community members who've written letters and who were on the council meeting and called called in today. Um, and yes, to Council Member Golders, but we do read everything that comes through and really appreciate the time that you take to submit those letters. This is a really complex and complicated issue um, and I think, you know, there was a point made earlier that, that we find ourselves here um, being dictated by state law because we have really sort of failed locally to um, meet the growing needs of our community and of our state. Um, so now we find ourselves here and, and having to be kind of um, uh, appease what, not appease, but really have to abide by what um, has been set by the state. So absolutely moving forward as we have been with the planning department and really clarifying what our objective standards are. Um, and in the meantime, um, having to rely on state law, I think that um, I agree that we will have to move forward with staff recommendation at this point. I'm not sure that going back to the design phase will um, get us anywhere. Um, as Lee Butler mentioned, um, if it's certain design standards that would go against SB 330, then we would find ourselves in um, litigation with potentially um, with the state and with a developer. So um, I hear the concerns of the community and the neighbors. I also hear what some of the callers said around our growing community, our changing community, and our need for inclusion and diversity, um, and the need for infill um, housing. So the, I hear both sides, and it seems at this point, um, I also won't make a motion just yet, just to hear what others have to say, but I think at this point, we have to move forward with staff recommendation. And Council Member Watkins, or Bruner, I'm not sure who was first. I'm sorry, I've been focused on the attendees and some other things. So still learning to track everything that's happening before me. Do you two know which, which won the tie there? Council Member Watkins? I'm, I'm, I'm happy to just, I just have one brief question if that's okay um, with my colleague. I don't know, I don't either know. <laughs> I can't win up either, so I'm sure, in, I'm unsure of the order. Um, it was Martin. It was Council oh, Member Watkins. That's what I thought. Thank you, Bonnie, for, for, for clarifying. No, I just, I mean, I, I think my colleagues really captured the complexity of the situation of the issue, um, definitely the concerns of the neighbors and the impacts, as well as the state law and how it supersedes our local authority essentially to be able to weigh in absent having some objective design standards in place. I, I just want to make sure I'm really clear about the redesign um, and that what I heard um, from Lee is that anything that would be um, on the table for redesign uh, would have to be really superficial essentially and that sorry for lacking a better um, planning term and that nothing could really limit the density or the proposal of the uh, housing um, you know the size of it right and so that that said I feel hesitant to, to go in that direction given that anything outside of that if that's true um, won't really change a lot of what I think I hear being a number of the concerns. So I, Lee, could you, could you clarify just to make sure that I really, or, or somebody from planning to make sure I really understand what is um, kind of on the table here in terms of options? Sure. Um, so um, you, you are correct. Um, and our, our agenda report laid out our analysis of SB 330. And um, SB 330 has a clause in it that says uh, that um, the law shall be interpreted in a manner so as to um, promote 
um, the maximum availability uh, and production of housing. Um, and I'll find it for you. So it is the policy of the state that this section should be interpreted and implemented in a manner to afford the fullest possible weight to the interest of and the approval and the provision of housing. And so you know, when there are you know, these gray areas, I think the, the law itself has provided guidance to the courts to say, here's how we want this interpreted. You know, we want it interpreted in a manner to promote housing. And there are things in there that we, that we set forth in our agenda report to, that speak to both the density and the intensity of uh, uses and, and how um, we have a limited ability to affect either of those. And so, um, you know, given that, that's, that's outlining the, the sort of reasoning behind the position that we have on SB 330 and the limiting factors that are associated with it. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Uh, uh, Vice Mayor Bruner and then Council Member Cummings and then I'm gonna put myself in the queue. Thank you. Um, this has been quite an interesting reading and research and listening and uh, all of the letters and calls and presentations. Thank you so much. There's a lot of information to digest and consider. And, um, you know, one thing that is clear to me is that we don't have any provisions in our code that dictate uh, you know, a specific architectural style in our neighborhoods. And um, that seems to be a really important point in this um, opposition to this project is keeping in, in character, character with the, the neighborhood and existing homes around. Um, but it seems that, you know, on a legal sense, we don't have that capacity. It's more on a good neighborly sense. And um, I'm, um, you know, this is definitely an example of why it would be important this, using this example to get uh, design standards in place and objective standards in place as a community for the future going forward. Um, I don't know that that's something that would happen to affect it with this development. Um, and um, they're just really, I, I'm trying to understand how we can get to a more efficient approval process um, and with the options on this particular development um, going forward, what what we can do to complement both, both wants and asks, if at all, because they're all very valid. We need the housing. We need neighbors to appreciate their neighbors and the housing. Um, you know, we can't, um, design is subjective. Um, so at this point, um, with this particular project, um, I just don't see what our options are other than the staff recommendation in regards to the housing, the State Housing Affordability Act and the lack of um, code in our own design standards. Council Member Cummings. Thank you. I just wanted to, before we, because it seems like we're getting close to the end of this item, and I just wanted to get some clarification one last time from the city attorney, um, because it sounded like earlier in the meeting um, when we were talking about um, SB 330, what I had heard is that council may require projects to be consistent with general plan and zoning standards. And so I just want to see if I, I heard that correctly. Tony? Sorry, I was 
having trouble finding that. Um, so the the law is is complicated. Um, yes, the council may require projects to comply with objective general plan standards and zoning code standards that are not inconsistent with the general plan as to density. Okay, so I guess this is a very complicated law that we have before us in terms of, you know, what we can do around this. And, you know, personally, I feel like we should be trying to, you know, we have standards on our books that we should be trying to our best, you know, to the extent that we can to meet those standards. Because once we start saying that we have these standards on the books, but then, you know, state law comes into play, they give us an option whether we should, um, you know, apply, but we should um, uphold these standards or we should, you know, waive them. It becomes this issue where then, you know, our standards really don't mean anything if we continue to just not um, require the project to meet those standards. And so, you know, I know it's complicated and that's part of the difficulty of moving these projects forward at this current point in time. I'd be, you know, more supportive of um, you know, trying to see if there's some way to reconcile the concerns of the residents with the developers and whether that could lead to some kind of redesign. I think that that would be, um, you know, my personal preference. Um, but, you know, that's, I feel like that's where I'm, I'm at on this because, you know, we have, um, general plan and zoning standards on our books. Um, and if we have this option of requiring projects to meet those standards, then I think that we should. And if we want to change those standards, I think that's another um, question and something that we should consider in the future. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at. And I, again, want to thank everybody and my colleagues for all their comments. It's, it's a difficult topic. Um, we're probably gonna, you know, regardless of what decision we make tonight, there's a bunch of different ways that this can go. Um, we can get sued either way. Um, so, you know, I just hope that we can uh, come to a decision and, you know, continue to move on and see how we can work to improve um, our ability to get housing projects approved in the future. Lee, did you have something to add? I saw you pop on. I didn't know if you wanted to respond to Council Member Cummings' question or not. Sure. Thank you, Mary Myers. I, I think um, the only thing that I would add is that Really, to me, um, the only thing in question here is the lot size, which you're alluding to, um, Councilmember Cummings. And um, the, you know, for the benefit of folks that um, may be viewing from home and may not have read the agenda report, um, the provision that we're calling out here speaks to um, the standards, the objective standards, um, essentially needing to facilitate the density allowed on the site by the general plan. And so that's really the question. And that's the, that's really the, in my opinion, that's the only issue at hand. And the way that we have looked at this, we believe that the objective standard, which is you have not 2,200 square feet, uh, not met at 2,200 square feet of lot area per unit on this site. You know, they've got, I'll say, uh, you know, uh, well, slightly less than that. You know, it's a, uh, not a 8,800 square foot lot, it's 8,729 square feet or something. So they do not have that. So the only objective standard is, in question is, is that one. And then this is the provision at hand that speaks to the proposed housing development is not being inconsistent with the applicable zoning standards and shall not require a rezoning if uh, the zoning for the project site is inconsistent with the general plan. It goes on to say local agency has complied and require the proposed housing development to comply with the objective standards and criteria of the zoning which is consistent with the general plan. However, the standards and criteria shall be applied to facilitate and accommodate development at the density allowed on the site by the general plan and proposed by the proposed housing development project. So that last sentence is really what, you know, we are looking at here in um, 
making this recommendation and making this interpretation of SB 330, and actually I believe this part was out of AB 3194, is that the standards and criteria shall be applied to facilitate and accommodate the development at the density allowed on the site by the general plan, and the proposed project meets the general plan density. And so I just, you know, um, Council Member Cummings was asking and, you know, debating, you know, well, does it, does it meet that? And, you know, are we throwing our standards out the window? And on that, on that particular issue, I think that there, um, there's, it's, it's challenging for us to apply the standards that we have. And, and that, that issue could come up in multiple ways. You know, it could come up with height, if we had a zoning district that had height that wouldn't allow this, you know, there would be an argument that uh, against that, which is one of the reasons why um, early on we recommended that we get that SB2 grant for objective standards and move forward with that so that we can address these issues more comprehensively. And we don't get into these gray areas of like, does our, does our zoning standards allow for that density? Do they allow for that density or not? So I, I just wanted to, to comment on that because I could see you struggling with it and I, I wanted to make sure you understood our perspective and, and position on it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in the interest of time, um, I'm gonna just make a couple of comments. Many of my comments have been brought up by my colleagues. Um, and I think that what strikes me is, is just the difficulty of um, seeing change and especially change that I think many in the community doesn't feel fits in with their neighborhood. Um, and um, I am one of those folks too that wish that, uh, you know, there could be some remedy um, of having people sit and sit together and try to figure this out. Um, I appreciate the, the next door neighbor's um, comments she made earlier. Um, and I think anyone that lives, you know, in any of our neighbor, neighborhoods in Santa Cruz, um, with the state taking away much of our um, really decision-making authority, um, we all don't know what to expect any longer um, in these places that, you know, we have, um, if fortunate enough, you know, to have to, you know, be able to own or rent long-term, what kinds of things are gonna be, um, what we'll be looking at, you know, as development proceeds in the in the city, um, I do believe that the um, state law, unfortunately, is sort of holding our, you know, we've got our hands held by by this, um, or we're being held uh, uh, to a standard that doesn't necessarily um, make for neighborly relations and for a process that's predictable on the other side for the person who's um, taking the risk in purchasing property and trying to figure out their way through the development process either. Uh, I think it's important to um, understand that there's, you know, always kind of two sides to the story and um, and when you, when we're trying to remedy something that really is really coming down to neighborhood quality and neighborhood character um, and how people feel about their neighbors, uh, it's, it's very, very difficult. So I really appreciate um, all the comments we've received, all the folks who showed up tonight. Um, and I know that folks have been really working through our system, our, our planning commission, and all the various pieces that we put in place to try to make things work for our community. And um, I'm incredibly frustrated because I think this is a conversation we're gonna keep having, unfortunately, until we can uh, remedy our objective standards and do some other work to catch up with what the state law is basically um, forcing us to do. Um, so I just wanna thank everyone for all your comments, all the work, um, the applicant and the appellant. Thank you for very, very uh, clear and concise um, presentations this evening. Um, as you can see, uh, I think this council wants to serve you all in the best that way that we can, and I'm not sure that the state's letting us do this, just do this for you tonight. So um, I will look to my colleagues. I see um, Council Member Colontari Johnson has her hand raised, and um, maybe look for uh, potentially a motion from from one of my colleagues this evening. Council Member Colontari Johnson. Thank you, Mayor Myers, um, and thank you to all of my colleagues and staff and everyone who's called in. Um, I absolutely agree with your um, comments just now, Mayor Myers. This is a difficult situation, and um, we are going through 
growing pains as we move into this next phase of our local planning and zoning and objective standards. Um, and with that, I am ready to make a motion to um, um, accept staff's recommendation that we acknowledge, I'm reading it from the agenda report, that we acknowledge environmental determination, deny the appeal, and uphold the Planning Commission's approval of the residential demolition authorization permit and design permit based on the findings in the attached resolutions and the conditions of approval in Exhibit A. And I would look for a second to that motion. Uh, Council Member Watkins, please. I'll, I'll second the motion and just will echo the comments that you made and I appreciate the context of where we are, but um, given the constraints, I, I feel comfortable seconding the motion at this point. Thank you. Any further comments or deliberation by the council? Okay. Seeing none. Um, I'll call for a roll call vote, please, Bonnie. Mayor, it looks like. Um, Vice, Vice Mayor Burner had her hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. I looked and then I looked away and go ahead, Vice Mayor Bruner. I just wanted to ask a quick question. Uh, there was something brought up by one of the callers regarding a requirement for the two car garages to be used for parking. At, at what point is that a decision for council to make and require? Lee? Go ahead, Brianna, if you want to, if you want to chime in or looks like uh, our whole team wants to answer that question. <laughs> go, go ahead, ahead Brianna. <laughs> um, I can start, but um, perhaps my colleagues have something to add. Um, the, the project does provide, um, it's required to provide eight spaces. It does provide those eight spaces. And I don't think there's um, much ability of the council to require that the garages be used as garages, um, unfortunately. Um, I think some of us using the storage or whatever. So if, um, if my colleagues have something to add, they certainly can. Um, the, the project that was being referred to on Windsor Street um, is a townhouse project and, and both myself as zoning administrator as well as the planning commission have from time to time um, uh, imposed a, a condition of approval that requires the CCNRs to, um, these are the conditions, covenants, and restrictions to include language that the garages be open and available to parking. Um, it's much easier to impose that condition on those types of projects because then it puts the homeowners association in an enforcement uh, capacity rather than staff. Um, so it's something we've done on, on ownership projects, but, but not necessarily on, on rental projects such as this. So that comes from staff, the condition of approval? Yes, that, uh, that um, actually was a, a condition that um, the Planning Commission started imposing a while back. But again, it's, it's really on, on ownership uh, projects. It's, it's real difficult for staff, um, given the number of cases, open code enforcement cases that we have, to uh, enforce those provisions and make time to enforce those provisions. And the only thing I would add, um, Council, or excuse me, Vice Mayor Bruner, is that um, uh, that condition, uh, those conditions have come from Planning Commission and, and staff in the past. You know, the council could add a condition to that effect. Um, you know, it, it can create that, um, that enforcement challenge in the future. Um, and um, the, the one other thing that I would say related to that is that um, the state law does allow for um, a certain number of garages on multifamily properties to be converted to ADUs. Um, and so that is, um, that's also a, a factor here, um, but that, that doesn't preclude you from um, uh, making such a condition. Um, it's, it's just the enforcement um, over the long term um, is, something that you know isn't necessarily the the top priority and um it, it can be challenging from a, a staff perspective but it's it's within the council's purview does that help council member Bruno? 
I'm thank excuse you. me, Vice Mayor Bruner. Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. Okay, uh, Council Member Cummings, did you have another question or comment? I did. I have one more follow up question that it just kind of struck me as we were having this conversation. Um, to earlier when we were talking about, um, you know, so these are going to go as rental units, is my understanding. So, and I'm, I don't know if this is a question for the developer or maybe actually for our planning department, but are there any conditions that um, state that these have to remain as rental units? In perpetuity, I know that the 80% AMI affordable unit will remain affordable, but I'm just trying to understand at some point, for example, can, can any of these units be sold as sold for housing? So, you know, rather than remaining a rental unit, it's now, you know, owned by the occupant. We have a condominium conversion requirement, um, and there are uh, state laws related to that as well. When you you go uh, and you're converting a, a rental complex to uh, condominiums, um, and um, I've processed a couple of them in my career, but they are um, they are a very extensive amount of requirements just from the state in terms of the mapping. I'd also note that we have a pretty uh, strict requirement here in the city that speaks to a uh, vacancy rate that um, I don't think the city has seen in quite some time. Um, so it speaks to a rental vacancy rate um, that um, needs to be taken into consideration. I will say that we did um, approve one of these um, in my tenure here um, that went from, uh, I, I can't remember if it went to a tenant in common or uh, if it went to uh, a straight condominium, but all of the tenants at that facility, this was um, uh, over, not on Grant Street, but a, a street or two over from Grant Street, uh, all of the tenants were actually the ones that were purchasing the, uh, the units. And so there was an ability for us to do an exception there, but I'll, I'll say that we've got some pretty strict rules around condominium conversions and, um, and turning them over into uh, ownership units um, would present some significant challenges. Thank you. Thank you, council member Cummings. If there's no other uh, further questions by the council members, then I will uh, request a, uh, ask the clerk to please do a roll call vote. Council members Watkins? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? No. Cummings? No. Holder? Aye. Vice Mayor Brunner? Aye. Mayor Myers? Aye. That motion passes with five uh, votes in, in favor and two against. And Bonnie, do I need to? I don't. Do I need to read off the council members' votes? Um, I, I would. Be, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll, I will read off, yeah, five votes in favor. That's council, by council members Bruner, Kalantari Johnson, Mayor Myers, council member Golder, and council member Watkins. Vice Mayor Bruner, I did uh, note you. Two against, that's council member Cummings and council Br member Brown. The motion does pass. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Um, and uh, we appreciate all your input this evening. We'll now move on to our final item this evening. This is oral communications for members of the public who are streaming this meeting. If you want to comment during oral communications, now is the time to call in. Instructions are on your screen. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not listed on today's agenda. If you are interested in addressing the council, press star nine on your phone to, to raise your hand. You will have two minutes to speak. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. We request that you clearly and slowly state your name before making your comments so that we can accurately capture in the meeting minutes. However, this is not required. 
Please remember this is a time for council to hear from the public. We are not able to engage in dialogue with each member of the public, but we, when we are able, we will address the questions raised after oral communications has been completed. So again, this is for items not um, on the agenda this evening. And I see one hand raised. Um, 1810. Yeah, strangely, the presenter of the discriminatory reports to law enforcement ordinance claims that a damage awarded to people who can't prove damages is actually a feature. That law also declares causing embarrassment or humiliation is an illegal act. It does not defend the truth as a defense. It's a very strange justice. Too bad a judge couldn't offer an opinion about how those three claimed racist local 911 calls would fare with such an extraordinarily vague ordinance and their opinion on what the evidence would need to be to connect personal characteristics with what purports to be a specific intent law, but is actually a law disallowing speech that incites commission of illegal acts since speech and a police accomplice doer is really required. I know police perfection isn't possible, but what we do ask of police is excellence, be sworn to protect with knowledge of and to uphold the law. The Supreme Court has held the constitutional guarantees of free speech do not permit a state to forbid or prescribe speech advocacy of the use of force or to violate laws except where such advocacy eminently and will likely will incite or produce such unlawful actions. Can truthful speech make eminent and likely an incitement of the police to commit illegal acts? No. Would not police also be guilty accomplices unless the 911 caller lied? Yes, as the police alone are the only ones capable of committing most specific illegal harms listed. In classic specific intent law, a burglar breaks into a gallery with intent to steal a million dollar painting, but finds none and leaves empty handed, but is still guilty of a specific intent to commit burglary. For clarity, consider replacing that specific intent instead. A person contacts the police and says, I want the police to break into that art gallery and steal that million dollar painting because the owner is a fat, white, male, racist, sexist, homophobic, greedy, capitalist pig. The police merely go to the art gallery location. No harm is is done, but the owner is still entitled to a thousand dollars in fabricated damages, but not if the caller had left out fat white male and only said the owner was a racist, sexist, homophobic, greedy, capitalist pig, because those characteristics are not a violation basis. Thank the you. act proving intent is now just a vaguely described politically. Thank you. Are there any other attendees, participants in tonight's meeting from the public wishing to Speak during oral communication. I am not seeing any hands. So we are adjourned for this evening. Thank you, everyone, and uh, have a good evening. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Goodbye.